This bill does. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. If you were listening, you heard that Representative Grumman doesn't have other examples of the way that, that other workers across the state and distribu distribution centers that aren't Amazon, that this is actually an issue. So instead, we're being punitive and adding additional regulation and burden upon those businesses and adding penalties as well. And so that's a big reason that I'm gonna be opposing this bill today. It's because it doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to add these sorts of punitive measures when, uh, when we have a, a, you know, a place in our workforce today uh, where, where workers can find the different businesses that are, uh, that are treating them well and that have been negotiated for uh, with, with, with labor unions. Um, and so uh, that's why I'll be opposing this bill today and I encourage a no vote on this bill. The member from Chisago, Representative New. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And would Representative Greenman yield to another question? She will yield. Representative New. Brindley. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Speaker. And Thank you, Representative Greenman, and thank you for passing out this um, article, I assume it's an article, key findings on, this is specific, specifically related to Amazon workers. It talks about increasing number of worker injuries, um, an overwhelming number of injuries that were of the most serious kind, et cetera. And I'm wondering if you can help us understand, in the last couple of years, how many investigations have Dolly and Minnesota OSHA uh, participated in with Amazon and or how many complaints have they responded to? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative New Brindley. So we've discussed this quite at length in committee. Um, the first thing I'd say, which I will say again, which is we don't currently have a standard around this. The things that are hurting people, the way that folks are getting hurt, is this relentless pace of not knowing what kind of quota, what kind of performance standard they have to meet. People are speeding up. We heard talks of surveillance and fear of getting fired. And in that culture, people are not taking time to rest. They're not taking time to get help. And they're getting injured from these musculoskeletal lifting and, and, um, and stowing and storing. We don't have a standard around that. And so there is no standard to enforce. What, what we have heard and what we heard in committee, right, is OSHA's 50 uh, inspectors for the entire state of Minnesota um, uh, um, can't enforce a standard that isn't actually in law. And that's why we're going to pass this bill. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And would Representative Greenman continue to yield? She will yield. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just want to clarify. So, Representative Greenman, you are telling us here today that there is no standard in law about workplace injury. That's, a, that's what I'm hearing because I'm referencing very specifically injuries that have taken place. And you are saying that even when there is injury that that does not fall under the purview of Minnesota OSHA or Dolly. We're talking about actual injuries that have taken place. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe I am mistaken. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps not all injuries are covered, um, but I, I'm really trying to understand this injury piece. Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The general, there is a general duty clause that when um, OSHA is responding to a complaint they look at, it's very fact specific. We heard a lot about it from our OSHA director um, in, in committee and I will not claim to be an OSHA expert. But what I do know is the things that are hurting people now are not like a loose machinery that, that a worker didn't fix or that, a, that, a, that the business didn't fix. What's hurting people is the pace that's happening. It's a speed up. And we don't have a standard for that. And so to say, no, I did not say that there's no uh, work or injury standards. But what OSHA does when they go in, they do a very spec, under current law and this general duty standard, which applies to across the board, they do a very fact specific uh, um, investigation and they only do it in response to serious complaints and serious injuries. What this bill does is deal with the fact that in warehouses, you need to keep your body safe by working at, the, at a pace. And when we talk about, I think Representative Schultz talked about some of the other uh, um, places, UPS, others, they've used ergonomics and industrial engineers to figure out what pace we should be working at in order to keep people safe. 
we don't have a standard that's required uh, under Minnesota law, and we don't even have a standard that requires workers to know what pace they're being held accountable to when they're being held accountable to it. That's what this bill does. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I guess I will point out that um, I, I don't think we got the answer specifically, but uh, Minnesota OSHA and Dolly testified in committee that they have not investigated a single complaint of injury in the state of Minnesota in regards to these things. Not one, not a single complaint. So if this bill was really about workplace safety, Minnesota OSHA and Dolly, well, frankly, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say if this was really a workforce safety issue, that they would be investigating those issues. And if they have not, if they have not investigated legitimate claims, then I'll tell you what, Governor Walz's administration has some serious answering to do for their lack of accountability. And so it's either one or the other. Either, either the safety issues that are being purported as, as necessary to fix with this bill language are so serious that it requires legislative action, or frankly, the Walls administration is not doing their job. They're not doing their job. And I guess I'm not sure that either of those are good answers. This is not about workplace safety. Frankly, let's be honest here. This is about collecting information, perhaps in the future for purposes of collective bargaining. This is about gathering information about proprietary work processes. This is not about workplace safety. This is about protectionism. And if we were gonna do the right thing, we would frankly let Minnesota OSHA and we would let Dolly do their jobs because I am presuming that they have done their jobs appropriately. Madam Speaker, members, I rise to uh, oppose the bill, Representative Greenman. We've seen this in committee, I think, the last several years. And for some of the reasons, uh, these are why some of the reasons. We have uh, Dolly that testified in committee with many of the employees. And in asking Dolly if they have had any phone calls or investigated uh, the Amazon warehouse particularly, the answer was none. So either the, the fact is that there were no injuries or they weren't serious enough to contact Minosha or Dolly. Now, members, for the last 13 years, I have supported some worker safety bills. I think most, uh, many folks in here that have been here for a number of years has. And I'm proud of some of the work I've done to protect Minnesota workers. And it's never going to be perfect. So it is oftentimes that things will have to come to this body for us to do to support worker safety. But two, we also must support the employers. Representative Greenman, you said the pace in which some of the uh, workers are going is very harmful. I'd say the pace in which the Democrats are going this session is very harmful at such a fast pace. But yet, not one of the testifiers had stated that they contacted OSHA or Dolly. Now, on the Department of Labor and Industry, they do a fine job, I presume, by protecting Minnesota's employees and employers. They have certain laws that we passed here. Ms. Madam Speaker, you probably voted for some of these as well. Matter of fact, if you go to their uh, front page of worker protection, it says this, worker rights and protections. Our agency helps protect the rights and the safety and health of all workers. We educate employers and employees about their rights and responsibilities under Minnesota employment and safety and health laws that we pass. But yet you did not convince any of us on the committee on this side that there was actually this was about worker safety because Dolly had admitted that they had no investigation. Now we had this bill come up a couple years ago in Zoom. You guys remember it was doing Zoom and there was a number of testifiers as well, including Dolly. And even then, Madam Speaker, they had no reports of these injuries at Amazon. Now I'm not gonna let Amazon off the hook. Certainly not. We must make sure that they are providing safety to their employees. Without their employees, there is no Amazon. Wouldn't you say? That is the fact. But there's been no evidence whatsoever to in indicate that their workers are unsafe. And then for big government to come in, now just think about this. By law, we can come into a business, a manufacturer in a warehouse, and tell them exactly how to run their business. How many quotas, how many boxes, how many times you can put this fiddle-faddle together, or, or whatever. 
It's big-handed government going into a private business and telling them how fast their employees or how slow their employees should work. Now, Representative Greenman said that uh, the, some of the complaints were they couldn't have a chance to go to the restroom or have lunches. Well, frankly, we have laws for that. Thank goodness. What for an eight-hour day, I believe uh, by state law, uh, an employee is required to have a half an hour lunch and two 15-minute breaks. Now, if that is not happening in this uh, Amazon warehouse, because that was the only testifying uh, name mentioned of all warehouses, uh, if that's not happening there, then how come Minosha or Dolly was not notified? Aren't you curious? Representative Greenman, if you would yield for a question, please. She will yield. Representative McDonald. Madam Speaker, Representative Greenman, uh, you gave some very good testimony and you made some very good points, certainly, but you did not even prove one iota of the claims that were uh, given by the testifiers. Not one did you back it up. Did, have you, did you go visit Amazon yourself and visit the uh, facilities? Did you check with Dolly to see how many complaints were and the fact that they, if they are in violation of the law, because we have state health laws, that how come Dolly then wasn't uh, participating in pursuing uh, justice for the safe, unsafe work environments? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I actually did go out and spend a couple hours at the um, at the Amazon warehouse uh, in Shakopee. I have spent now two years talking to um, uh, not just Amazon, but also the, the retailers and also the workers. And so when you say there's not one iota of evidence, I am seeing, and we actually have many of the workers who've been here, committee after committee after committee, who tell the story about what it feels like on this House floor a year ago, you, uh, 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 a GOP colleague across the aisle, Representative Jurgens, said, I called my friend who worked at Amazon to see if these stories were true. And he said, absolutely, they were true. So when I think about uh, 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 what is happening, I listen to the evidence of what we're hearing from the workers, what we're seeing from the data. That OSHA data is self-reported. And so that 10, about 10 workers, um, out of it, one in 10 workers, 10 workers out of every 100 getting hurt, that's self-reported data um, from these warehouses. And so uh, those, that's, the, that's the, the iota of evidence is what we continue to hear from workers year after year. Representative McDonald. Madam Speaker, thank you. Yes, I see the folks in the uh, gallery and I saw them at committee as well and I didn't doubt their honesty. I doubted the fact that how come not one of those claims were given to Dolly. We have state laws in the state of Minnesota that protects employees. So why aren't we using them? If the current laws aren't working, what makes you think that this law will work? To the workers of Minnesota, we, you have rights for your health and safety. If you believe your employer is taking advantage of you or you're, uh, they're breaking state laws, health laws and safety, then contact Dolly, contact Governor Walls, and they should be doing their job. And perhaps they are but yet we haven't heard in committee that they were. They said they haven't been contacted, even from two years ago. So just to think about it, uh, again, this bill, over-encompassing, and it goes in, government will come into your manufacturing or your warehouse and tell you how many employees you can have, how hard they can work, how many gadgets they can produce in certain times a day. We already have health laws and safety laws that regulate that. Any more, and it's just not good for business, and it's not good for Minnesotans. We already have a worker shortage. We can't make this, we can't continue to make this difficult for both employers, job creators, and its employees. Madam Speaker. The member from Scott, Representative Tabkey. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker and members. And uh, the MSP-1 is the largest uh, Amazon facility in the state of Minnesota, and that is located in Shakopee. It came to Shakopee while I was mayor, and um, we had a lot of discussion about uh, if it was a good thing for our community or not a good thing for our community. In the end, it didn't matter because it was zoning laws, and we weren't going to uh, be able to change that and keep that from happening. But what, uh, what we have learned since that time is the fact that Amazon treats their employees like robots. They treat the people um, not as humans, not as uh, neighbors, not as friends, but as robots. And they have a very clear, very limited, very narrow amount of information that anybody gets as to why and how they could be um, 
laid off the next day, how they could not have a job the next day to support their families and support their uh, loved ones. And so there are many stories of folks that are my constituents who have been, uh, that they complain one day and days later they are laid off by the app. There's not anybody who talks to them. There's not anybody who discusses the issues with them. They're just gone. They don't get to work anymore. And it is not a way that we should be doing business in the state of Minnesota. And so I very highly uh, thank Representative Greenman for bringing this forward and pushing it to make sure that we're able to pass this in Minnesota to protect workers, to protect people, and to make sure that our workers in Minnesota are treated like humans and not like robots. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The member from Sherburne, Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Will uh, Representative Greenman yield for a question? <clears throat> she will yield, Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Greenman, we've heard a lot now from Representative McDonald and New Brindley, um, and we heard a lot of this in committee about all these people that have testified of all these injuries. Everybody's discussed how none of these have been investigated yet. OSHA did testify that they did, I believe it was 1,500 investigations in total last year, and they have 50 investigators, right? I believe it was the number. So of all the complaints that were mentioned, and, and, and some of them were many different types of injuries, have, have they reached out to you since committee or have you to them to find out why they have not taken any of these co complaints serious? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, thank you, Representative Mecklen. And I think I'm probably going to repeat what the OSHA director said in committee, but I did pull up here the general duty clause. Because what we're talking about is the general duty of employers to keep folks safe. But the problem is that currently what is hurting people is an algorithm, is a, um, is a method that isn't currently accounted for in Minnesota law. Just like with the Safe Patient Handling Act that we passed in 2007, we saw a problem. So the general duty clause says employers have the responsibility to provide a safe and healthy workplace that is free from serious uh, um, recognized hazards. This is commonly known as the general duty clause. Um, right now what we're saying is we are learning that a, re a, a hazard that is hurting people is a, uh, the requirement that people are being kept to an opaque standard, that they're not being told about, they're speeding up, and this the combination of surveillance and a culture of fear is creating that hazard. But we don't currently have that in Minnesota law, which is what we're trying to do today. Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Representative Greenman, there was many, many testifiers who had different injuries. Uh, one of them, I believe it was a pretty serious leg injury but that from their testimony, it didn't sound like it had anything to do with being driven. It was just a bad accident. But not even that was investigated. There's clearly something run amok with the administration and OSHA not being out there. My history in the past is they were very aggressive on any type of injury whatsoever. So there's clearly something falling short. But based on their testimony, if they have done a total of 1,500 investigations throughout the entire state with a mere 50 people, that means they're doing less than one every two weeks, right in there, right? one every 10 days. And, and so there was a question as to whether or not they needed more investigators to be able to handle the load, but it doesn't seem like they're going out to too many places if they have all these complaints. I am very concerned that, that with all the testimony that was given in committee on this issue, and with all the different types of injuries, I get some of them have to do with the being pushed at a higher pace, but that's not what they all said. So there's a big flaw, and I agree with what was said earlier, that if, if they're not getting done what they should be getting done now to protect the people, what is creating a new law going to do? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Further discussion? The author of the bill, the member from Hennepin, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, um, and thank you, members, uh, for the discussion today. I just, from this conversation, just want to make sure it's clear what this bill does. What it does is it says if you have a performance standard, if you have a quota that you're tracking, you need to tell workers what it is and give them access to their data. That's what this bill does. It doesn't tell companies what the standards are. It doesn't tell companies how many workers they can have. It doesn't even tell companies they need to have a standard. What it does say, if you have one, you need to tell workers what it is. And you're absolutely right, uh, um, Representative New Brindley. This is about gathering information. It's about the information that companies are gathering on workers and not sharing with them. It is about the fact that what we have seen in this algorithm, and again, we today we're talking about Amazon, but tomorrow, and as we have seen, nobody can deny the impact that Amazon has had on our logistics system, on our delivery system, on how businesses get products to market. So we know what starts today 
at an Amazon warehouse with a complicated high-tech algorithm that is treating people as representative, uh, Tapke said, as we heard from stories. Um, and I, you know, I have a lot of stories to tell um, because we have heard story after story about people saying uh, that they were treated by, uh, that they were treated as robots. Um, uh, um, Ms. Mohammed, who said that she felt the pressure to perform as her duties as robots would, as a stower, she picked up, scanned, and uh, stowed hundreds of items to keep up with the actual robot that she had on the floor. She didn't take bathroom breaks, she didn't take water breaks, she didn't stretch, and she felt like she was always going to get disciplined. We have heard these stories, and this bill responds to that that we've seen all over the country. It responds to uh, a, a problem that is treating people not as people, not as bodies that need to uh, uh, operate at a pace, but it is treating them like an algorithm. And actually, I heard when I was at the Amazon warehouse, what they said was, we don't actually create our standards based on uh, an ergonomic standard. We don't base it on what other warehouses do. We base it on the speed that our current warehouse is doing. Based on some fancy algorithm, you know what that means? People are speeding up. They're not taking the breaks. We know right now companies like Amazon are prioritizing profits over the safety of their people. And that human cost, that da dangerous management practices that discards workers at a, an incredible turnover rate, that is hurting people. We don't have a standard in Minnesota law that protects those workers. This will do that. We heard from Lots of warehouse workers, and I won't belabor or bring up their stories again because we heard from lots of folks who were at warehouses that were actually taking human bodies and their workers seriously. And what Ricky Schreider has said, she is a teamster who has been here day, year after year on this bill, is that the success of any business or society for that matter correlates directly with the livelihoods, the health, and the happiness of its people. It's time for Amazon and other companies like it to treat its employees as they should be treated with respect, dignity, and that that is the foundation of their success. So members, I would ask you to listen to the workers, listen to the workers who are in the gallery and the hundreds and thousands of workers who are not, who have been telling us that this model is hurting them, that all they need, what they're asking for, is to be told what standard they're being held accountable to and to have access to that data. That's what this bill does. So members, this is a common sense, very simple bill that addresses a really big worker safety problem. Amazon workers today, but frankly, this high tech dangerous model, um, we're trying to make sure it doesn't spread other places. So I'd ask you uh, to, to listen to the voices of workers. Um, this bill is crafted with them and please vote yes. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 60 nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is Senate File 10. The clerk will report the bill. Senate File Number 10, number one on the calendar for the day an act relating to labor and industry, the fourth engrossment. I recognize the member from St. Louis, the author of the bill, Representative List Lagarde, to explain the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, House File 10 would require an owner operator of a petroleum refinery to use skilled and trained workforce at the petroleum refinery when contracting with contractors uh, for certain work at a petroleum refinery. Now, um, this passed last, uh, last year or last session, and I just want to, and, and I hear Democrats versus Republicans, this side of the aisle versus that side of the aisle, uh, labor versus the companies. 
Um, it doesn't have to be that way. I think things get contentious, and, uh, and for me, I contributed to that, and so I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, um, apologize to Representative Scott for my comments in, uh, in committee. They were wrong, they were unwarranted, and I can do better, and I should do better, and I ask for your forgiveness. Um, to Representative McDonald, uh, you know, you, you brought up in committee, I don't want anyone to lose their job, my friend. I don't want anyone to lose their job. This isn't about somebody losing their job, and there's a lot of people that are really good at what they do, and they don't have that training. But this is about creating that, that baseline, and we'll talk more about it. To Representative Nash, I respect you from where I'm from. You stood up for your colleague in that committee. And that means something. So I mean no disrespect to you either. This is personal to me because I was an apprentice. Young guy, big vigor and vitality, go wide open at anything I did. But it was having somebody to have that oversight over me, to, give, to shepherd me, to teach me. Going to school, going to class, know, learning about lockout, tag out confined space, fall protection, all of these things that you don't know what you don't know. And so when this, uh, when this bill was brought to me, it resonated with me. It resonated with me because I was an apprentice. And then going back to 2018, something that um, the refinery explosion at the Huskery refinery, that's what I thought about. The refineries are not just the typical work environment. And I come from heavy industrial, they're dangerous too. But the wrong move with the wrong tool in this situation could be catastrophic. And that's what this bill does, is puts a baseline of uh, training in place to minimize the risk. There will always be risk in these situations. But the goal is to minimize them to the best of our ability. So as we discuss this, uh, Madam Speaker, I know that there's amendments, but I just wanted to clarify certain things uh, before we move forward. Thank you. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Schultz moves to amend Senate file number 10, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A1. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members and, and also Representative Lislegard. I think that that's a good way to start because this is about uh, our Minnesota workers. And, 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 and I think as we enter into this conversation today, you will hear members of this body making sure that we are not firing Minnesotans across this state who currently work at Minnesota's refineries, whether in, in St. Paul Park or whether in Rosemount. And so this first amendment that we have uh, to this bill today is the A1 amendment. And, uh, and, and this one uh, simply uh, makes certain that as we look at contractors who work on the site of uh, oil refineries in this state, that they may have both union and non-union participants, those who have participated in registered apprenticeship programs and those who have not. And as we move forward through the steps of this bill, resulting in, in 2026, 60% of the workforce having needed to go through a registered apprenticeship program, that if there is a contractor that works there, that we base this around the cumulative number of contractor person hours on site at that uh, given refinery. And, and this is important for a very specific reason, because within a one given contractor, let's just use, for example, that there are 10 employees of this contractor. However, the only full-time employees who are working on site at one of Minnesota's great refineries, they may have two people who work full-time on that facility, year-round, full-time. However, their hours will accumulate more and then during times where there's scheduled maintenance at this facility, eight other members of the same contractor might be on site. But those folks haven't necessarily been through either a registered apprenticeship program, part of a union, that sort of thing. And so this provides some guidance to allow for that contractor who employs two full-time people to still be able to do work 
at one of Minnesota's oil refineries. That is the A1 amendment, and I encourage support of this amendment. Discussion. Representative Liss Lagarde. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and to Representative Schultz. Um, I hear where you're coming from, um, but again, the, the, the whole basis of this is to make sure that people have the training and they're, in, they're in, in, ingrained into this process to, to have that training. And so I'm going to ask people to vote no. Um, banking hours is not like, you know, banking vacation and so on and so forth. Um, this bill does not say that, you, that any of those individuals have to leave. It just says that a certain percentage have to be journeymen or they have to be in that program. And for those reasons, I'm going to ask people to vote no on this amendment. Thank you. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ask for a roll call on this amendment. Representative Schultz requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Further discussion? Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just encourage uh, support of this amendment, members. Again, this is about making sure and keep in mind that the people who work at oil refineries uh, in this state and across this country, they travel around uh, the country, literally, and, and work at many different facilities. And specifically in a moment of talking about maintenance workers, the people who do this across the state, they may not. They may not. And so we don't, we don't want, we want to make sure that we're centering this conversation around the people who do work in these facilities and so I encourage support of this amendment, uh, again, to focus around the cumulative contractor person hours. Uh, vote green members. Thank you. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schultz moves to amend Senate file number 10, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A2. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, this bill partic particular works on the language that I have grave concern over in this bill uh, that, that goes after and in particular talks about the definitions around skilled and trained workforce. So our purpose here, members, is to talk about uh, mem people, people, workers of, it, of this state who have worked in refineries um, here in Minnesota and have at least one year of experience working in the applicable trade at a Minnesota petroleum refinery and that they have completed the training required of them. Again, this is centered around safety. And so today, members, as we uh, talk about this bill, the premise of this bill should be worker safety, should be safety in our communities. And so this particular uh, amendment will provide for that, uh, that space for us uh, thinking about the people who have already worked on the refinery uh, or any either of the two refineries and they have completed their uh, safety uh, programs. And I encourage support of this amendment. Representative Liss Lagarde. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And to Representative Schultz, um, once again, I, 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 I appreciate you bringing it forward, but um, there is a difference when we talk about training. So um, as you go to all these different sites, uh, you have to go to the guard shack or you have to go there, and it's called site-specific training. And they, it's, it's specific to each individual site, but it does not get into the day-to-day -day and some of the challenges like access and egress and all the different parts of the job. And that is what the training does. I would just like to read you what an apprentice has to go through in the state of Minnesota for some of these hours to be licensed at the end. A boilermaker, 6,000 to 8,000 hours. Plumber, 8,500 to 10,000 hours. 
Pipe fitter, 7,750 to 10,000. Millwright, 7,000. Iron worker, 6,000. Electrician, 8,000. Um, instrument uh, tech, 6,000. Operator, four to 6,000 hours. That is what this training does. It's over a period of time, both in class and on the job training. And this is just the bare minimum that, we're, that we want installed in this, in this bill. That's what it does. And so for us to say one year plus site specific isn't what the bill is meant to do, and it weakens it. So for that reason, I would ask for a no vote. Thank you. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I ask for a roll call on this Representative amendment. Representative Schultz requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and Representative Lislegard, uh, especially using your experience um, and, uh, and, and, and what the experience was for you in large industrial um, uh, industries in, in northern Minnesota, I, I'm frankly, I'm a little bit surprised that this, uh, that this amendment isn't one that meets your favor. Uh, because, members, this is about protecting the people who already have experience on the job doing this work and keeping people safe. This doesn't include people who have had safety violations. This includes the people who have kept our community safe. And by the way, we haven't seen examples of safety concerns in this state on our oil refineries that suggest that there are people that need to be removed from the job site. So Representative Lislegard, um, would you yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Lissagard, uh, did you work with any uh, individuals in, in your past work in an iron mine in northern Minnesota that, that didn't have uh, a registered apprenticeship uh, uh, certification? Representative Lissagard. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, why, yes, I did, but we're not talking about um, the employees that work directly for the company. We're talking about contractors that come from the outside and work specifically for that. So this bill has nothing to do with the individuals that work for the refineries. This is only for the contractors that come on to the site. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Lislegard. It's my uh, understanding that you have a large deal of experience working with a contractor in northern Minnesota who works in iron mines. Representative Schultz, please confine your remarks to the legislation and not to any individual person or their circumstances. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the, the reason that this is, is pertinent, members, is there are plenty of people who go to work in large industrial spaces across this state and specifically ones who are contractors but work on a daily basis, month in and month out, in industrial facilities. And so, Madam Speaker and members, that's why this amendment is exceptionally pertinent. Because there are people, if we do not adopt this amendment, Madam Speaker, that will be put out of work. That's the premise to this amendment. It's to protect the people who have done the work on the site in the specific areas that might be very dangerous. They're highly skilled, highly trained, and this specifically says that they need to be in line with the safety standards to keep people safe. This is a simple, simple amendment, members, that we should be adopting for one very basic reason. It's the people who know how to do the job and they finish their, their safety training. That's what this amendment does, and I encourage a green vote. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <coughs> Swazinski moves to amend 
Senate file number 10, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A4. The member from Lyon, Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. The A4 amendment is a fairly straightforward amendment, really, uh, you know, not turning a blind eye to safety. And really focusing, you know, the, the bill of, in front of you, Representative Listegaard's bill, uh, SF10, is really focused on, really, do we exclude or do we include? Do we value or do we not value? You know, I think every single member in this body appreciates uh, both union shops and also uh, merit-based shops. And one of our focuses need to be is do we treat these groups or these workers or these contractors in an equal manner? And I believe under this bill, uh, Representative Listegar's uh, bill will exclude if there is a, a, a situation where safety has been uh, uh, breached uh, by a contractor that may be focused on a, a merit-based system within their business as they choose, that they would be eliminated from the possibility of working. And if this bill is focused, it is your true uh, foundation that we want to protect workers and we want to protect the facilities and we want to protect the people that are foundationally uh, at the heart of the facilities that are, rely so important to our state that we will treat both sides equally. And this amendment straight, simply treats uh, uh, union shops the same way we would treat uh, merit-based shops. That if there are two instances uh, where injuries occur, the uh, private business uh, may uh, consult and execute a contract uh, with whomever they like, whether that's a union, a different union, but th that would give them the option. We don't need to hold, you know, this is the best of the best. We don't need to hold down the uh, scale of our hand upon the body and upon a private business in the state of Minnesota and tell them who or who they cannot hire. That is, should not be the job of this legislature. But it is that we should hold folks accountable. If we're going to hold one group to a different standard, fine. But we need to hold both groups, both contractors, both styles of employment to the same standard. I would ask uh, for your support of the uh, A4 amendment. Thank you. Representative Lissagard. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, thank you for the amendment. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're, uh, uh, if you're a union or non-union company. If you meet the threshold, you meet the threshold. If you're unsafe, the company uh, uh, owner operator has a right to have you escorted off the property. It doesn't matter if you're union or non-union. This is about putting in place an apprenticeship program that has a baseline to make sure that 30% in the beginning, up to 60% by 2026, you have this fundamental uh, base put in to the workforce. So I would encourage members to vote no. Thank you. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd request a roll call on this amendment. Representative Schultz requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, uh, and again, the heart of this bill, members, if, we're, if, we're, if we believe in the heart of what Representative Lissigard presented today as the purpose to this bill, the bill is it's safety. And so when there are safety infractions that have been made, especially by those that meet the definitions of this bill, then it should be up to the employers, the refineries in our state to hire the contractors in our state who have kept our refineries safe over the last several decades. This is quite simple. This is simply saying that we should use the people who keep our refineries safe. That's the heart of this amendment, members, with a very specific purpose in mind. Because if there are those who have gone through a registered apprenticeship program and there are contractors that exist in our refineries and they fail by the way of safety infractions in our state, then absolutely the right public policy for our state is to ensure that we bring back the contractors who kept us safe. That's the simple premise of this amendment. The member from Lyon, Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Schultz, for your, for, your, for your words on behalf of the amendment. You know, I think that is a really good point. You know, do we need quotas? And essentially, that is what we're pushing forward here today, is saying, hey, you know what? Folks that have proven themselves to be safety-oriented on our workplaces, we're concerned that this is going to cost people their jobs. We're concerned that folks that have done the work, done it safe, done it smart, done it right for decades, 
have a place in our private industry. This is a private industry. And I would challenge all the members here. Is this the role of government? Is it the rule of government to say, you know what, this is who we like, this is who we don't like. Your private business, we're going to tell you what to do. We're going to tell you whatever that might be. Do we want to keep people safe? Yes. We have an opportunity just to put some minor rails to, to allow a private business to do what's best for them. To do the, what's best for the people that they've partnered with for a decade and a decade and a decade again. Vote green. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 59 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schultz moves to amend Senate file number 10, the fourth engrossment. The amendment is coded A5. Member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The A5 amendment is all about safety and making sure that we are protecting people's jobs. This amendment says that if you have not had a uh, safety violation within the last couple of years, you work on one of these refineries and you have completed your safety training, that you will not be held to the standard of the uh, registered apprenticeship requirements under this bill. Because members, this is, about, this is about the premise where there will be people who lose their jobs if this bill passes in its current form. Representative Lislegard. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Schultz. Um, once again, I, I would just say that um, this was negotiated between um, the stakeholders, which I'm really proud uh, to say that um, we kind of just let them come to a conclusion. In fact, um, Flint Hills is neutral on this bill. And uh, it, it took a period of time, and I want to thank uh, uh, Representative uh, Hewitt for um, asking me to sit down with uh, Flint Hills and listen to their concerns and, and make sure that uh, all stakeholders come together. And they negotiated this later date. They negotiated um, uh, the, the, the phase-in approach, and they did that because they wanted to protect everyone and they know that with these big turnarounds that to reach that 100% is not realistic. So the individuals that you're talking about, they're going to be covered underneath this, this model. 40% of the people working on site at any one given time do not have to be a part of this program. 40%. To me, that is, that is, that is a, a wonderful compromise that if we were truly, truly trying to shove everything down their throat, we would have just said it has to be 100%. We didn't do that. None of the stakeholders did that. You're right. We do have, you know, the body has the ability to pass this stuff. But we took a pragmatic approach and, and they negotiated, and I'm going to stand by that negotiation, and I'm going to ask people to vote no on that amendment. Thank you. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I request a roll call on the A5 amendment. Representative Schultz requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Lislegard, I do realize that there has been a lot of uh, negotiation that has taken place on this bill, but let's keep in mind that the members here in this body... The ultimate stakeholder is the people of Minnesota. It's the people who uh, go to work on this facility too. And, and, and these facilities, these two facilities in Minnesota, these two oil refineries, which we are blessed, by the way, members, blessed to have in our state. And we want a competitive environment that employs great, hardworking Minnesotans that wear hard hats and are blue collar men and women in our state. We want them here. We want them here. I'm proud to represent many in my own district. But Representative Lislegard, 
This is an exceedingly well-crafted amendment to protect the workers who work there today. And the current language of this bill, Representative Lissagard, and to the body, Madam Speaker, would result in people losing their job. Plain and simple. Whether it's 60%, 45%, 30%, over these next few years, it does not matter. There will be people who lose their job if we do not adopt this amendment. Representative Lislegard, I personally, I'm a supporter of registered apprenticeship programs. I am a supporter of registered apprenticeship programs. But members, there is no reason that this body needs to go about firing Minnesotans and telling them that despite their decades worth of work on Minnesota's refineries, that we should somehow fire them, send them home, and to a different state. I appreciate the hard hat wearing workers of this state. And when they have spent years upon years, decades upon decades for some, but somehow, 30 years ago may not have had a registered apprenticeship program and they work as a contractor, that somehow they should lose their job and somehow they're going to need to move to another state. That's wrong, members. We should vote for this, vote for this amendment. Vote green. Members, yes, a negotiated deal between the labor unions and between our two oil refineries is on the table. But Representative Lislegard, we can work together and make sure that we are protecting the very workers today. Future standards, great. That, that, that journeyman or master craftsman who works with a contractor in Minnesota and has been working at one of Minnesota's oil refineries and has been working there for 30 years, they know safety. They know safety. But to hold them to something that we're installing now and say that, well, because they didn't have registered apprenticeship programs then, that somehow we're less safe is completely bonkers. And I encourage support of this amendment. The member from Lyon, Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, Representative Schultz, for this amendment. I think really this uh, helps just instill from a hard line of hard numbers they're going to be hard layoffs for Minnesota workers and gives a little bit of a gray area to say, you know what, if you are the best of the best, if you are the best of the best, if you have already had a stellar work and you happen to choose not to be in a, 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 a union-based shop, that you know what, you'll be safe. And it doesn't mean that you'll be in there 30 years. It may be 10 years. You've got 10 years of great service. I choose not to work for a union shop. I want to continue to work for my, my merit-based shop let it be. The problem with hard numbers, then you have to have hard choices and hard decisions. This amendment gives a little bit of gray area. Maybe that magic number is going to be when all the chips are fall, are going to be 55. Maybe it's going to be 50. Maybe it's going to be 45 percent. We don't know. Let's allow flexibility. No, I don't think this bill's needed at all. I think, you know, allow these organizations to do what they're going to do, hire the best, allow the market to work, let them bring people in that are going to do a good job, a quality job, a merit or a union-based job on their facilities. And if, quite frankly, you've got folks that are at risk, we've heard over and over, no one's going to lose their job because of this, scouts honor, no one, but hard numbers, folks, are hard numbers. The reason why it, it was negotiated from 30 and it graduated up to 60 is because they realized, boy, oh boy, this is probably, you know, let's just kind of push this off into the future because we're not sure how this is going to work. Representative Schultz's amendment really is foundational. Really foundational. Do you believe in the workers, regardless of where they're from, or do you think we're going to make the best decision here in St. Paul? Let 
there be some wiggle room in this? And, and Representative Listegard said this is a, a highly negotiated uh, uh, thing and uh, that uh, uh, Flint Hills is neutral on it. Um, rep would Representative uh, Listegard uh, yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Spadzinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Listegard, you said that this was, uh, you, know, uh, you know, had a great bunch of review um, that, you know, uh, that the organizations involved in this are, uh, are neutral on it. Are all the organizations involved in this neutral on this uh, bill as it's moving forward? Representative Lislagard. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative, um, there's only Flint Hills that has been engaged at the tables that I have been to. Um, I, think, I, be I do believe uh, um, the other one, um, which I, you know who they are. I'm not going to name them on the floor. Um, they didn't want to engage like the other one. Um, I believe that they really thought that, uh, that, that we would not have the trifecta. Um, and then when the trifecta happened, um, Flint Hills really came to the table saying that this is going to move forward. And then how can we collectively work with all the stakeholders to move this uh, forward in a manner that is, uh, that's going to be workable for both sides? And they did do that. I, I would like to remind you, though, that there are um, non-union shops that have apprenticeship programs. That's, what, that's all we're asking. It's not union versus non-union. Just start an apprenticeship program. So we know that, that that is put in place, and we have that baseline um, for understanding of the job and safety. Thank you. Representative Spadzinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, thank you, Representative Listegard. I think that is foundation uh, to this, is that, you know what, uh, even though one of the organizations that it's named in this is not named in this is neutral on it, you know, they're not gung-ho for it, right? They're not saying, you know what, this is us. Hey, you know what, we want our name on this. You know what, hey, we want to charge forward and push this forward, and you know what, we're going to take a strong neutral stance. <laughs> and the other one, I'm, from what I guess, doesn't like it. So why is the state of Minnesota, regardless of your apprenticeship program or your merit-based or union or whatever that might be, you know, what is our goal here as a state legislature? Is it to pick winners and losers? Is it to keep people safe? Right here, the Schultz Amendment, right here, does a wonderful bit of, 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 of really threading the needle between the hardliners, the not hardliners, and the hard numbers that are listed in the spill. Members. There'll be a day, there might be three or four years from now, five years ago, six years from now, we'll be like, gosh, what were these legislators thinking, putting hard numbers into a bill? I sure wish, you know, they would have just thought a little bit of ahead and said, you know, let's put a little gray area into this so that, you know what, if this legislature isn't all-knowing, isn't all-doing and all-understanding when it comes to worker safety and the ability to procure, procure the employers that we need and are, quite frankly, one of the most... Uh, foundational industries in our state. While we can't all be slave labor uh, getting cobalt and lithium out of the mines in third world countries, these are the places that really, honest to God, make our economy go. And we're going to say, you know what? We can't accept Representative uh, Franzen's amendment to protect even the, the lowliest of workers ac across the, the world. And here we're doing a hyper-protection. We're going to say, we know exactly how many workers you're going to have on the work site. In 10 years, they're going to uh, qualify to whatever this legislature happened to have before us today. Protect the individual workers who are doing a darn good job with the Schultz Amendment. Thank you, Representative Schultz. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. On, on this amendment, this is about making sure that you are not firing Minnesotans from their job that they work in today. Ultimately, the premise of this amendment is, is exactly that, in addition to workplace safety. Members, today we are joined by many in the building construction trades in the gallery today. And I point them out because it is my belief, and it should be the belief of this body, that when they go to work, that they know that they are safe because of the people that have been working alongside them for decades. The people who have received the safety and training needed in the, the certain job sites that they work in. And ensuring that as we move forward and chart a path for registered apprenticeships on these facilities, that we aren't 
sending the workers who work there today to an early retirement. That's the premise of this amendment and why I encourage a green vote today, members. Thank you. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 59 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. <coughs> third reading, Senate file number 10. Third reading. Discussion to the bill. The member from Anoka, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Speaker. And L Representative Liz Lagarde, thank you for your kind words. Apology accepted. Um, thank you for, for, um, for that. I do um, want to pose the same question to you that I posed in Ways and Means that morning a, a week or two ago. And that was, what problem are we trying to fix here? And I... I asked if you had any data on, on worse, workplace accidents and stuff, and I haven't seen anything passed out today on the House floor. And so I'm wondering if you could just respond to that, if he would yield, Madam he Speaker. He will yield. Representative Listegard. Uh Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and Re uh, Representative Scott. Um, you know, um, the data that I have and that I went to, and I, I did it, and so I had help with research, and they all uh, they came up with some stuff. Uh, a study in 2022 um, by the Washington Department of Labor concluded that workers who went through an apprenticeship training had 31% fewer worker compensation claims than those who had, had not. And then um, regarding um, mar Marathon, I believe, hang on one second, page 18. Okay, there was, um, there was in 2021 safety analysis done of the Marathon Refinery. It found evidence of a troubled safety culture in unsafe practices that could jeopardize the health and safety of workers or the public. Source, Local Jobs North, researched by Layuna. And so there have been multiple other situations that, the, to answer your question, yes, there have been concerns. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Liz Lagarde, well, do you have any Minnesota-specific data through Min OSHA or Dolly where um, any of the two refineries that are located specifically in Minnesota have had... Um, you know, an excess of safety violations, complaints, injuries. If he would yield to that question, Madam he Chair. He will yield. Representative Liz Lagarde. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Scott. I have one more, uh, and I could have handed this out, but I didn't. It was in the, believe the Star Tribune did an article, um, and it was an accident at Marathon on March 20th. 500 barrels of liquid asphalt spilled, two contractors injured, and it was not reported to the Department of Labor. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So what we have here then, Representative Liz Lagarde, is really two incidences that we know of. Did you, if he would yield for a question, Madam Chair? He will Speaker. yield, Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Did you check Dolly's records or OSHA, whoever keeps track of these violations and, and claims? Have you looked at their data to see um, if 
let's go back five years. Are, are, are there problems in the last five years at the refineries? Representative Lislagard. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Scott. Um, no, I didn't. Uh, what I did was um, speak with the, the people like two years ago when um, the community testified, workers um, both directly and indirectly testified about the concerns that they were having. And when they brought this to me, as I stated earlier, um, I just felt that this is um, something that is worthy. It's not about union versus non-union. It is about putting in a baseline of apprenticeship with um, uh, only up to 60%. So um, regardless, I'm, I'm one of them people that I'm going to do everything I can to try to prevent. I'm not waiting for the Huskery refinery um, where 36 people, 36 workers were injured, $27 million in damages, released 39,000 pounds of flammable, I can't even say the word of whatever it is, um, vapor into the air. Um, over um, 2,500 residents of Superior were evacuated. Duluth issued a shelter in place. Um, and the U.S. Chemical Safety Board's final report found that the lack of knowledge, safety, and emergency preparedness contributed to the accident, and I don't want it to happen here. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and Representative Liz Lagarde, well, thank you for that. Um, my understanding of that uh, Wisconsin refinery problem, um, and it was a serious problem, was the result of cracked pipes or weakened pipes. Um, and now maybe their response to that wasn't what it should have been, but it certainly wasn't um, worker failure. Um, folks, I, I just, I don't know, I feel like this is, uh, as we say around here, a solution in search of a problem. And I, I, to not even take the amendment that says, you know, if you've been working at a refinery all these years, and you have a great safety record, you could lose your job under this. I don't think if the tables were turned, if the state was implementing a policy that said, oh, we're gonna fire these union workers in lieu of, of merit shop workers, that there would be a lot of sympathy in this chamber for that. I, I think that even, even the people that wear the hard hats union, that are union, would say it's, it's not okay to fire people in this situation um, that have good safety, working records, um, just so we could implement this policy. I, I, just, I, I just don't think that that's the right thing to do. And, you know, it, it seems like, you know, both sides of the aisle have their quote-unquote friends, right? And I just feel like sometimes we cater to that too much and, and take the common sense out of what we do here and really look out for people that, um, you know, this is people's livelihoods we're talking about. And somebody that has worked, you know, for 10, 20 years at one of these refineries and done a good job, um, they're showing up on time, doing their work, taking safety into consideration, and then to say, yeah, that doesn't matter anymore. This is the new law of the land. I, I just think it's, um, I, I just don't think it's the right thing to do, and I encourage a no vote. The member from Anoka, Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, thank you for bringing forward this bill, Representative Liz Lagarde. I am a co-author on it, and it has been a good work of compromise. As you noted, Flint Hills is neutral on this bill. And you hear, I wish you would have taken at least one of Representative Schultz's amendments. You know, we want to protect people's jobs regardless of who they belong to. But I understand where you're coming from on this bill. Normally, I would say, well, the market will determine these practices. It's up to the market. Why is government dictating this or that? And on the bill we just heard before this, the Amazon warehouse bill, you know, nobody's forcing anybody to work at Amazon. And if an Amazon warehouse goes up in flames, well, that's incredibly unfortunate. But it doesn't have global or regional consequences that just might delay your package by a day or two. If a refinery has a problem, that's a global issue, not just a regional, not just a national issue. We've seen just shutting off a refinery down for a day or a week has global impacts on the cost of gasoline. So I think there is a role for government when it comes to this. 
And it's the quality of our unions in this state with the 49ers, the carpenters, the pipe fitters. They've demonstrated impeccable quality in their craftsmanship and their dedication to safety. So I think, well, normally, in a normal situation with something that's not of critical importance, well, let's let the market decide. But when it's critical infrastructure, in the same way it should be a felony to chain yourself to a pipeline, we have different standards when it comes to critical infrastructure. So I am proud to say I'm supporting this bill. It's very important that we have the utmost safety standards. And so far, we've demonstrated in this state, this to some of the other members' points, it is somewhat in solution in search of a problem. But the thing is, if there is a problem, it's a global problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. The member from Wright, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a friend that works at the refinery, a cousin of mine, actually. Uh, I won't say his name, but we'll call him Johnny. Well, actually, his name is Johnny. Well, anyway, <laughs> Johnny and his son, they've been there, uh, he's been there over 30 years. And I've had some conversations. I'm on the committee, so I've seen this bill a couple times. Anyway, uh, the safety is of the utmost concern to the refinery. And they've done that beautifully. Matter of fact, there's no evidence to substantiate whatsoever that there is a safety deficiency within the refineries. Nowhere in the papers, nowhere in the testimony, in the committee, that they could pinpoint that this particular area in Minnesota, this manufacturer, the refinery, that there was a safety issue, period. As a matter of fact, the opposite was true. The opposite was true, Representative Listigard. In manufacturing Minnesota, they are one of the safest manufacturers in the state of Minnesota with the lowest reports of incidents of safety. You know why? You know why, you know why Representative Listigard? I'll tell you why. Because they have the best of the best, like Representative uh, Swazinski was saying, like my cousin. The best of the best. Do you know that safety is such an issue with uh, some of the, with the refineries that even when a pickup or a vehicle of any sort is backing up or moving forward, a second employee has to get out and guide them, no matter where they are on the facility. That's impeccable safety, even to that point. And that is why you have no, zero, almost zero instances of safety uh, concerns or any instances or issues. So therefore, it's not needed. The bill's not needed. However, Representative Listigard, some merits of your bill is important. The apprentice program and the unions that practice safety on pipe fitting and electrician, they do a wonderful job. My son's an apprentice plumber. I would not feel safe if he went to Flint Hills or Marathon and worked on the pipe. He's a young apprentice. He's only been in the field for four years. So in that case, perhaps your bill would have merit. But guess what, members? Flint Hills and Marathon are not hiring my son of two or three years, nor anyone that has that little experience. The contractors that work in the facilities, including union shops, by the way, have experts and family members of contractors that have done this for years. Matter of fact, guess how many combined years, if you took the combined years of the employees that worked at the refineries that worked there and are considered experts in their field, guess how many years it would total? Any guesses? 10 years? Do you think 10 years is enough to work in your field to make you an expert? 25? Madam Speaker, 75? 100 years of experience in the refineries of the contractors. And that is evidence of why there's no safety concerns. Uh, re let me retract that. There's always safety concerns, and those two do a great job doing it. So why, Representative Listicard, just to uh, keep this to these two manufacturing? Why don't you do it to other manufacturing in Minnesota that has even worse safety issues, perhaps, or more recorded? Because you're picking on this one institute, these two industries, to kick out a group of folks that are experts, that have been generations doing the work for a uh, union apprentice program. And not that the apprentice program in of itself by the unions are wrong. They do good work. I've been down to the carpenters' union shops and seen the good work and safety. 
but the workers that are there now and the contractors with that combined experience should your bill become law, Representative Stigard, and I hope you're correct, you stated in your opening that there will be no jobs lost. Uh, many are concerned they are, and they rightfully so, because they're there, including my cousin. That because of their expertise of years, that's not good enough. Did you hear me? 20, 30, 40, 100 years of expertise is not good enough to keep us safe. You must leave your job, be displaced, go to an apprentice program, or create an apprentice program that'll be approved by Dolly with the union's uh, input, which is not bad or not bad or not good. It's just uh, they have some good things to say about it, but they will approve it. So Dolly will have to approve the apprentice programs that are developed by the same experts who've been there. So, but just think about that for a moment. Let's say you've been working there for 25 years. You're an expert in your field in the field of refinery for safety. You have zero instances of safety concern, uh, safety uh, reported injuries. And now a new bill comes, in, comes along, Representative Lissagard says, you know what, that expertise is not good enough. You must go through a program. Now I've been a photographer for 35 years. I know a camera inside and out. I can photograph anything. You, I've been some of the weddings. You know, the weddings, oh, I've seen the best and the worst, but I fulfill my job. Now, can you imagine if someone said, well, Joe, you really, you got to go to a class. you got to be apprenticeship. Uh, I said, well, wait a minute, I've been doing this for 35 years. Are you kidding? I'm one of the best of the best. I won de best photographer in Delano five years in a row. No, that's not good enough. You must leave your job and go to an apprentice program that the government will approve or disapprove. And then after two, three years, then you maybe can go back to work. See, Representative Mr. Guard, that's what many have troubles with your bill, that it will displace experts family members, contractors, uh, generations who've done this for years, and they're out of a job. That's what we say, you say not, not according to your bill. So I do have a question, Representative Listergaard, if you'll answer. Oh, he will son. yield, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So, Representative Listergaard, on your bill, on page, you know, sometimes when you highlight things, you think you could find it easier? Maybe my glasses would be better. Oh, page three, uh, under uh, 3.10, the OL, uh, OLM. Why did you exempt them from your bill? I think I know why, but I just want to hear your- Representative Lissagard. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative McDonald, um, OEM is, th that's underneath contract. So say that you bought, uh, uh, the refinery bought a piece of equipment from you and it's underneath warranty then you would have the ability to go work on that. Representative McDonald. Thank you. Uh, would Representative Listergaard yield for another question? He will. Representative McDonald. Representative Listergaard, would you uh, agree with the statement that those manufacturers who manufacture the equipment that they put in the refinery are experts with that piece of equipment? Representative Listergaard. If I am understanding your question right, you're talking about like a pump or... Uh, I don't know what I don't know what piece of equipment you're talking about, so it's hard for me to say. But if an individual, um, the manufacturer themselves, not a sales rep, right? So Dave goes in to the refinery to sell a pump. I'm not an expert in the pump. I may be able to talk about it, but I'm not an expert. The technician back at the manufacturing plant would be the individual that they would send here because he is an expert at that facility. And it's underneath warranty, so they're going to have to follow all the safety pro protocols, probably have somebody watch over them while they're there uh, to make them repairs. But it is specific to, um, to um, pieces of equipment that have warranty. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Listiger, thank you so much. It was exactly the answer I wanted to have you hear because then I could make my point. It's usually how this works on the House floor. In your bill, the OLM, of course, we're not experts on this. You said you're not an expert, and I certainly am not an expert on this. Uh, means original equipment manufacturer and refers to the organizations that manufacture or fabricate equipment for the sale directly to the purchaser or other resellers. So they are experts in their field. Perhaps that person that manufactured that is an expert just for a year or two while they manufacture that piece of equipment. But those who work on the refinery, that's the point I'm trying to make, members. I already know how the bill will go, I suppose. They're the experts in their field, and your bill will displace them 
and say you're not good enough, you don't have enough experience, you have to go to an apprentice program. Which again, apprentice programs aren't a bad thing. They're good for those new uh, employees, new workers that don't, uh, maybe aren't experts in their field. But yours will certainly displace the contractors, the family members that have worked for generations at these facilities. And that's the bottom line. And that's why, Representative Listergaard, many can't support your bill because of that. We're already experiencing worker shortages, Madam Speaker. I'm sure you're aware. And uh, furthermore, if one of the organizations, one of the refineries calls up a shop and says, hey, we need 200 or 300 pipe fitters. And they, the shop will say, well, we only have 150. Well, but we need 250. Well, there's a lack of workers. Then where do they go? They go to the contractors who have been working in these facilities for generations. Under your bill, that would not be allowed to happen. And furthermore, then that could be uh, very dangerous as far as safety goes. And if your bill is under safety, uh, it could do the very opposite. So I hope I made my point, members. I think I know how your side is going to vote. I hope I convinced a couple here, over here on this side because uh, for your bill to displace a group of folks that are members of family of generations with 100 years of experience and say that's not good enough, you must go to an apprentice program and then we'll come back and work and we'll fill your shoes with someone else that is a union shop, that just is not fair and equitable. And for there, I will oppose your bill Unfortunately, Representative Listergaard. The member from Dakota, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I'd ask for a yes vote on the bill. I want to start off by thanking Representative Lislegard for his dedication and tireless, effective work on this. Uh, I also want to thank former Senator Carla Bigham for her years of work on this. You know, most of the discussion uh, today has been talking about uh, the workers or management. I want to talk a little bit about community and common ground. So wherever I knock in my district, whether it is St. Paul Park, Newport, Cottage Grove, South St. Paul, or Invergrove, whether people are workers at the plant or not, I was asked about worker safety at the plant. Safety, skilled and trained workforce. I was asked about it when I was on the picket line at six o'clock in the morning in January. It's kind of cold, but why were folks there? Safety, concern about the workforce. I remember knocking on a door in St. Paul Park and uh, you'd, you'd finished the conversation. I was coming off the stairs and somebody said, hey, one more thing. What about the worker safety? What about that refinery safety bill? Is that gonna pass? And I said, it will, it will. Because I, I hope there's bipartisan support for this. Because it didn't matter in my district whether they were Republicans or Democrats. It didn't, remember, it didn't matter where in the district. Those plants are always a presence. They're always a presence. And whether people work there or not, they're always the neighbors. And they care about the people who work there because having skilled and trained workforce working there is safety for the neighbors as well. So I'd ask for your support. The member from Dakota, Representative Berg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to make a couple of points building off of Representative Hansen's remarks. I too was on the picket line on the coldest night of the year, about 2 a.m., brought them piping hot venison chili. And I had the honor to walk with them, I would say from about 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Um, and listen to their stories. I know Representative Schultz was there, I appreciate that as well. Um, that facility is located in a neighborhood. I believe there are two schools nearby so we're talking about a volatile, possibly volatile facility in the middle of a neighborhood with two schools in its footprint. If that isn't cause for the highest safety standards, the most skilled workers that you can find, I hesitate to find another example. Oh, except maybe for my job, because I'm a skilled flight attendant. I know that that's kind of cute, but honestly, I've been a flight attendant for 20 years. I happen to be a union flight attendant, 
We're owned by Delta. They're not union. But we're all highly skilled workers because I can take care of you if something goes horribly wrong. I know how to use every tool on that plane. I know how to mitigate the damage to the fuselage should that happen. I train flight attendants for the hands-on training once they're on the aircraft. And if they're not satisfactory, I don't sign them off. And I want to tell you, this bill is extremely fair because I promise you, you do not want to be on that 40% of the airplanes that does not have a skilled flight attendant. Please vote yes, members. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. I think that this has been a spirited debate, and I hope that you know that we care about safety and making sure that Minnesotans who have done the work at these uh, oil refineries for decades, that we recognize their work, that we're grateful for their work, that we are grateful to have these two facilities employing hundreds and hundreds and thousands of Minnesotans in our state and not somewhere else. And we want a competitive business environment that benefits the community and the workers. To Representative Hansen's point, I'd also like to thank former Representative Keith Franke for his work in, in representing his community in, in South St. Paul, um, in St. Paul Park, um, and, and, and the role that he's played in this conversation over time. We are supporting registered apprenticeship programs in Minnesota, and I'm disappointed today and saddened that we could not work on a bipartisan basis to make this bill better. Members, the amendments that we drafted were not meant to kill the bill. The amendments that were drafted were not meant as gotcha amendments, but to do well by the people who go to work in oil refineries in Minnesota. And I'm disappointed that we were unable to adopt those amendments today. And it should be a lesson for us as we move forward that state government shouldn't be in the business of firing people in this state, especially those who have been on the job keeping us safe and providing for one of the most critical energy sources that we need for decades. Before I go any further, I want to ask Madam Speaker, would Representative Lislagard yield? He will yield. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Lislagard, under this bill, assuming its passage, if someone has 10 years of experience but has not been through a registered apprenticeship program, then seeks to keep their job and stay on site, and so enters a registered apprenticeship program and works through that training, will that individual be forced to take a pay cut? Representative Lislagard. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and Representative Schultz. I can't answer that. What I can answer is, is that individual, um, if they work for a non-union company, does not mean that that, that non-union company can't start an apprenticeship program. We keep going back to that. We want the non-union companies to do what labor has done. That's the problem here. So, you know, they are the gold standard. The trades are the gold standard, and that's what we're trying to do. We're not saying anybody has to lose their job. Just follow theirs. Copy, copy their apprenticeship program. That's what this really is about. It's creating a baseline from the best of the best, and that is our building trades. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Lislagard yield to another question? He will. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Lislagard, I don't think you got to the heart of my question. My question was, if an individual has been working at one of our oil refineries in this state for 10 years, but didn't go through a registered apprenticeship program and wants to keep their job, if they take the step to go through a registered apprenticeship program, will they or will they not be forced to take a cut in pay? 
Representative Lissagard. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thought I said that I couldn't answer that if I remember, because I, I don't know what the journeyman scale is. They could be bumped up from an apprentice to a journeyman scale. I don't know what that scale is, and I don't know what the non-union people are paying. So how would I know that answer? I don't know what the non-union company is paying their employee. It's a question that can't be answered without all the information. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and for the Minnesotans listening right now, uh, I hope that you just garnered a little bit of understanding as to what's going to happen with this bill. There is an answer to that question, Representative Lislagard. And that should be part of our conversation here today. How many Minnesotans will make less money going through a registered apprenticeship program, having 10 years of experience, having worked and kept our communities safe with this bill? Would Representative Lislagard yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Lislagard, uh, you spoke just a moment ago about uh, something that, that, that I also agree with, this premise that, that we should encourage more people to use registered apprenticeship programs. So Representative Lislagard, do you encourage the Department of Labor and Industry to work more closely with both labor unions and job creators and those seeking to do work in the building and construction trades do encourage the Department of Labor and Industry to certify registered apprenticeship programs that meet all of our state standards. Representative Lissagard. Most certainly, and I believe that the Department of uh, Dolly um, testified to that very point saying that if given all the information when somebody applies, union or non-union company, that it would take two to three weeks to be able to implement that uh, program. And then I did get uh, the answer to you, you know, you've seen somebody come, uh, no, they would not lose any money. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Lislagard, I, I appreciate uh, the answers uh, to, to both of those questions in, in some regard. Uh, there, you will hear today throughout the, the remainder of the conversation on this bill and moving forward that there is great concern in this, in this state where registered apprenticeship programs, those who seek to, uh, to create registered apprenticeship programs, that they're being met with some uh, uncertainty as it relates to how they engage with our Department of Labor and Industry. So it's great, Representative Lislagard, to have have you on the record as supporting additional registered apprenticeship programs in our state and ensuring that those are certified. So thank you, Representative Lislagard, um, because uh, be, that, that's the premise here, right? And uh, so Representative Lislagard, uh, 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 would you yield to another question? He will. Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Lislagard. How many uh, non-union uh, or merit-based uh, shop uh, Registered apprenticeship programs exist in this state today. Representative Lislagard. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I just got the answer. Seven out of 57. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Lislagard. That's super helpful for this body, right? And so this is where I want to center our, our conversation as we land this plane. By the way, planes in Minnesota, when they fly out, they receive the petroleum from these two oil refineries. And so it's critically important that we have an environment in Minnesota that keeps us competitive so that we're doing this work here with Minnesota workers, Minnesota union workers, and those who aren't a part of a union. Critically important. We can support registered apprenticeship programs. We can support strong labor standards that protect the people who go to work there, the people who live in community, but sometimes the heavy hand of government can be a little bit too onerous. Today, members, I personally am going to vote for this bill. But I think that we can do better work. I think that we can do better work by the people who work in these facilities and make sure that there aren't people who are going to lose this job. So I encourage members of this body, when we have a bill like this, take the voices of all Minnesotans Work with the people. Make sure that we are not creating a state policy that works against the people who keep our communities safe. 
Thank you for the dialogue in this debate today. Registered apprenticeship programs are a strong way for us to move forward. And I appreciate many provisions contained inside this bill to allow for flexibility and humility in the way we go about these standards in our state. The member from Lyon, Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Representative Lislegard. You know, I think Republicans and Democrats have a great conversation tonight. You know, if we were to, this bill before us was simply laid before us to say, do we want to keep workers safe or not, it would be 100% green. But when the state of Minnesota becomes between and inserts itself into a conversation between workers and contractors, and uh, quite frankly, one of the most important industries we have in the state of Minnesota, when not all the voices have been heard on it. The best this bill could do is to get one of the two entities that are most important in the state of Minnesota when it comes to petroleum refining and get them to come to a strong neutral on this bill. You know, if this bill was sitting by itself in a perfect world, wouldn't that be perfect? But really what the state of Minnesota has done to this industry is said, you know what? In 30% by January 1st, 2024, 60% by January 1st, 2026, we want to make sure that you have an apprentice program to keep people safe at these refineries. But one of the things I think is most important that is missing from those dates is 2035. And members, I appreciate the fact the folks that are watching this uh, debate in, with their hard hats on. I want to thank you for your labor. I want to thank you for your work. But Republicans tried and failed not too many weeks ago to stop Governor Waltz's unconstitutional rulemaking and enforcing California Clean Cars Initiative here in the state of Minnesota. Those 60% by 26, 2026, those contractors, in nine short years, you know what their job's going to be? Flitching, taking the switch and turning that industry off. Taking those valves and turning them down. And when you take a ride down 52 and you look to the right, you're going to see those lights in nine short years after this bill is fully implemented, and those lights just may turn on because of Governor Walls. California Clean Cars Initiative is, is after your families, folks, at the end of the day. The DFL majority has shown itself to once again put the hand of its gate government against the market working and saying, we're going to choose you, winner. We're going to make sure that you're a loser when it comes to what people want to drive here in the state of Minnesota. California Clean Car Initiatives, folks, is kind of what this bill is trying to make up for. Understanding, you know what? If you had a job and you got a great job working at one of the two great refineries here in the state of Minnesota, and you want to have an opportunity for your kid to maybe follow in your footsteps, with many of you do, in a few short years, this bill will be changed into a worker retraining program. Why don't you figure out something else to do? Minnesota doesn't want you. Republicans are going to stand strong for Minnesota jobs when it comes to everything, an all above energy approach. Not choosing winners and losers. Making sure that workers are safe. Not for just this generation, but the next. Representative Schultz and I had a few good amendments that I think would have improved this bill, saved you from yourselves in a way. Put a little gray area into hard numbers when it comes to actual ability for the industry to fulfill the mandates that are in this bill. We want to keep people safe. I'm not going to support this bill. Vote no. The member from St. Louis, the author of the bill, Representative Liz Lagarde. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, members, for the discussion today. I, I appreciate all the different uh, viewpoints, but I think it is a win-win. Um, we kept our word, and we got this. We're going to get this over the finish line for the people uh, that we represent. 
Uh, it means a lot to them. It means a lot to the state of Minnesota. And uh, Representative West said it. This is critical infrastructure. You know, and, and every employer wants to have trained employees. We spend our whole life learning. And it shouldn't stop when we get to a certain age. I'm very, very proud that this bill is going to um, um, pass. I want to thank uh, Representative Hewitt. Representative Hewitt, I said it earlier, he called me into his office. He said, Dave, this is a very big deal for my community, uh, this refinery. Would you please bring the stakeholders together? And I said, yes, I will, John. And we sat in there, and our bill was the last to get passed because we requested, and rightfully so, both sets of stakeholders came together. The one didn't want to come. They weren't willing. There's nothing we can do about that. This bill happened because stakeholders, both the company and the workers, came together, and they came with this. What more can we ask for? I didn't draft this legislation. You didn't draft this legislation. This legislation was drafted by the people who own and operate the facility and the workers there. I couldn't be more proud for the men and women in labor, for the refinery, Flint Hills, who had, who had the willingness to sit down and, and do that. That's a, that's a quality company. We talk about companies, a company that is willing to sit down and negotiate labor. They could have just said, hey, guess what? Let's just try to shove it right down. They didn't do that. Since John started the conversation, this has moved to be more workable for both sides. And I couldn't be more proud to stand here today because this will become law. Vote green. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 83 ayes and 46 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is Senate File 3035. The clerk will report the bill. <clears throat> Senate File third, number 3035, number three on the calendar for the day, an act relating to state government establishing the biennial budget for the Department of Employee and Economic Development, the unofficial engrossment. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Hassan, to explain the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. It's with great uh, privilege and honor to present our budget bill of the session, House File 3035. This bill includes um, the jobs and workforce development, economic development, and labor. I'll be speaking to the economic development portion of it, and uh, Jerry Shang and Jer uh, Chair Nelson will speak on the workforce and labor. This bill makes big investments to address the economic disparities that persist in Minnesota, including new and low interest loans to, uh, to help businesses, small businesses owned by people of color, as well as funding targeted for economic development in areas harmed by the civil unrest. I first want to thank our staff, our nonpartisan staff, Anna Shaleen and Ken Savers, our committee administrator, Travis Rees, whose knowledge of deed was invaluable. Uh, our CLA, Elijah Henderson, our uh, DFL researcher, Dave Sullivan, and our Republican researcher, uh, Lori Casano. Without you, we would have accomplished nothing. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I also want to extend my gratitude to our lead, Kosnick, and our great vice chair, uh, Rep. Hansen, uh, our members, committee members, 
for all their hard work to make our committee a space, a safe space, so we can have conversation about making Minnesota economy great. And I also want to thank every Minnesotan who came and testified in our committee and introduced us to their community. Your stories and needs did not fell into deaf ears. This bill supports Minnesota's economy with emphasis on small businesses um, by investing in infrastructure, increase, increasing access to capital and wealth building. This bill also makes historic investments in developing Minnesota's workforce so all workers have a chance to prosper in our economy. This bill also has special focus on intentional equity, creating tools to help people of color, women, veterans, people with disabilities, the LGBTQI community, and other underrepresented groups. Our small businesses shouldn't be surviving, they should be thriving. Minnesotans from border to border came to us to tell us that they need our support. And this bill supports communities across the state from childcare to loans for businesses and grants to rebuilding dollars for these businesses that were impacted by the civil unrest to uh, businesses that were impacted in the closure in the Canadian border. This bill simply addresses all, all of that and more. Um, there is a $500 million appropriation that we're calling Minnesota Forward Fund. This fund is to capture federal dollars. It's my understanding that Minnesota will get about $2 billion in the CHIPS Act. Um, $300 million to match the CHIPS Act in the microelectronic manufacturing facilities and workforce development. $100 million match for the um, Consolidated Appropriation Act to establish a campus for myo, myo, sorry, biomanufacturing, uh, testing, and commercialization. And it's my understanding if we create this uh, lab, we'll be the first in the nation to have this in our um, state. A $100 million match for uh, support in economic development. This funding establishes two, two things. One is um, we're, we're bringing manufacturing back to Minnesota. And then the, the other two, number two is um, it is a national security to rely on China and other foreign countries uh, for our microelectronics. So uh, if we attract this money, if we s spend this money to attract $2 billion, that's what we're accomplishing. This bill uh, spends money on what we're calling empowering enterprise, which is uh, funding for the businesses that were impacted by the civil unrest in 2020, uh, following uh, after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, we're also spending money on what we're calling emerging developers uh, program. We heard from our um, small businesses who are interested in uh, becoming a developers that if you don't have uh, family wealth or connection or access to capital that it's really hard for you to become a developer in this state. So this program will, will provide uh, revolving, lo uh, revolving uh, loans to support uh, individuals who are interested to become developers from uh, PIPA communities. We're also um, spending $10 million on the Small Business Partnership Program, which Rep Hansen, my vice chair, was really passionate about. And this is loans to uh, small businesses across the state, especially in greater Minnesota, and small businesses that do tech, and small businesses that are owned by people of color. Uh, the Initiative Foundation funding is $6 million to the six initiative foundations to support uh, small businesses in greater Minnesota. The World Fair, Fair Expo is $5 million that we want to uh, help with uh, the uh, World Fair Expo in 2027, if, we, if Minnesota wins that. $4 million in the Canadian relief. As you guys know, the, uh, our communities that are along the border really struggled uh, with their small businesses because the, the border kept closing and opening and closing and opening. And the folks that came from Grand Portage told us that before pandemic, it was four, 400,000 crossings. And then at some point it was zero. And then now, even you know, years after COVID, there's still only at 100 crossings per year. And their small businesses are really, really suffering under that. Uh, we're 
you know, expanding uh, the Explore Minnesota tourism, as you guys know, our tourism and hospitality industry really struggled during the pandemic. So we're uh, adding $18 million to that account. $11 million of that will be a marketing initiative to uh, make Minnesota a top destination to visit and hopefully live. This bill uh, funds Greater Minnesota suburban communities as well as the urban court. We heard from Le uh, Representative Liz Legard's community on the importance of the film industry. I didn't know that before that hearing because they came to us and told us uh, that this, um, you know, films agency industry comes to their community and they will be renting cars, they'll be staying at a hotel, they will be hiring folks for the setup and the takedown crew, and that is really important for their community. And he was the only person who was able to fill up uh, a room on a Friday morning, 8.30 a.m., uh, from people who drove four hours to come to, their, to, to that hearing. So thank you, Representative Leslie Gard, for introducing us to your community. Um, we heard from folks from the Canadian border whose lives were changed forever. Uh, and this bill really funds that, especially our tribal community in Grand Portage, who uh, really talked about how all the money that they get from the Arbor dollars that they got, they didn't spend it on anything else, but they spend it for survival because where other tribal communities were able to spend on other things for them because the, the Canadian border was closed, they had no other way except to keep their community alive, and that's how they spent their ARPA dollars. So this funding will help. This bill addresses the, uh, the concerns that we heard from our communities, and it's the work of all my members in, in, in that committee, and I'm very proud to present you to this bill. Uh, with that, Mr. Speaker um, and members, I look forward to a very respectful debate and to light up that board at the end of the night. Thank you. I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Shong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our workforce development budget bill was put together by listening to community members from all corners of our state who shared stories about their struggles and how our work has supported them throughout the years and how we can continue to help Minnesotans with our workforce funds. Of course, this would not be possible without the leadership of my Vice Chair Jeff Brand, GOP Lead Dave Baker, Chair Norm for your mentorship as I gave on my first committee, Chair Hassan for your, your partnership in our economic development, and every member of the Workforce Development Committee. I also want to acknowledge the brains behind this committee who helped put this budget together, our committee administrator Travis Reed, DFL research staff Dave Sullivan, Republican research staff Casey Peterson, our committee legislative assistant Bunsi Vu, and our nonpartisan staff research analyst Anna Soline and fiscal analyst Ashley Ng, and our committee page lead Zach Collin and Nick Sandberg. Thank you for your public service to our state. Colleagues, this workforce budget will be a historical reinvestment in our people and infrastructure for generations to come. It creates new competitive grant programs at DEED that provide additional resources for job training, like the targeted population workforce program, 60 million of competitive grant programs to encourage workforce development targeted for communities of color in low-income communities. The fund is for grants to community-based organizations, grants to small employer, employers for training and activities to promote a more inclusive workforce, for capacity building grants to community organizations. We also have the Youth at Work program that is a competitive grant program, um, funding programs to serve young people with an at-risk factor such as low income, homelessness, juvenile justice, school dropout. This funding will allow the Youth at Work program to serve more than 12,500 additional youth in the current program. It also includes a 15 million competitive grant proposed by Governor Walls that will focus on building workforce in five 
high growth industry, technology, manufacturing, building trades, healthcare, and education. Our workforce budget also establishes an office of new Americans that will lead the state's effort to effectively, to effectively integrate new Americans uh, workers into our workforce and our entrepreneurial system. A provision that was introduced by Representative Sandra Feist, this will be transformative. According to the American Immigration Council, new Americans are 10% of our state's population. More than one in 10 workers in Minnesota is a new American and they are in the fields of healthcare, social services, manufacturing, retail, trade, education, and food services. In addition, this bill provides 21 million in new funding for the vocational rehab services, a new program to reimburse employers that accommodate folks with disabilities. This is the strongest bill supporting Minnesota workers with disabilities in our state that the House will pass. At a minimum, it recognizes that including workers with disabilities is an important part of alleviating the workforce shortage in our state. This bill also contains a $7 million uh, provision to the Department of Correction from Chair Noor that provides instruction and employment opportunities for folks incarcerated. We must ensure that individuals released can re-enter society with actual skills to be contributing members of society. Furthermore, this workforce budget makes historical investments with appropriations to many well-established community organizations, such as Representative Senator Mira's uh, legislation for the Minnesota Alliance of Boys and Girls Club, where we heard from Mr. Lamont Billity, who shared his story about how the Boys and Girls Club changed his life he told us that he was a troubled young man, but this organization provided him mentorship, helped him get his first job so he could support his siblings and parents, and it put him on track to graduate from high school and went on to receive two college degrees. Because of our funding to the Boys and Girls Club, today, Mr. Ability, this young man owns a business, a water bottling company in Minnesota that gives back 50% of his profits to the community. We also have Representative Breon Kern's bill funding the White Bear Center for the Arts, a nonprofit that has been around since 1968, serving the greater Northeast metro region for internship programs for high school students to learn professional development skills through an arts perspective where we heard from Ms. Lexi Munson, who shared how attending this program at the White Bear Center for Arts um, as a high school student, helped her gain her confidence, empowered her as an artist at a young age, and inspired her to start a business in the arts. Lexi said her journey to becoming an entrepreneur all stemmed from participating in this program with the White Bear Center for Arts. Another successful program from Representative Andy Smith, a bill for a grant to Bridges to Healthcare in Rochester to provide career education, wraparound support services, and job skills training in high demand healthcare fields to low income parents, non-native speakers of English, helping families build secure pathways out of poverty while also addressing worker shortages in Minnesota's most innovative industries. We heard from Joe O'Hara, who moved to Rochester from Kenya. She knew little English, but raised four kids, put herself through school to become a CNA, all because of the resources from Bridges to Healthcare. She would not be in the healthcare field today had it not been for Bridges to Healthcare. Today, she's enrolled at the Mayo Clinic School of Health Science for another degree and feels confident that with the support of this program, she will be successful and soon have a career in the healthcare that her family can be proud of and care, be able to care for Minnesotans. We also have a provision from Representative Samakab Hussein, which expands job training and placement programs primarily serving the Southeast Asian community. 
where we heard from Mr. Dusu Talk, a young man who recently moved to Minnesota who shared his story that he was lost in looking for a career change. He learned about the career programs at Mongo American Partnership and enrolled in an IT program where it sparked his interest in data analytics and it led him to get selected by Cargill for an apprenticeship role. Today, he's no longer lost because of this program. We also have Representative Abagje's Summit Academy Bill to expand employment placement, um, GED preparation and uh, STEM program in the Twin Cities, St. Cloud and Bemidji, an organization with a history of preparing Minnesotans for a good job. Then we also have uh, Mr. Speaker Pro Tempore's, Pro Tempore's uh, bill funding the Redemption Project to provide employment services to adults leaving incarceration. This budget bill also includes a provision from Representative Petersburg Workforce Fund for Owatonna and Steele County for Southeast Minnesota Workforce Development Area to provide career training uh, and planning uh, for many folks in Steele County. Also includes lead, lead Dave Baker's Pro Start in Hospitality Tourism Management Program um, where we heard from Noah Rosenberg, an alumni of the Pro Start program who graduated from high school in 2022 and shared how he got his start in the hospital industry through this program, helping him get hands-on experience from professional chefs locally and nationally, and it helped him and his peers take some second place in the nation in a restaurant management competition for students. Folks, this workforce bill will support those who come from historically disadvantaged communities who do not have the training and opportunities their peers may have when it comes to both skilled and unskilled labor jobs. We can close the skill gaps with heavy investment in building capacity for our people to train others. This is how we can ensure that our rising tide lifts all ships in the harbor. This is the realization of equity in practice. Members, this comprehensive bill is how we operationalize equity across so society. It is also how we keep Minnesota a state where all members of our society are able to work and provide for the families. Today, let's stand together and support and build a workforce of tomorrow. Thank you. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I want to start off by thanking the people that helped on this bill and helped on our committee. Like all of us, we, we without the people that help us and work with us on, on the committees, we can't get anything done. I want to start off by thanking Kayla Berg, Representative Berg, my vice chair, uh, Representative McDonald, the Republican lead on the committee, Matt Bauman, who's my committee legislative assistant, Travis Weiss, who's our committee administrator, Marta James and Anna Sholin, the two house researchers that traded off during the committee. Um, Helen Roberts, our house fiscal staff. Dave Sullivan, our DFL researcher. Harry Kennedy, the Republican researcher. And Chris Ollendorf, our committee page. Members, earlier today we on the House File 10, which is included in the labor part of this bill, um, we heard a lot about safety. Well, the labor part of this bill is the overact, overreaching part of it is the theme of it is worker safety. From meat packers to nursing homes to the refinery workers, this bill is about worker safety. In the same spirit with that, we've included the governor's proposal to create an ergonomics department or ergonomics program in the Department of Labor and Industry. Repetitive work, doing work over and over again leads to injuries to workers. We need to study that to find out ways that we can make sure those jobs safer so that those workers can go home safe at the end of the day. We update OSHA, Min OSHA, to bring it into compliance with federal OSHA standards. The fines, the, the federal fines, we've been falling behind with those, and we are in danger, if we do not do this, of losing federal funding for Minosha. If that happens, 
Minosha, which we run at the state here and are able to do other things that federal OSHA doesn't do, like the STAR program, like worker con or OSHA consultation, where they go out on job sites and help workers, help employers to make sure that they're, they're doing things safely and correct the problems that they have. We would lose that because we would, if we lose Minosha and we go down, we fall under the federal programs and these fines would come about anyway. And with Minosha, that we, most of the time they go out there, they find something. They don't find somebody unless they've done it over and over again. They go out there and they make sure and they work with those employers to make sure they're doing things safely. We also, we finally fund the Minnesota Public Employees Relations Board or PERB. Similar to the National Labor Relations Board for private sector workers, this board helps settle disputes between public employees and public employers. It keeps these, these disputes out of courts, which will save up money for our employees and the employers, which are our counties, our cities, our school boards, and the state, when we have disputes between the workers and their employer. And it, keeps, and it saves, those, saves money across the board. We also direct Dolly to work with the Construction Codes Advisory Board to upgrade building codes for adult changing tables, um, the window cleaning safety standards, which we've had a lot of issues over the last years they talked about, and that some of these standards are a little rigid. We were instructing OSHA or, or instructing the construction codes in Dolly to work on these to make sure that they make sense for, for other certain building types. And we also bring the solar installers into, into the residential contractors so that they, as well you know, as so that they can uh, access the, the, res, the, the residential construction codes board when, when we have trouble with the contractor, they can go and they can get con, or, or, our, our citizens who have, have had residential solar installed and have problems with the contractor, they can get retribution for that and get, get that taken care of. We also are creating codes for EV charging stations and new multifamily residential construction. And we also close a couple of loopholes in the workers' misclassification and paycheck protection statutes that have been identified. Workers deserve to be paid what they paid properly and paid what they worked for. And last but not least, we fund the Department of Labor and Industry. And with that, Madam Ch Mr. Chair, I stand for questions. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Nelson M. moves to amend Senate file 3035, the unofficial engrossment. The amendment is coded A5. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson, to explain the A5 amendment. Hey, Mr. Speaker, remember, this is just to correct. We, we found a, a couple of minor mistakes that were in the, in the uh, outgoing years, in the tails of the, of the, of the bill, and this, this amendment just corrects those, and I ask for your green vote. Is there any further discussion to the A5 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the A5 amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails, and the A5 amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> ACA moves to amend Senate file number 3035, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A4. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Hennepin, Representative Acom, to explain the A4 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The A4 simply reappropriates $100 million from the General Economic Development Program to two specific programs that um, utilize federal matching funds. First, it moves um, $75 million to the State Competitiveness Fund, and um, second, it moves $25 million to the Minnesota Climate Innovation Finance Authority, both of which um, benefit from the federal matching funds. Is there any further discussion to the A4 amendment? I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Acom. Uh, I have concerns on this amendment as taking away from the intended purpose of why the bill, the money was put into the, the bill for other economic development, uh, still uh, receiving federal uh, matching dollars. And um, if you could clarify for the body, does your amendment still uh, permit for federal matching dollars? I think I 
I heard you just say that. Representative Kostick, are you asking if Representative Aiken will yield to a question? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, yes, I'm asking uh, if Representative Aiken would yield. Representative Aiken will yield to a question. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Aiken. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, Representative Kosnick, yes. Um, both the State Competitiveness Fund as well as um, the Minnesota Climate um, Innovation Finance Authority both benefit from the federal matching funds through the Inflation Reduction Act. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Aiken. I respect uh, what you're trying to do and the area that you're trying to fund, but this is economic development. Uh, we worked hard in the committee to find ways to uh, further increase current and expand current Minnesota economies, make it for a resilient statewide economy in both uh, the semiconductor sector, as Chair Hassan had mentioned in her opening comments, and then also uh, a new emerging uh, ma biomanufacturing uh, that I think uh, the dollars were more intended and more appropriately used for. And so members, I would uh, oppose the ACOM amendment and uh, hope that we can continue to uh, expand the previously mentioned industries in Minnesota. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative ACOM. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recommend a green vote. All those in favor of adopting the A4 amendment, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. No. The motion prevails and the A4 amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Kosnick moves to amend Senate file <clears throat> number 3035. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A11. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick, to explain the A11 amendment. Thank you, members. The A11 amendment. Uh, does two things. The first, it uh, limits the amount of administrative costs that we have in our grants. One of the problems that we have with a growing bureaucracy is that when we do grants, uh, the bureaucracy gets bigger and is making as much money or, or significant amount of taking up a significant amount of the grants uh, intended to help other businesses, intended to help other Minnesotans, uh, and instead enriching bureaucracy itself. And so the first part of the amendment uh, takes more of the money allocated in the bill, 500000 down to 125000 to deed to do the launch program, and instead takes the difference and gives it uh, to the actual grants to help other businesses. And so it uh, helps more Minnesotans and reduces uh, the growing bureaucracy. The second part of the amendment is equally important. What this does is provides for more accountability, uh, especially in this uh, area of law, we do a lot of grants to other businesses uh, to help them grow, other industries to expand and create more jobs and a more vibrant economy. Uh, but when we do those grants, we need to know that they're getting results. Uh, what it does is it establishes uh, a reporting requirement back to the legislature on every grant that's done in terms of the dollars spent, the number of jobs created, the uh, number of businesses established, and then also um, the objective of the, of the funds uh, you, and then a, an accounting statement of the dollars. We've had much discussion here, and we probably will continue, about grants that were sent out and uh, fraud was involved or were simply missing the mark, and the, grant, the grantors are enriching them, themselves. And so uh, one of the big things that we talked about during the committee often on every single bill that came through, um, and so this provides that reporting requirement throughout um, all the grants that are made uh, in this bill. And so it's a good government amendment and I would appreciate and ask for member support. There's an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Hassan moves to amend the Kazakh amendment to Senate file number 3035, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A30. I recognize the author of the amendment to the amendment, the member from Hennepin, Representative Hassan, to explain the A30 amendment to the A11 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Lead Kasnik, for uh, this mm. amendment. Uh, what the amendment to the amendment does is it deletes the portion of the amendment that uh, uh, talks about the uh, Launch Minnesota. We like the Launch Minnesota funding the way it is, but uh, we all agree that we are all for reporting and accountability, so we're accepting um, the portion of the amendment that is 
uh, reporting, but deleting the, the launch Minnesota portion. Thank you. Discussion to the amendment to the amendment. I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if I could ask for a roll call on this. Uh, Representative Kosnick has requested a roll call vote. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote. Representative Kosnick. Uh, I appreciate uh, Lead Hassan's uh, accepting with the reporting requirement and providing for more transparency in our grant making process, but I still have an issue with deleting out, uh, as I had in my underlying amendment, uh, I think DEED can do its job and should do its job with its current base uh, funding, and there is still funds available uh, for uh, the program here. It's just uh, not as generous as uh, DEED would like to give themselves. So uh, members, I think $125,000 to administer the program plus their current base funding is adequate, and uh, I would ask for your support, uh, or excuse me, um, not vote in favor of the amendment to the amendment. Further discussion, I recognize the author of the amendment to the amendment, Representative Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like I said, um, I'm all for reporting, and we're going to um, you know, accept the reporting part, but I want to keep uh, the bill the way it is for Launch in Minnesota. It's an important program uh, that serves many of our communities, especially in um, the PIPA communities that are in, in the tech world. So please uh, support the amendment to the amendment. Thank you. The clerk will take the roll on the A30 amendment, the A11 amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 60 nays, the motion prevails and the A30 amendment is adopted. There's an amendment to the amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. <coughs> Nash moves to amend the Kosnick Amendment as amended to Senate file number 3035, the unofficial engrossment as amended, and the amendment to the amendment is coded A29. I recognize the author of the amendment to the amendment, the member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is the A29, and I would uh, request a roll call. Representative Nash requests a roll call vote. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call vote on the A29 amendment. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is talking about some grant restrictions that are in the bill. So this is uh, talking about different grants. And this would simply say that as you're using this grant for this agency, including Explore Minnesota Tourism, that you can't use those grant funds to promote uh, abortion or gender reassignment services. And the premise behind this is, the, the bill has been passed. Those things are, are going to become reality, but we are asking simply that Explore Minnesota dollars or other grant dollars not be used to promote that because uh, that is something that we are using typically to promote um, fishing or resorts or different things like that and that we want to make sure that we're putting up some guardrails with belts and suspenders to make sure that that sort of thing does not happen. So with that, I appreciate it, Mr. Speaker, and I did request a roll call. Further discussion to the A29 amendment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise to a point of under order under House Rules 3.21b. Representative Bajje, state your point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, under House Rules 3.21b, uh, motions and propositions must be germane. A motion or proposition on a subject different from that under consideration must not be admitted under the guise of it being an amendment. Um, a motion, amendment, or other proposition offered to the House is out of order if it is not germane to the matter in consideration. Uh, this amendment to the amendment does not deal with the underlying amendment, which would be the subject that could be amended. Um, even in discussing grants, it was grants about launch Minnesota, not necessarily tourism. Um, and the amendment to amendment also describes the full bill, not just the underlying amendment. 
Advice on Representative Bajay's point of order. Yeah, I Mr. recognize Speaker. the member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Advice. Uh, under, the, under the amendment, the lines 1.4 have been deleted, but we're talking about from line 1.5 downward, we're talking about grant recipients. The way this has been uh, written in my A29 to the Cosnic A11, we're only talking about grant restrictions. There are no costs, which is uh, one of the principal objections in 3.21b. So it, it, you, you can't rule this out of order, Mr. Speaker, because it actually is still part of the surviving Cosnic amendment. Um, and I don't know how you can rule this to be in order. Uh, it, it's very clearly germane to the amendment, which is germane to the bill. So for that, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would ask that you find the point of order not well taken. Members, I have reviewed the A29 amendment, the A11 amendment in the bill. I have considered advice from Representative Igbaje and Representative Nash, and I find that the point of order is well taken. Mr. Speaker. Representative Nash. I would request to appeal the ruling of the Speaker and request a roll call. Representative Nash is appealing the ruling of the Speaker and requests a roll no. call vote, seeing 15 hands. There will be a roll call on the appeal. Discussion to the appealing of the ruling of the Speaker. I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I, I think um, there's a pretty critical piece of this analysis which is mi missing, and, and it's pretty clear if you just look at the bill. Uh, we're talking about Article II grant management, uh, Representative Kosnick's amendment, the part that has survived, that is still, uh, is still alive, is adding a report requirement to grants management under this bill, and Representative Nash's amendment, uh, just along those exact same lines, uh, creates some restrictions on the grants under this bill. It's all part of the grants management in this bill. Um, it's, it's clearly germane under, uh, under Rule uh, 3.21. It is uh, simply uh, creating some guardrails, just like uh, Representative Kosnick's underlying amendment, which is apparently being taken. Um, it, that creates reporting requirements for those grants, and Representative Nash's amendment to the amendment um, just adds into that same grants management provision another provision about our grants management um, that says we are not going to uh, use funds uh, just like we're being careful to, to report those funds carefully. We're also not going to use those funds for things that are divisive among the state of Minnesota um, while we're in the process of doing, uh, trying to create jobs in the state of Minnesota. So, um, uh, members, clearly this is a germane amendment to the amendment, and we should vote to overrule the uh, ruling of the Speaker. Further discussion on Representative Nash's appealing of the ruling of the Speaker, I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, members. Uh, if you look at the bill, uh, it's on page 43 if you have a copy of it, uh, line 43.28 states, uh, and maybe uh, if uh, Mr. Speaker would Representative Abajay uh, yield to a question. Representative Abajay will yield to a question. Representative Kosnick. Uh, Representative Abajay, um, I'm going to ask you if um, you could share with the body I know I messed up your name, sorry. <laughs> um, if you could share with the body uh, what 43.28 um, does, uh, I would appreciate it. The, and so you give you a second to look that up if you don't have a copy there. Um, but members, uh, what Article 2 does is deals with um, grant management. Uh, in this section, we talked, as I mentioned earlier, we talked a lot about in committee of providing uh, grants to different organizations, but we want to make sure that they have the ability and capacity to handle the grants. Um, and also just put some uh, different requirements in there, provides uh, an opportunity that if uh, the organization receiving the grant is not capable of receiving it, that the commissioner or the grantee um, can uh, either provide them some guidance or uh, with withhold the grant. And so uh, I think it is germane, Mr. Speaker, and uh, Representative, uh, if, if she would yield, I, I think she already said she would. Uh, could you share with the body what uh, 43.28, um, if you could read that to the body and, and tell us uh, a little bit about that. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Badgey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Kosnick. So this article is the grants management 
um, article that we have been including in a number of the budget bills. Um, but going back to the underlying question about whether this is germane or not, the focus is on your the A11 amendment. And so the focus is on how you amend that underlying amendment, not necessarily how you amend the bill. If this was brought in as a separate amendment for the bill, we wouldn't be having this conversation because we could just go ahead and have the, de the debate and the vote. Um, but basically what this um, amendment is trying amendment to the amendment is trying to do is trying to add in a new topic that isn't quite related to um, what you were trying to amend, which was additional reporting requirements, which is already in Article Two. Representative Kosnick. Uh, thank you, and uh, Representative Agbaje. Um, Forty-three point two eight uh, says grants management, and that's all we needed to hear. Uh, grants management is what Representative Nash's amendment does in this article two. It's really uh, not even a, a full two pages. And so it's quite easy to see that uh, even in those limited scope of two pages, uh, we're dealing with grants. And so members, I would uh, request that you do find, or Mr. Speaker, do find um, the Nash amendment uh, overruled the ruling of the speaker and uh, appreciate that. Thanks. Is there any further discussion on the appeal of the ruling of the speaker? I recognize the member from Stearns, Representative Damoth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, I would ask you to vote to overturn the ruling of the speaker. If you look at your rule book, um, 3.21b says an amendment must be an amendment to an amendment on the House floor must relate only to the primary amendment without introducing a new subject. This is absolutely germane. Representative Nash's grant restrictions added to the underlying amendment is completely germane, and I ask that you would find this advice well taken and overrule the ruling of the Speaker. I recognize the member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would Representative Kosnick yield to a question? Representative Kosnick will yield to a question, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Kosnick, um, can you outline for the body what the goal of your underlying amendment that I'm trying to amend was? I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, uh, Representative Nash and members. Uh, the goal of the Kosnick amendment, was that the question I think it was, um, is to provide accountability uh, into the grants that they're used in the manner and objective uh, that they were uh, awarded. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do with my underlying amendment is provide some accountability to say that if, if this is going to happen and this money will be granted, then the, under the Cosnic underlying amendment on accountability, then we should also say the accountability of not spending that money on these things should be passed into law and that we should not spend the money on abortion promotion or transgender reassignments. Or those are all things that can be done by other dollars, by other groups. But I think we should all agree that Explore Minnesota and other groups should be promoting our state based on how much fun you can have when you're fishing up north or when you go to one of our many resorts or when you go to visit a city for something perhaps sampling a growler from place to place. That's a really good effort that you should undertake. But, but what we should agree on is that we should not use this to promote these two items that have been articulated in the A29 to the A11. So, Mr. Speaker, I will again remind you that under and, and the body that 3.21B says an amendment to an amendment on the House floor must relate only to the primary amendment. That's granting, members. That is granting. So in my amendment to the amendment, it is putting up some guardrails around <coughs> granting. It is putting a guardrail on two specific types of grant restrictions that we would like to pursue. Here's the deal. You, you get the vote however you want, and you're going to win at the end of the day. Just take a vote. Just take a vote. Maybe because you don't want to take the vote, that's more the reason that I'm getting ruled out of order. But Representative Niska was absolutely correct. Representative Kosnick has stated the intent of his amendment. Uh, Representative Damoth has pointed out quite clearly that the two things are very much in the same passage. They're both talking about grants, and I've beaten that drum myself a number of times. So, Mr. Speaker, if you would remind the body as we go to a vote what a green vote and a red vote means, I would greatly appreciate it. Members, vote red. Overturn the ruling of the Speaker. Let's have a vote. And let's just have honest debate and honest votes on our amendments. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Further discussion to the appeal. I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, advice to the body, members, the reason that this uh, amendment is being ruled out of order or was ruled out of order is because it is, in fact, out of order. Uh, the amendment uh, before us, the primary amendment, relates to reports and requirements for reports. If the secondary amendment related to that, then it'd be in order, but instead it talks about how grant uh, monies may be used. Um, this is a clear case where the speaker ruled correctly, and please vote green. Thank you. Members, I will remind us that the question before the body is, shall the decision of the speaker stand as the judgment of the House? A yes or a green vote supports the ruling of the speaker, a no or a red vote goes against the ruling of the speaker. The clerk will take the roll on the appeal of the ruling of the speaker. The clerk will close the roll. There being 68 ayes and 61 nays, it is the judgment of the House that the decision of the Speaker shall stand. <laughs> Members, we are now on discussion of the underlying A11 Kozak Amendment as amended. Discussion to the amendment as amended. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Uh, Members, I would uh, request a, uh, a yes vote on the underlying A11 Amendment as amended. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the A11 amendment as amended, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A11 amendment as amended is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Baker moves to amend Senate file number 3035, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A19. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Candy Ojai, Representative Baker, to explain the A19 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Again, I, I wanted to uh, uh, rise and talk about my uh, excitement at the beginning of this session when we got to start talking about workforce. It was one of my highest priorities that I could work on because I just knew when I came down here in St. Paul in January, what a crisis we had around the entire state of Minnesota. A crisis that we needed to do some smart things to get people to be able to come back to work in, in environments that I am already very proud of as an employer myself. We have a lot of rules, we have a lot of things, a lot of safety nets in Minnesota. And what's so disappointing about uh, what we're talking about today is some things in these bills that are making it a lot harder for folks like me to employ people, to make sure that I can keep my eye on the ball, keep my eye on my, my patients, my customers, my employees, and yet for some reason what we are developing here in St. Paul is more rules and more mandates. Members, my, uh, my amendment today the uh, A19 eliminates a couple of these important articles that we need to take out of this bill. This is not good for Minnesota, especially in the areas that we're focused on. It's full of mandates. This, these three areas are especially problematic, um, but we've got to do it now, we've got to do it right, and we've got to talk about these articles. So I just want to take one at a time here. I've got three articles we're going to talk about. The one on Article 8. This is the worst one of all, by the way, I gotta tell you, because this talks about the one industry that is in the most crisis, which is nursing homes. What this bill wants to do is create a workforce standards board, which means that it, it's gonna have major rulemaking ability. They're gonna have a minimum, they're going to, they wanna have minimum nursing home employment standards that are reasonably necessary and appropriate to protect the health and welfare of nursing home workers to ensure that nursing homes workers are properly trained and fully informed of their rights. Do you folks realize how overregulated or highly regulated this industry is already? 
it's up there with nuclear plants. They have federal rules to follow. They have state rules to follow. And now you want to make a standards board appointed by the governor, whoever he or she wants to appoint, this unelected nine-person board is not even transparent back to the governor, back to us, the legislators. I mean, we don't even, we don't even do that with the Workers' Compensation Advisory Council members, but these folks have more authority than that. What are we doing this for? I don't understand why we're making it harder on nursing homes. If there's any nursing home uh, uh, administrators or workers out there, you might want to mute it because this is going to be hard for you to hear. They want to make it harder for our nursing homes to stay open. And this Article 8 is really problematic, members. Man, I just, this was a, this is troubling. One of the highest regulated already out there. Article 13, members, we're going to talk about the meat and poultry processing plants. For some reason, you keep picking on folks that are providing good jobs in safe environments. And House File 23 contains little about work safety, as this industry is overseen by about 11 agencies already and regulatory uh, rules that they already are focused on safety. You know, one of, the, one of the highlights, at least I want to mention, I want to give some credibility to Representative Wolgamont on this in, in the Labor Committee. He finally recognized we have mom and pop shops out there and said, you know, for, for businesses like this with 100 or less employees, we should, we should carve them out. We should set that aside because it's different. So thank you at least for that, Representative Wolgamont, for recognizing the mom and pops. Finally, somebody recognized that, and that's an important part of it, but it still puts incredible burdens on mandates for these employers that are doing it safely. They're providing us food, our grocery stores, our, our wholesalers, our restaurants. We need these workers, and we don't need to make it harder for them. And finally, members, Article 14. We're talking about the warehouse worker again and the folks that you want to keep hammering on. You keep talking about the Amazon stuff and yet more mandates, more rules, more, more, more stuff that you're doing to make it harder in, in Minnesota. I don't understand why we want to continue to make it harder, more challenging to do any of this stuff. So members, I'm just asking you, let's, let's take these three articles, peel them out, Let's not make it harder in Minnesota to bring employees in, to make it uh, where we as employers don't know how to write our safety plans, our health care, our, our um, human resource handbooks. You're trying to do it here. What are we doing this for? This is not where this belongs. You know, we know how to hire people. We know how to keep them safe. We understand the rules that are in front of us. I don't understand what the deal is. I just don't understand why you came down here in January and you thought we just, we gotta make more rules, more mandates, more policies. We're gonna tell employers how to write their handbooks because they must not know enough. Maybe we don't, but I can tell you this, I know a whole lot more than the legislature does about hiring and keeping employees than folks that are elected in this body. So members, I hope that you see that this is really reasonable to just take those pieces out. We should not be focused on creating it harder to bring people to our job sites, making it harder for administrators to have to focus on things that we're already doing very well. So members, I hope that you can support this very important amendment. the bill. But making it harder for people to get employed by the businesses that are that are caring deeply. So, uh, some changes made here. Let's take this back out. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, members. I hope I can get some support on this one. Thank you. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Well, that kind of takes a lot of the safety out of the labor part of this bill. As I said, this is about safety. These, are, these industries that you're going after here are, and we're trying to go after, is to help these workers have safe 
job sites where they can go to work and come home in the same condition they went to work. Um, I don't know why you didn't just take out all the other ones that go right down the list. But members, I urge a no vote on this. This is gutting the worker safety provisions of this bill, and we need to make sure we, that our workers are safe in their job sites. The member from St. Louis, Representative Zeleznikar. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, today I rise on this whole topic of a nursing home edition of Workforce Standards Board. It sounds really pretty. It sounds so nice, so thoughtful. But I don't know one nursing home administrator that would say that's a brilliant idea. What it tells me is how disconnected this body is from the very people that take care of your parents and will be taking care of you. Because I will tell you today that how we legislate will create or close the very place you will need to access in the next decades to come, if you're lucky enough to have a lot of birthdays. Because while all of you think you're never going to need a nursing home, you're never going to need it. I don't want to go there. Well, guess what? I don't want to go there either. But if you need it and you happen to have so many birthdays that you need 100% total care, good luck taking care of your loved one at home 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And if we think we have a vulnerable adult issue, we're going to need a board for workforce standards to go to all the houses across the state. Because that's where we're going to see real abuse and real ne neglect because they're going to be burnt out family members. Because it is exhausting. If you've ever cared for somebody and you never get a break. And the, I, the irony and the actual insanity of this is this body funds nursing homes. So it's, it's, a, it's a session with a trifecta of more mandates, less money. And I've heard it somewhere else. Where else have I heard the same thing? Last week it was on education. Let's do 60, let's just mandate. Let's mandate. A great idea. Let's do unemployment for the hourly employees, but make sure we don't fund the schools. So they really don't get a four to do four and two formula. That, that's brilliant. Because I haven't had one teacher ask me for that. Not one. Not one district. I have them bombarding me of problems. And we have the same thing on nursing homes. Great mandates. And guess what? Nursing homes in the 60s were built. And then guess what? We mandated them because somebody, something happened to somebody. So we got to get down here and run down here and write a policy. Because that's going to fix it. Guess what happened? 2001, we got a new business called Assisted Livings. Because everybody that had the nursing homes, we shut them down. Remember that? We de-licensed beds. Because we were so mandate that nobody could do it. So now we have a tilt. 1,700 assisted livings, 300 nursing homes. But guess what? The assisted living model was built on not having a nurse in the facility 24 hours a day. Why? Cost less money, people. Right? Do the math. Do the math on what it costs. So when you think things are expensive, we haven't seen anything yet. We have, you haven't seen anything yet. You will be paying $20,000 if you're lucky enough to have that kind of money. Easy for 24-hour care in your house. Per month. So if you think it's expensive to pay $12,000 in a nursing home right now and they're closing, it's $200 a night in a hotel with no services. You just get to walk in and get your bed. Unfortunately, that's not the world we live in in reality of caring for somebody. I don't know how many hands would raise that have worked in a nursing home the last three years, but this body set the statutes of how nursing homes had to run. So don't forget it when you're deciding that you're not funding them because they followed the rules and there's no COVID money and now they haven't recovered. And just earlier today, just about an hour ago, maybe it's longer, I listened to, we're not going to prioritize profits over the human needs of the employees. That was a bill. That was the language I heard. Sounds great. But this trifecta isn't going to prioritize money for nursing homes for the human needs of the seniors, the human needs for the family members, the human needs of the caregivers that provide care every day. Because guess what? 
the mandates don't give the money. The money's not following the mandates. That's why assisted livings got built. And they'll be the next one to close, and then we'll be coming up with a new cool word that won't be nursing homes or assisted livings. It's gonna be called live at home. Three words, live at home. So when you think you're doing something great, we have a board of nursing home administrators, we have a board of nursing. We have a Department of Human Services. We have a state licensing that mandates that you're all surveyed. We find nursing homes $3 million, assisted livings, excuse me, $3 million by the policies this body set. We find nursing homes $1 million and not, I don't know another government entity that got fined during a pandemic. That was the most brilliant thing I've ever seen done. We didn't do it to education. Did we do it to transportation? Did we do it to the social workers? I wanna know who we did it to, because nobody can tell me one body that we financially penalized when they did, did not hit the outcomes. No, we just give them more money. And then we create another nonprofit to give them more money because there's a gap. The census went down, the pupils went down. We just give more money, but who do we not give more money to? Remember the words nursing homes. This is a disaster. And members, it's time to wake up. Thank you. The member from Stearns, Representative Perryman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, as, and uh, Representative Baker, wonderful amendment. Um, it deletes a lot of great things. However, as I'm sitting and reading here, um, one of it would be Article 13, the meat and poultry, poultry processing. And um, if this amendment doesn't pass today, or go on our side, and yes, Think of it this way. I've been sitting here thinking about this. If they turn this amendment down and we pass it and we want it, think about it this way. Um, they're saying that um, they support in the um, meat and poultry processing, small business, support small business, and they use the number of 100 employees in that bill. So by the matter of transformation of thinking out loud, maybe 100 employees is the good number to use and as we get to family paid leave, they'll think about that too. So great amendment, but I think it's a start that they're saying that small businesses need our support and the uh, number they use in the meat packing processing is 100. So I guess I'm just saying, just saying, all right? So think about that. The member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you members. You know, this is another mandate heavy omnibus bill that will do more to harm, uh, do more to get rid of jobs than to help job creators and businesses uh, succeed. Uh, as the lead on the, the economic development, we spent a lot of money trying to increase business uh, opportunity, increase innovation. Um, thank you, Representative Baker, for bringing this amendment and the leading parts uh, that are harmful to businesses and do the exact opposite. Did you know that the state of Minnesota lost 5,700 jobs in March, according to Deed. Uh, included in that, the trade, transportation, utilities uh, led the job losses with 3,200 jobs in those areas. Reductions uh, were also in about 1,900 in construction, 1,300 in manufacturing, and 1,200 uh, jobs in professional and other business services. But, you know, a, a mandate-heavy omnibus bill from the Democrats that will do more to get rid of jobs than it will to help our job creators and strengthen our workforce uh, is unacceptable. We are going into an era of economic uncertainty and we need to uh, uphold our job creators and our business providers, our job providers that put food on the table for our families. So Representative Baker, thank you for bringing this amendment uh, because uh, another mandate heavy omnibus bill is gonna do more harm uh, than good for our businesses and our jobs. Further discussion on the A19 Baker Amendment. Representative Baker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, uh, I have a question, uh, Madam Speaker, for Representative Nelson, if he would yield. He will yield, Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, and again, members, I wasn't able to hear this bill in my committee. Um, we didn't hear this in workforce. I think it was more on the labor side of things, but Representative Nelson, did you talk to anybody in your district, any nursing home administrator, that actually says this is something that we should have? 
I'm trying to understand the logic. I'm trying to understand how you think what I'm asking for is so outrageous and how it doesn't make sense. Because I've talked to all of my nursing homes in my area, and they say doing something like this is going the absolute wrong decision. If I'm missing something, maybe you, as the defender of this, and saying this is a bad idea, Baker, that you're bringing forward, can you help me understand in your district what did your nursing home say about this safety uh, board? Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Baker. And Representative Baker, this is a, this came out of a Representative Abadje's bill that came, came before us. And uh, I don't have any, in my district, I don't have any nursing homes. But my mother worked in a nursing home. She was a nurse in a nursing home. And she, I, I spoke with her many times when, when she was still alive about the problems that she had. In fact, she had ended up quitting, retiring early because she could step, keep up with the work with all night long working and then having to spend two hours after her eight hour shift doing the paperwork required. So they need standards in these nursing homes. And I guess if you want questions about this bill, you should ask Representative Abaji, it's her bill. Representative Baker. Well, and thank you very much. I think you told us exactly why we need to have less rules. So mom could have went to bed two hours early. Because you're making it harder. You're gonna make it harder on every single worker because they're all gonna have to take a piece of the pie of the things that you're trying to create here. And that is what we're saying. No more mandates. Last week we had our education bill passed with 65 new mandates that we could count. And there's just more mandates on mandates. I could go around and probably ask a number of legislators on your side of the aisle who, do, who, who would have a nursing home in their, in their area because there are not very many that don't. But this mandate-rich part of this bill has got to stop. We're trying to help you understand how important it is to not make it harder for job creators to do what we do. We so much care for these patients and our employees, and the, uh, the, the pay and the benefits that we try to offer. But you're making it harder, members. Please support the A19 Amendment today. Let's send a message back to greater Minnesota, to the metro, every part of Minnesota that has a nursing home that we heard you. There's some good things that we can do for them. Let's load them up with money later on, but let's not do more mandates before we even get to the money part of this. So members, I really appreciate a green vote on the A19. Thank you. The member from Stearns, Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move to divide this amendment um, between lines 1.2 and 1.3. Representative Damoth seeks to divide the amendment between lines 1.2 and 1.3. Representative Damoth, that is divisible at that place. Um, which item would you like to vote on first? The uh, first part of the amendment or the second part of the amendment? Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to uh, uh, vote first on the first part of the amendment. Any discussion on that? Madam Speaker, I request a roll call. Representative Damoth requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Any discussion on the first part of the Baker Amendment? The uh, first part of the Baker Amendment would be lines 1.1 and 1.2. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, members. Uh, I rise to support uh, the division and, and the first part of the amendment of, uh, from, from the minority leader. Uh, you know, in the month of October, there was 1,100 elderly residents that were turned away from nursing homes. And that was mainly due because of lack of staff. By having this provision in the bill, it's going to make it even harder for nursing homes to maintain their staffing levels and find new, new people to take care of our elderly. And so let's do this for our grandmas and grandpas, our moms and dads, and uh, support deleting Article 8 in this bill. The member from St. Louis, Representative Zaleznikar. Thank you, Speaker Hortman. And I rise on this to, to just speak to, I understand the intentions uh, of what that, at face value, this is seeking to accomplish, which is 
to make sure that a nurse can get their paperwork done. I've worked with nurses for 40 years, um, and I've seen this. But what, what this members as elected officials need to understand, that it starts with us. It starts with us and ends with us. And, and the reason our staff in the state of Minnesota are overwhelmed in the nursing homes are because the mandates are here from this body. And when you keep increasing mandates, and it goes on and on in the care plan, that's the model we work in in nursing homes. We are extremely regulated. We have state regulations and we have federal regulations. Right down to, I mean, there isn't anything you're going to do when you live there that is not in a care plan written down. And, a, and an employee has to document from the housekeeper to the dietary aide, to the cook, to the maintenance man. And the staff are overwhelmed by the policies that we set here. So if we want to get a handle to accomplish what, you're, what we're trying to do, I want the representatives to understand from somebody who's done this for 40 years, who served at, from a CNA to a nursing home administrator, who have worked with colleagues, and they are all calling me across the state. I don't even know these people. I haven't worked in the field since 2019. So it is important for you to know that the implications of this mandate, another layer, it's, it's going to give a report. If you want to have meaningful impact, we need to stop adding more things to document and do. It, that duty, when you write the mandate, somebody has to do it, or the very body, another agency we have jurisdiction over comes in and gives us a fine at the nursing home. Would have given your mother a fine for not doing proper documentation and following the care plan as set by the Minnesota Department of Health. So this is the chicken and the egg game we're playing, folks. And another layer of government is not going to accomplish this. It's going to frustrate and run out nurses faster because they're tired. And they're really tired after two and a half years of COVID and being short staffed because they had no options. And so now we have to move forward because the largest group of people are aging. And if we want to really make a difference, we've got to take care of the chicken and then the egg and make sure we have enough caregivers to care for Minnesota. But if we keep adding a bureaucracy, people are not staying in health care. And I want you to understand why this is happening, because it is happening. They can't handle the mandates. And so it is already regulated like at, an, at a nuclear level. That's what everybody's always said. It's, it's right up there with that level of, so you're asking a CNA and a dietary aide to do documentation that the engineer's doing. And everybody, and this is what they do, three shifts a day, 365 days a year, and they're out of compliance all the time because it's not possible. It's not humanly possible to do. Every time something happens, we write another regulation as if that's gonna solve the problem. People, we need less mandates and give the people jurisdiction and they'll do what's right. You've already told me at committees, we have great workers in Minnesota and we do. Let them do their job. Thank you. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, I serve on the Labor and Industry Committee, and, and by far, this is uh, one of the most uh, damaging provisions that we, we saw this year. But most specifically, members, it's because it strips away our authority in the conversation. Why would we be doing that? This isn't Minnesota common sense. State law currently says that this, this decisions related to, uh, to the, these workforce standards for nursing homes and the direct jurisdiction over nursing homes is here at the legislature, and somehow, we're having this debate today because there is this language inside this omnibus bill that takes away the authority that we have as legislators to govern these issues. This, this can't be found in any other state in the nation, members. So we're providing an opportunity for you to strip this out of the bill because it's the wrong policy for our state. We can set up additional councils and others to take input from folks across the state but ultimately, the decision over these standards should be here at the legislature. So why are we abdicating our role? Why are we abdicating our role in this crucial and vital part of our economy, of the way that we care for our aging adults in Minnesota? 
Why is the legislature abdicating our responsibility? That's the question right now. Let's strip this from the bill and let's keep that authority here at the legislature because members, instead you want to give this to a board of unelected appointees of the governor who have no, who have, you know, we don't have any course of recourse against the actions that they take. And instead, they're unaccountable. Unaccountable, which honestly might put us in a position where the aging population, which is growing in our state, will be worse off. It's bad policy for our state. Let's adopt this portion of the amendment. The member from Stearns, Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, um, as we have been talking about the crisis in our nursing homes since the beginning of session, you would have heard uh, more about the crisis in nursing homes even years prior. This gives us the perfect oppor opportunity to remove from this bill by voting yes, and I would look forward to a full green board, voting yes to take out Article 8, which is the first half of this amendment, and thank you, Representative Baker, for bringing this amendment forward. By taking out Article 8, it helps alleviate, it does not solve the problem that our nursing homes are facing, but it does alleviate extra burden that would increase the crisis that they are at. And Representative Nelson, I know you said that you did not have any nursing homes in your district. Many of us do have nursing homes in our district. Many of us are walking that fine line of needing to care for elderly parents or making decisions going forward. But by reducing the availability to nursing homes does not serve our most vulnerable people well. They need to be in their communities, close to who they are comfortable with, whether it's friends or family, to continue giving them the quality of life that has changed drastically, but yet will still improve as they are in their final days. So members, I look forward to a green vote. Please vote yes on the division of this amendment to strip out Article 8. Thank you. The member from Candy, Ohio, Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, uh, thank you, Leader Damoth, for thinking ahead and, and trying to slice this thing down a bit, because this is a very important vote. Uh, Madam Speaker, I was wondering if uh, Representative Brand would yield to a question. He will yield. Representative Baker. Madam Speaker, and Representative Brand, as the vice chair, too, of our workforce committee, we did a lot of good things in that, in that work this year. Um, do you have, uh, Representative Brand, do you have a nursing home in your district? Representative Brand. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Baker, yes, I do have a nursing home in my district. Representative Baker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If he would yield for one final question. He will. Representative Baker. Um, and Representative Brand, I'll ask the same question I asked Representative Nelson. When you came down here in January of this year to the nursing homes and some of the conversations I hope you have had with your nursing homes in your district, is this thing, this mandates the new Workforce Standards Board, do you think, Representative Brand, this is something that your nursing homes are looking for in your district? Representative Brand. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Baker, I would say that when I came down to, or came up to St. Paul, rather, from, from uh, St. Peter, um, and with this in mind, you know, there are a lot of things that kind of uh, coalesce together when we're talking about this issue. Um, one of the big things that's missing from this debate is, is a larger conversation about workforce in general, and we really can't have a very strong conversation about workforce in general in this state or across this country if we're not actually talking about immigration reform. And when I went and talked to both assisted living homes and nursing homes, I will tell you that that was the first part of the conversation was that we need more workforce. And more workforce isn't just going to get invented overnight. It's a 20, 20 year or so problem um, that we're facing. And honestly, at the end of the day, we could resolve these problems and get more people in seats working in these jobs if we actually had strong immigration reform across our state. Thank you. Representative Baker. Uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you for not answering it, but I think what you did try to do was pivot away to something else that um, you think that a bill like this uh, well, what you didn't even address, the mandates of coming, you're, you're talking about something completely different in that I will bet you 
not going to, but we will, we will have this agreement. Your nursing homes will not be happy if, if folks are voting to add it harder to keep their employees and to uh, have the administrators not, not support what we're trying to do here. This is not working well. So members, um, this is not what anybody came down here to do from, great, I know, greater Minnesota, uh, that you did not come down here to make it harder for people to hire people because we already have such a massive shortage, especially in this industry. Members, please vote green on the division on the first portion of the A19. I strongly urge a green vote. The clerk will take the roll on the first portion of the A19 amendment. Wolgamot votes no. The clerk will close the book, close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 69 noes, the first portion, uh, the motion does not prevail. The first portion of the amendment is not adopted. We are on the remainder of the Baker Amendment. Representative Baker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, uh, before I forget, I do want to have a roll call for the last final section. Representative Baker requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Baker. And um, this is a sad day. I'm sorry, Representative Zelaznikar. Sorry, I screwed that up bad. Zelaznikar. Because she's the biggest champion we have here for nursing homes. She's been in it for 40 years. I have learned so much from her from my administrators back at home, and what we just did was a huge setback for the nursing homes. So, uh, members, I do hope that you look at the last uh, second portion of A19. Let's help the meatpacking industry, and let's help, um, what was the last one here? Warehouse workers. They all need us. They, nobody needs more mandates in the world that we live in right now. There is plenty of that. So members, again, I urge a green vote on the second portion of the A19. The clerk will take the roll on the second portion of the A19. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Mecklen moves to amend Senate file number 3035. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A26. The member from Sherburne, Representative Mecklen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we've heard a whole lot of uh, interesting things today. One in particular was uh, industries we're going after, recently by Chair Nelson. This amendment would strip out the entire Article 15 out of this, and I'm going to explain part of my reasoning for this. I understand you're trying to kind of uh, dial in the wage theft here. Um, it talks about some interesting things that I would then, as a general, I would have access to their payroll records, their payables, which would give me confidential information, I would believe, about how they run their business, what do they pay their people. I find it concerning when we have repeated conversations about a lack of affordable housing, and we're going to drive the cost of housing up. We have a lack of labor, we're going to make it more complicated. In this, it also just assumes if you are building 10 units uh, on one project site annually, and I don't know what exactly a project site is, it's very vague, it's not extremely descriptive. 
And where this 10 unit number came from, I have no idea. What I do know is to be compliant with all this, it would require me to hire at least one, if not two people to literally audit every other sub's books. I am required to sub out different groups. I am not allowed to do electrical work. I'm not a licensed electrician. I cannot do HVAC work and I cannot do plumbing work. I'm required to sub them out. This, to me, is one of the most amazing things that I have ever seen, and it's quite personal because earlier we heard Representative Lislegar, he said something very interesting. He said he talked to the stakeholders. Nobody talked to me about impacting small general contractors. I never heard about it. I wonder if any general contractors were, were conversated about this or brought into the, the conversations because this will definitely impact them. What if the general contractor did absolutely everything right and somewhere down the food chain from sub to another sub, something happened? They, maybe an employee and an employer have a dispute. That, and may, Who knows? What if, here, I was talking to my partner today and they're at a job in St. Cloud. The plumber had to come in for one hour. Or he had a, one of his guys come in for one hour. And then he goes to another job and he goes to another job and none of which are mine. But say there's some dispute or he doesn't whatever and, and he doesn't get paid for three days. Does he just come after me? I don't know where he worked the rest of the time. I couldn't tell you. I don't even know who it is. I don't know what their agreement is. You talk about wage theft. If I have to go pay that individual a second time when I've already paid the person that's supposed to pay them, that's wage theft to me. By the way, Madam Speaker, I request a roll call. Representative Meckland requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This language is simply untenable, and, and it, 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 removing this to me, I, 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 this is so bold and so egregious, and, and I, I actually think this will, I, actually I know this is gonna go, go, go into litigation. I've been talking to even my personal lawyer um, at length over the weekend, because you're explicitly exempting one group on lines 184.30 through 184.33. Does kind of seem like there might be a little bit of an argument of something I think lawyers call equal protection under the law. Is that the right way to say that? Thank you, sir. I'm not a lawyer and I'm just a happy hammer swinger. I used to be a happy hammer swinger. This stuff doesn't make me very happy. So that is my amendment, Madam Speaker. The member from Ramsey, Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, thank you, Representative Mecklen, for saying that this bill is one of the most amazing things you've ever seen. I agree. I love this bill. Um, so I will be speaking uh, in opposition to your amendment. Um, this bill is incredibly important. It addresses wage theft, which I think all of us agree is a serious issue in the construction industry. Um, almost a quarter of workers um, in the construction industry do um, are subjected to wage theft. And we had a number of workers come and share their stories with us, including Chair Nelson, who has been subjected to wage theft. Um, so we know this is a very pervasive issue. Um, what this bill would do is shift the obligation to address wage theft from the worker who has the least power to assert their rights to the general contractor who has the most control over the project site. Um, I did speak with a number of stakeholders, including general contractors, including uh, two general contractors who are women and minority owned businesses who submitted letters in support of this bill. Um, I also had extensive conversations with subcontractors and we've included language in this bill that will make it uh, more clear what the rights are between the general contractor and the subcontractor. Um, the goal is for this to be a workable bill um, and to effectively combat wage theft um, and and um, I, I will leave it at that um, I think we'll continue this conversation but I would urge uh, members to vote no on this amendment this is an incredibly important provision of this bill thank you the member from Anoka representative Niska thank you madam speaker and thank you representative Feist for that um, explanation of the of the bill um, I, 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 we've had a lot of conversations about trying to make uh, bills workable, and um, I'm, I'm disappointed in the way that this bill uh, comes to the floor. I, I think it's, it's very unworkable, and I'll say that as someone who has uh, had some experience in the construction industry. Um, members, this is a, this is a, a carve-out for labor, but fundamentally this is an anti-small business bill. This is a bill that makes it 
virtually impossible for um, a small business who operates as a general contractor. Uh, it's going to massively increase their litigation uh, exposure. It's going to massively increase the risk of any general contractor. And that risk is going to go somewhere. It's going to go into the cost of building a home. And members, it massively hinders the ability of any new subcontractor, any new small business to get into the subcontracting space because no general contractor who's going to be on the hook for something they can't control. Um, let's be real about what's really going on. These are independent businesses at one level of the, uh, at the general contractor level and then the subcontractor level and then sometimes a sub of a sub uh, because we do take very seriously in Minnesota the idea that we have to li that we have licensed trades and so electricians uh, and, and, and many other licensed trades um, have to be, th those trades to be done on a, on a construction work site have to be subbed out to somebody that the general contractor can't control. Um, the, the language, the way that this is worded, um, is, is very, very broad and very, very bracing. So if you look at 183.8, this is the, the, the nub of this bill, the central provision of this bill. It says a, con a contractor entering into a construction contract shall assume and is liable for any unpaid wages, fringe benefits, penalties, and re resulting liquidated damages owed to a claimant or third party acting on the claimant's behalf by a subcontractor at any tier under that, that contractor. Of course, this is completely unworkable, which is why there's an, a complete exception to everyone who is uh, subject to a, uh, to a, uh, uh, to a collective bargaining agreement. That's the provision that Representative Mecklen correctly pointed out. So members, this is, uh, this is a, a unless, we, unless every uh, contractor becomes a labor contractor, which I, I suppose might be the, the goal of this bill, this is a, just a hammer against every single small business in the construction industry. It makes it virtually impossible for any um, small, general contractor to, to, contractor to survive and it makes it impossible or, or un, an unreasonable risk for any, any general contractor to hire a new subcontractor, which is going to be bad for small business in that space as well. But I do have some questions for Representative Feist if she'll yield to a question. She will yield. Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Feist, uh, the, the, the Minnesota Department of Revenue um, in their fact sheets defines wage payments to include withholdings. And so as the author of this bill, I'm curious whether the intent of this bill would be to hold general contractors liable if a subcontractor fails to make withholdings. Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the question, Representative Niska. Um, yes, a common issue with wage theft is when um, employers pay people off the books or they misclassify them so they aren't properly withholding um, the payroll taxes that they should be paying. And so, yes, a general contractor who hires an unethical subcontractor or if a subcontractor down that chain of contracts um, inappropriately classifies uh, a worker and does not properly withhold taxes, then yes, the general contractor would be liable. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Feist. I appreciate the honesty on that. Um, and, and I assume as well um, if Representative Feist will yield. She will yield. Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Feist, I, I assume as well you're aware that under Minnesota law, uh, someone who fails to withhold um, is, uh, liable for, is personally liable for that failure to withhold. Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the question. Um, I am an attorney, um, but I actually don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, but I, I'll trust you. Um, but if, if uh, someone is liable, um, then they would be liable under this bill. Thank you. Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Feist, it is the, that is the law in Minnesota. And so my question, uh, my next question, um, if, if uh, Representative Feist will continue to yield. Yield for another question? She will yield for another question. Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, is it your intent then that the owners of a general contractor are also then personally liable for the failure of their subcontractor to uh, pay withholdings, even if the general contractor remains an entity in good standing in Minnesota? Representative Feist. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is a labor bill, not a construction law bill. So the attorneys advising these companies would need to um, advise them on what their liability would be. Um, this bill simply says that the general contractor or project owner is liable for wage theft that occurs on their project. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Feist, for that answer. I think that, again, this uh, shows exactly why this is an anti-small business bill. Uh, we're talking about uh, nuanced, uh, open questions of law that we're throwing on the uh, onto um, small businesses, small general contractors, small subcontractors. Um, these are uh, companies that don't necessarily have an in-house lawyer, or if they do, it's very, they, they, may, they maybe have a lawyer who they go to to draft forms of contracts, but this is again a situation where complexity is a subsidy for the biggest businesses in our state um, as a po and, and harms our small businesses in our state. This is an anti-small business law, this is an anti-small business provision, and more importantly, this is a higher cost of housing provision. It's going to drive up the cost of, of housing, it's going to drive up the risk that general contractors are having to, to take on. They've already had to pay for um, the uh, a general contractor in this in this circumstance has already paid for the labor once. They have already paid the bills to all of their subcontractors. They've already paid the bids that their subcontractors have paid. And when the subcontractors then don't do something that they were supposed to do, then the general contractor is forced to pay again. What that means is that you, the homeowners, the home buyers of Minnesota, are the people who are actually going to have to pay when we drive all of the small general contractors out of the business, when we drive all the small subcontractors out of the business, or or prevent new ones from coming in, and when we pile more and more cost on the, 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 those who are trying to build homes to house Minnesotans. This is a, a bad bill. Uh, thank you, Representative Mecklen, for this amendment. It's a good amendment. Vote yes. The member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, Representative Feist, we had a, a fairly animated conversation when this uh, was in state government finance. It was, uh, it was in the intro, one of the, the organizers that were there to promote and speak in favor of it basically said that this was to, um, one, as Representative Niska pointed out, that unions were exempted from this, uh, and spoke very antagonistically towards general contractors in the course of the discussion in, that, in the uh, committee that day. And, I, and as I said, and, and we talked about afterwards, I have a great many friends who are general contractors and subcontractors who then in turn sub out to other folks. And I, I know that they're super busy. They can't, they don't, they don't know everything that's going on with their subcontractors. So um, I guess one of my questions for you, if she would yield, Madam Speaker. She will yield, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What protections do you have in this bill for general contractors if a subcontractor provides uh, fraudulent or incorrect information in response to the general co contractor's audit requests. Um, so, because in the bill as written, the general contractor would be liable, uh, and this is the important part, even if the general contractor did everything they were asked to and they did everything right. Can you help us with that question? Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the question. In this scenario, say that a worker comes to that general and they say, I am owed $1,000 and I wasn't paid it inappropriately. So that general then pays that $1,000. Um, they could then recoup those costs from the subcontractor. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. That's not exactly a protection, though. So there's no protection for the general contractor. So if, if the ABC general contractor hires the CDE or the DEF subcontractor uh, and the subcontractor provides false information or, or whatever, the general still has done everything right and they've actually paid for that service ahead of time. Now they're going to have to pay it twice. And Madam Speaker, if she would yield to the question. She will yield. Representative Nash. Okay, thank you, Madam Speaker. And in that scenario that I just laid out where the subcontractor has provided uh, fraudulent information back to the general who has done everything right and has paid ahead of time for all that stuff and they in your case uh, where this is apparently very rampant um, they've done everything right they're now going to have to pay for it twice is that not correct representative feist thank you madam chair or speaker um, thank you for the question so 
what will often happen in this scenario is that the general contractor has a holdback provision where they probably have funds that they have not yet paid to their subcontractor. They could take the funds out of that. Um, but I, I really reject the premise of the question that this is a punishment to the general contractor and that we're holding them responsible for something unfairly. Almost 25% of workers are doing what is asked of them. They're showing up to work every day. They're working often in unsafe conditions. They are, are doing their job, and they are doing it with the expectation of being paid and being safe and, and being treated fairly. And, and right now, it, I, I, we've had this conversation. I, I do not, you know, if 25% of workers are being subjected to wage theft, that means that 75% of ethical general contractors are being underbid by these unethical players. And, and you know, your friends and community members may be doing everything right, but there are unethical uh, general contractors out there and subcontractors out there who are stealing wages from workers who are doing everything right, who are showing up to work. And so, I, so this is an important bill, and if that in general contractor has to pay $1,000 twice, that's unfortunate. But um, they are in a much better position to pay that cost than workers. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, in, in the pantheon of rejecting premises, I will reject the, that these general contractors are indeed um, defrauding. I don't, I don't want to use the word that was coming to mind, but defrauding the subcontractors. You know, I, I know a lot of them. I, I know lots and lots and lots of them because uh, my future son-in-law is one. Uh, we're hoping that that happens soon. Kids, if you're listening. Uh, and what's happening is the, is the premise that you have, I believe, is a false premise. That as a general contractor, their family company is effectively raking their employees over the coals, and that's just wrong. And what's happening is, let's say a subcontractor, either fraudulently or through some mistake, there's no mechanism in this bill that I understand that provides for, for remediation or, or uh, you know, for the general to be made whole. And I, I just, once again, we had this, and I'm not gonna go back to what happened in, in committee because you and I were there and we talked about it afterwards. That was off the rails. But what this bill does is it's going to effectively add to the cost of housing. And a general contractor has a lot to do. And, and if you've ever been on a job site, and I, I did in college and I worked for a lot of those folks, I, the general contractor is literally like a three ring circus and they're, they're trying to keep all the parts moving. They don't have access necessarily to the personnel data, nor for that matter should they have some of the, the, the records that you're asking for. That's asking for a lot. So, uh, you know, Representative Mecklen, there you are. Thank you for this amendment. Uh, I will be supporting this amendment. I am saddened that the conversation that we had, I don't know, weeks ago in SACA FI, we haven't actually... Um, I don't think you've made any changes to the morphology of the bill, uh, at least around the conversations that we have, and maybe I'm happy to be corrected if, if that's the case, but I, I'm deeply troubled by this. Um, so for that matter, I will be voting yes on the Mecklen Amendment and would encourage my, my friends to do so as well. The member from Lyon, Representative Spadzinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. Uh, thank you, Representative Macklin, for this amendment. You know, I think, you know, when we look at employment law and you look at in, in, in what the business of the state of Minnesota is doing in this particular area, we're talking about job creation. You know, foundationally, this portion that Representative Macklin uh, is looking to remove from this bill, quite frankly, is a lawyer full employment clause in this bill. It's looking to put the state of Minnesota back in between employees and employers, between general contractors and their subcontractors. Folks, Representative Niska just brought out the fact that we're going to hold the general contractor responsible, essentially double jeopardy when it comes to the cost. One of the things that we're hearing over and over and over, have you visited anyone in your area that says, you know what, the cost of construction and building a house is going down in my district. The ease of getting the permit and getting someone to actually show up and do the work is getting a lot easier in my district. If you've heard that, boy, oh boy. That's a rare conversation, folks. Folks, just a number of years ago, Representative Keel brought a bill before us talking about the cost of construction between the city of Moorhead 
in the city of Fargo, when it costs to build a triplex or a duplex and create housing that's affordable? Does this, amend, does, does this bill before us that we're seeing, that Representative Mecklen is wisely trying to eliminate a very costly portion, that's going to make it more difficult and make the job of lawyers more, uh, uh, make it easier for lawyers to get involved in these projects and suing and driving the cost up? Who pays for that extra cost? Homebuyer. The home buyer, the family, the single mother. The small business person trying to, make it, trying to make sure that they can make enough so that they can pay their one employee with your paid family leave. Folks, you're not making life cheaper. You're not making life easier here for Minnesotans. Yeah, we're going to get you, you general contractor. We're going to show you. You're going to pay that subcontractor, and something gets goofed up, and they have some sort of a disagreement between that employee and that subcontractor, and they're going to say, hey, Mr. Mr. General Contractor, you know, you need to do this, and you're busy, you're doing your thing. Oh, you dropped the ball, whatever. Something happened, they got their payment, the project's done, now it's got to come out of your project. And guess what? Ring, ring, ring. Hey, Mr. General Contractor, you're being sued by so-and-so employee you've never met before, ever you know, because so-and-so that you never knew and who did this and that to you. Boy, they didn't like what you did because you didn't stand up, blah, blah, blah. Oh, shoot. Man alive. Wow. You know, we had a bill just before us, House Senate File 10. We had an opportunity for the state to stay out of the business of a private employer. Let them work it out. But nope, the state of Minnesota, these folks want to come here, tell us what to do. Tell you how to interact with your employees. Well, here it is again. Folks, boy, if you're a, job, if you're a housing provider in the state of Minnesota, you're looking at this going, boy, oh, boy. What am I supposed to do here? I'm just trying to build houses for folks so that they got a cheap place to live. You know what I will do? The state of Minnesota says, hey, hold this. Let's make it more expensive. Let's make it more rig rigorous. Let's make sure that I got to have accountants and lawyers on staff on call so that, boy, golly, you know, something's going to show across my desk. You know, a perfect relationship is general contractor. You have sheet rockers. You have framers. You have roofers. You have plumbers. Those folks work together on a day in, day out. You may have some bad actors. Can you believe it that we were told in this House floor that it is a rampant problem we're trying to fix here? This is all over the place. Folks are getting ripped off by these nasty general contractors. Come on. Come on. You get out in the field Representative Mecklen is a guy, you know what, who is on a roof. He's not just looking and pointing and smoking some big cigar and saying, you know what, get the job done. He's up there. He's bidding it. He's making it work affordably so that homeowners and families and small business owners can actually put down foundations in this state. It seems like day in and day out, the Democrat majority does not want us to build foundations in the state. They want to build roads for those that want to produce and give homes and build homes affordably in the state and build businesses that are competitive on a, on a business, on a regional and an international uh, marketplace, more expensive. We all have goals. We've said before on this House floor, you know what, there's a big difference between an idea and a good idea. Representative Mecklen, this amendment is a good idea. Its inclusion in this bigger bill is a bad idea. Folks, do the right thing. The relationship between a general contractor and subcontractors is a perilous dance, folks. It's in, it's out, you've got bad actors once in a great while, but we're being told, oh, this is a rampant problem. Oh, this and that, my goodness, come on. A vast majority of the homes that we live in, in our districts, are built with the relationships that we're attacking today. A general contractor, a subcontractor, making the project affordable as they can with the regulatory environment that we present them with.
and it's working, folks. We're going to be told, oh, this is just a horrible thing. Folks, you know, come on. Let's get, you know what? If, if you were to ask anyone, both Democrats and, and, and Republicans, and say, you know what? If I were to present you a case, do you think we need more state involvement in every single aspect, at every single stage of your construction project? And I can promise you, if you're a city worker working for a city someplace and they're looking at permits for a wastewater treatment plant or a sewer plant or a park or the construction of darn near anything and they're going to say, boy, oh boy, you know, I understand why they'd pass some of this stuff, but man alive, could they take a break for a minute? And here we set. Representative Macklin, I really do want to thank you. Once again, we're having amendments to save the Democrats from themselves. And I would wish, I would hope that they would vote. I, I don't know if you asked for a roll call or not. I'm not sure. That's not my business. That's your amendment. But at what point, what point, it seems like they list, you know, we're listening to someone, but it's not anyone that I know. It's not the folks that are trying to build affordable homes. That's who we're not listening to. You know, but how does the state fix it? We're going to increase regulation. We're going to increase the cost so that we can fully fund lawyers in the state of Minnesota on the backs of people that want to build, have an affordable home. But in, Democrats want to fix it by what? Let's have a bunch of state money that subsidizes the cost. So rather than actually fix the problems, it's like a plumber that says, you know what we're going to do? The state of Minnesota, you've got a leaky, a leaky pipe in your house. And instead of actually getting after the leaky pipe, we're going to fully fund in this bill a 55-gallon bucket that goes in your basement that will collect the water. That's how the state's going to fix it. Rather than actually get after the things that are driving up the cost of construction from a regulatory, from a cost perspective, from a trucking perspective, and now we're going to go after and make sure that we can fully fund the lawyers that are going to be probably buying lake places and then hiring these projects so that they have a general contractor that's going to come. I mean, even the lawyers are going to have to spend more when they buy their lake places with all the extra money that you're going to give them through this bill. Do you really want to do that? Representative Mecklen, thank you again for standing up for families, single mothers, small business owners who are just trying to get by a little cheaper and have, rather than have the state take a larger role in our life. Vote green on the amendment, folks. Get rid of, just set aside the rhetoric that this is some uh, arduous thing, uh, that this is happening in everyday life and all these nasty folks, folks, make a phone call. Call the home builder. Call the carpenter. Call the sheetrock guy. Call the framer in your district and say, boy, is this a really problem? No, it's not a problem. But you know what it's going to do? Drive the cost up. Drive it up. $3,900, folks. Your green energy dream bill, $3,900 on average. What is this going to cost? A couple hundred bucks here, a couple hundred bucks there. Well, you know what? Hey, let's just have a grant program to folks so that they can you know, ease that cost of that 200 bucks that the lawyer fees are going to cost for their more expensive home. Vote oh, no. The member from Wright, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Mecklin, for bringing this uh, amendment forward. And uh, Representative Swazinski, uh, thank you for some of your comments. I just want to uh, make up some uh, more poignant points. Uh, Representative Feist said that it's 25% uh, bad actors. 
Uh, I don't know where you got that number, Representative uh, Feist, but according to Representative uh, Mahoney, who I really enjoyed working with, uh, he was here, sat at opposite of me, a good Irishman, it's kinda, I guess uh, that's why I liked him. He was a labor guy as well. He said in committee uh, just recently, maybe it was last year, that already very few are bad actors when it comes to this contractors, general contractors not paying. His number was almost, I think it was 99, 98.5, 99.1%. What was it? 99.9%, Representative Mahoney said, as far as those not paying their subcontractors. So that's the number we need to look at. It's not rampant happening. It's another pro solution looking for a problem. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the way to say it. And I was speaking to some of my uh, constructor friends in the Delano area, and uh, they're up a set of this bill. Uh, so it certainly was Mech uh, Representative Mecklen. He and I sit on the Labor Community Committee, and he's in the contracting business, and very upset. Uh, so if this passes, it certainly will, as Representative Swazinski said, will increase the cost on many, many construction projects. Period. End of story. Did you know uh, that uh, Mr. Wonderful Kevin O'Leary was just speaking recently in uh, Fargo and why he said they won't invest in Minnesota? Because of their bad policies. He said that's un uninvestable was his word. So at least we have an amendment right now that will take away part of your bad policy in your bill, Representative Nelson, that will encourage businesses to stay in Minnesota and to build in Minnesota. More mandates, more expensive, more fees, more fines, more regulations will only continue to hurt Minnesota. And if you don't believe me, because I certainly don't know it all, believe Mr. Wonderful, who's going to invest $45 million in Moorhead, or Fargo, not Moorhead. Have you heard his talk just recently? Have you heard of it? You raise your hand if you haven't. He said that Minnesota, because of its bad policies, because of its over-regulated, over-mandated, over-fees, over-fines, over-taxed, it's just not investable. That's sad. Madam Speaker, isn't that just it's sad to hear that Moorhead now is not where people want to live? Nothing against Moorhead. I like Moorhead. But Fargo is the place to invest. Did you hear that, Representative Swazinski? Microsoft has one of the largest plants they're building there in Fargo. Did you know that? Oh, Jim Joy, Representative Joy. Are you from that area? Well, Representative uh, Joy, would he yield for a question, please? He will yield, Representative McDonald. Representative Joy, uh, you just heard me speak fondly of uh, the community right across the street from you. Right, uh, just like in the yard, I think you could step like this, and all of a sudden you're less taxed, less, less regulated, less mandates, and more importantly, you'll probably be more profitable with more liberty and freedoms and economic freedoms. So, Representative Jim Joy, what say you of such regulations and mandates in your beautiful city compared to that of Fargo? Representative Joy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, you're exactly right, Representative McDonald. Um, regulations keeps moving everybody across that bridge, and you're right. I can walk basically across, around this room, and I'm on the other side over in North Dakota. And all the bordering ones are seeing that. As they continue to regulate and put more mandates on, on our side of the bridge, people move across. You know, housing, same thing. You know, we can, I, I have been listening to this, and as we talk about the housing and how we want more affordable housing and everything we're going to do, I don't know if this makes more affordable housing or not. I think this adds more to it. So I don't know how we can continue to say we've got to create bills and do affordable housing, but then we do bills like this to increase the cost. So I don't know how we're going to win on this situation, but yes, Fargo does have more of a place to go to because Moorhead's, or Minnesota's constantly getting hit with regulations. Thank you. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Joy. You know, I just wanted to get up and speak in favor of Representative Mecklen's bill amendment to repeal this portion. Representative Feist, no offense to you. Uh, you're a fine legislator and there's no personalities or uh, uh, motives here, but uh, that particular section of the bill will certainly increase the cost to build in Minnesota. And it'll be yet another nail, or lack of a nail, in a two by four invested here in Minnesota, and it'll just encourage investment in our neighboring town and state of North Dakota. The proof is in the pudding. As I speak, I'm getting my Irish up, just getting upset to think 
that the proof is right there from Mr. Wonderful. Who watches Shark Tank? You ever watch that? I get motivated by it because there's so many wonderful ideas. And they only can come to fruition because of freedom and liberty in America. The more regulation, the more mandates, the more costly, just stifles it. Completely stifles innovation. That's the facts. That's the facts in Moorhead, and that's the fact in Fargo. You can see it plainly, clearly. Well, with that, I encourage you to support Representative Mecklen's amendment to gut that portion of the bill that'll do nothing good for the construction trees, and it will cost, uh, increase the cost of our building. The, the contractors, subcontractors, the con general contractors already had said that. And just one last thing, the general contractors, most of them are small family mom and pop businesses, and yet just another lack of a nail in a two by four. Vote green. The member from Douglas, Representative Franson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. The American dream is under attack right here in this body. Did you know that home ownership itself is one of the keys to building generational wealth? It is an asset and it is something that most people strive to own, their own home. I remember my first home, built, uh, bought it in St. Cloud, Minnesota in 2004, I believe. 206 22nd Avenue North, I think that was the address, this little teeny tiny two bedroom home that's where my first or my second child was born in that home. But it was an exciting, exciting time. Today, interest rates are going up, making it much more difficult for families to get into that reasonably priced home. Along with that, now I'm hearing, or we're all hearing, that on May 1st, the Biden administration has some new rules going into effect. So if you have put down, or if you plan on after May 1st, putting down 15 to 20% on a home, or you have good credit, you will pay more, about $40 a month more for being responsible. The American dream is under attack. I too, much like my colleagues, like Representative McDonald there, I too have been hearing from my local contractors. They are saying that this provision is going to jack the costs of home ownership up. Please take out Article 15. Please take out Article 15. Don't make home ownership any more expensive than it already is. We have a $17.5 billion deficit. Or surplus, sorry. We have a surplus. But we're going to end up in a deficit if we keep spending this money the way we are. Anyway, we have a $17.5 billion surplus. And this body, instead of making sure that families and taxpayers are getting tax cuts, this chamber is making life much more expensive for them. We saw it last week, one of our bills that we passed off the House floor, a 75 cent delivery fee. And that affects everyone, even the poor, because we're all rich. This bill is yet another attack on taxpayers. Members, I urge you to vote in favor of the Meckland Amendment. The member from Traverse, Representative Backer. Madam Speaker, members, I too support the amendment. One thing that's not talked about, Representative McDonald nailed it, um, but one thing that he didn't cover is my district, first of all, is the only district that borders North Dakota and South Dakota. And when you have the border communities like um, Moorhead, Breckenridge, Browns Valley, Wheaton, Canby, 
Pipestone all the way down because if we look at the border going from Canada down to Iowa, we no longer have a larger community on the Minnesota side. So that means when we are able to build, we have to get them from the other side, the other state, because it makes better sense for them to be entrepreneurs from North Dakota, South Dakota. Now with this additional requirement, there will be people who say, no way, I'm not going to even bid a job in Browns Valley, Minnesota or in Wheaton, or in Breckenridge, or anything like that. Um, we did a construction um, two years ago um, on a, uh, at the hardware store, and it took us a long time to find someone to do it. And we had to go to Peaver, South Dakota, which is on the other side of the st state, but I know that person would go, I'm not going to mess around with this. So what we're doing is we're not just affecting homes, we're not just affecting um, businesses, but we're also affecting um, new, um, cities and counties who build because they're not going to come across the state line um, to put up with this mess. So support Mecklen's amendment. Thank you. The member from Isanti, Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, members, Representative Mecklen, thank you for this bill or this amendment. It's very important. Last week we had the housing bill. Over $1 billion was spent over the biennium, most of it uh, being available to nonprofits for rental assistance and rental, building rental units. And there was nothing in that bill to actually reduce the cost of housing. And now we have a bill that's actually going to increase the house, cost of housing. Members, we have a housing stock shortage that is the worst in the country. If the, if the Mecklen bill isn't, amem, amendment isn't adopted, we're going to even make it worse. Please vote green on the Mecklen amendment. The member from Anoka, Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, Representative Feist, I, I wanted to clarify something that you said um, when, when you were uh, discussing this bill with Representative Nash. You, you made a statement that I don't see what the basis is in the bill for it, that a contractor um, a, a, a contractor who in good faith pays a subcontractor and then without their knowledge the subcontractor doesn't pay their employees. Uh, you said that there was a mechanism in this bill that, that the contractor could recoup um, their, uh, that payment back. So Madam Speaker, if Representative Feist will yield. She will yield. Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Feist, I, I can't find anything in the bill that uh, allows, per, creates any mechanism whatsoever for a contractor in that situation to recoup uh, that money back from the subcontractor. Could you point me to where I'm missing that in the bill? Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the question. So in general, that is actually outside of this bill because, again, this is a labor bill. This is not a construction law bill. Um, but there is language that we did add in collaboration with the subcontractors that says, if a contractor has satisfied unpaid wage claims of an employee and incurred fees and costs in doing so, such contractor may then pursue actual and liquidated damages from any subcontractor who has caused the contractor to incur those damages. So I guess it is in our bill. Thank you. Representative Niska. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and Representative Feist, if she will yield again. She will yield. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam Speaker. I don't see that. Where is that in the bill, Representative Feist? Where are you reading from? Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're testing my control F skills on this big document. Um, okay, line 183.16. However, if a contractor has satisfied unpaid wage claims of an employee and incurred fees and costs in doing so, such contractor may then pursue actual and liquidated damages from any subcontractor who caused the contractor to incur those damages. That is line 183.16 to 183.19, and that was added at the specific request of stakeholders in the industry who we worked with very closely to make sure this bill was workable. Thank you. The member from Minoka, Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Feist. That's important that everybody uh, is aware of that in the bill. Thank you. Any further discussion on the A26 amendment? Roll call having been requested, the clerk will take the roll on the bill, on the amendment. Oh, Madam Representative Speaker? Meckland. Um, Representative Bird. Thank you. I'm sorry. I stood up a while ago, but you may not have seen me. I need to let the body know something really important about this amendment. There's no less than five 
amendments here addressing wage theft. A couple have been pulled. The narrative that wage theft isn't happening in the construction trades is dangerous. And I know this because I actively participated three or four times with investigators from the Carpenters Union, Tony, and, Tony Albright, a former representative, and I uh, went over there one day together. Um, I was shown the documentation. I was shared with what you look for on a job site to identify that labor trafficking is happening. I have leafleted outside of bad actors um, construction sites. Let me tell you what wage theft is. It's human trafficking. And there is more human trafficking in the construction trades than there is in the sex trades. So let that sink in. As a flight attendant, I am trained to identify human trafficking. Oftentimes, we're the last line of defense before they're lost forever. But this is a, a very specific kind of trafficking. There are workers stacked on top of each other, 15 to 20 to a hotel room. Those are the conditions they live in. Do you know what they're paid if they're paid at all? They're paid in cocaine. And you can either use the cocaine, or if you actually want to send money back to your families, you go out and sell the cocaine. Or you're paid in prostitutes. And I'm sorry if this is unpleasant on the House floor, but those are the facts. I happen to know them directly from the investigators. The Carpenters Union blew wide open a labor broker in the Viking Stadium. That was in the Star and Tribune. You can look that up if you don't believe me. This is human trafficking. And when that board lights up and there is a green light next to your name because you voted for this or any of the other wage theft amendments, that is a vote for human trafficking. You will take that back to your district. You will have to own up to that in a town Speaker, hall. point of order. Um, uh, I hear many people raising a point of order. Uh, Representative Kosnick. Uh, what matter or business are we on? Representative Kosnick, when you stand to a point of order, you need to cite to something. But Representative Berg well, The point is of order, Madam Speaker, would be she's uh, calling our motives, invoking motives into the... Uh, debate and explaining what our votes mean, uh, but also um, I was just curious what point of order or business we're on. Representative Berg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I actually was, you're right, informing you of what that green vote will mean. Those are the facts. That's what your vote will mean. And I'm telling you this because I serve on the committee, uh, various committees with many of you, and you have great, big, generous hearts. You do not want to vote for human trafficking. I know you don't. So I will sit down so you can stop trying to think of a point of order, but please think about your vote. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Sherburn, Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Representative Feist, you said something early on about this gives the person with the least amount of means a lever to pull. Um, and I remember, recall Mr. Mc, Representative McDonald talked about Representative Mahoney, which you, I don't know if you ever met him prior, but he was a genuine guy. But he made it very clear that 99.9% .9 of all the employers were doing it the right way, only 0.1. He was very proud of getting wage theft passed, number one. But what was the point of, of, of passing wage theft law? We, in that, we also funded new FTEs. So are you suggesting that once again, this new department that was created is not following up and doing their job for these people that they have nowhere else to go? Because it seems to be a re repetitive thing that we keep hearing. We create these departments and they're not actually protecting the people they were intended to protect. Because I am trying to figure out on my end if, if a subcontractor or a subcontractor of a contractor of mine has an employee claim that he did not get paid. Then comes to me, I go to the, the boss and he says, I paid him. How do I know? How do I fight that? How much do I pay a representative Niska in the off season to get myself out of that mess? And, and if I understand, nobody's que questioning sex trafficking, human trafficking, it, wage theft, it's all bad. That was the point of passing the wage theft law. And here we sit once again, it's not enough, more regulation. So we're gonna put more and more screws into the people doing it right 
for the few people that down in the metro, but I guarantee you, there is nobody out where I live taking advantage of their employees. They are our neighbor's kids. They are our brother-in-laws. They are, they're all people. How long do you think I would get reelected if I was screwing the people down there? Thank you, Madam Speaker. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The <coughs> clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schultz moves to amend Senate file number 3035, the unofficial engrossment. The amendment is coded A25. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, my amendment has to do with ergonomics. And for those of you in the room who don't know what ergonomics is, frankly, I didn't know prior to the start of this session, and it's been great to learn about it, but it's been extremely brief. And so uh, this, uh, this amendment specifically changes the, uh, the timeline by which the ergonomic standard found in this bill would be enacted and would be forced upon many of the employers of this state. And so that is what the 825 amendment does. It changes the, the, the standard until to next year rather than November of this year uh, and also provides uh, for our employers to have a little bit of certainty because members, I'm not sure if you know, but it has great, great and grave consequences for many of our employers across this state. Uh, so that is the amendment and, um, and we'll go from there. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. And uh, I've spoken with, after I saw this amendment, I spoke with DLI about this and their intention is to get this up and running and that's, they, they, they believe the date is what they need to be able to get this up and running and start rolling this program out. And so I urge a no vote on the amendment. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm disappointed to hear that, Chair Nelson. Um, uh, would Chair Nelson uh, yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Nelson, uh, was this a, a standalone bill that received a hearing in the House Labor Committee? Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. This was part of the House File 2755, which was the governor's bill. Um, and his and his, and his uh, supplemental bill, and we gave this a thorough hearing in the meeting. I believe there was questioning on that for 45 minutes on this on this portion of the bill alone by Representative Schultz. Representative Schultz, thank you, Madam Speaker and Representative Nelson. You're right, and you know why? Because the voices of Minnesotans were not included at all. That's why we had 45 minutes worth of debate on the omnibus bill, members. Not a standalone bill, not a standalone idea, not something that's agreed upon by the stakeholders across the state, the people of Minnesota, with no input from the public. Zero, zero members, members of this body, zero input was taken from members of the public on provisions included related to ergonomics. And for those of you in the room who are just now learning about ergonomics and what that would mean, the, an ergonomics program, based upon the way that the bill is currently written, would be the standard by November 1st of this very year. And for those of you who weren't in committee, the ergonomics program has been quote unquote studied behind the scenes for a decade by the Department of Labor and Industry, yet no stakeholder input has been taken. So now 
We're in a place where Representative Hansen is, is, is authoring a bill uh, that has literally an enactment date um, that is later this year, and it impacts members, it impacts healthcare facilities, including every single nursing home in this state. It includes warehouse distribution centers and meatpacking sites of over 100 employees. Nobody, zero people in this state provided any input as to what this would look like in state law, how this would be implemented in their business, in their job site, and we're going to shove this down their throats without their input yet this year. There's no reason to be doing this. There's no reason to be doing this. Um, and I, I was, I'm, I'm a little bit shocked uh, today to hear that, um, that this wasn't a friendly amendment to simply push out when this standard would be to July 1st of next year. There might be a lot of good things brought about by this provision, but instead it's going to be shoved down the throats of job creators across this state and negatively impact every single healthcare facility in this state. A new regulation, a new burden. And I'm not saying that this isn't the right policy for the state. Simply that we should take the input of Minnesotans. So I'm disappointed to hear that somehow we need to be pushing forward at this speed. Members, I'm going to withdraw this amendment, but I certainly hope that Chair Hansen and members of the majority will find a way to work on this in conference committee and actually take the input of stakeholders across the state on what an ergonomics program will look like for them. Representative Schultz withdraws the A25 amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Mecklen moves to amend Senate file number 3035. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A14. The member from Sherburne, Representative Mecklen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so this is a scaled down version of the previous, which would simply strip out sub, uh, subdivision two. Um, you know, the more I look at this and the more we hear from back and forth, I mean, apparently everybody assumes that all contractors are just flush with cash and no matter the size of them. Um, I, 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 like I said, I don't, I don't know how you remedy if, if it gets into a he said, she said thing and we already have the wage theft laws. So, I don't know, this feels an awful lot like Al Capone back in the day, do it our way or we're going to make, make you pay for it, but I do request a, a roll call, please, Madam Chair. Representative Mecklen requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Discussion to the amendment. The member from Ramsey, Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I rise to speak against this amendment. Um, it would delete the, the heart of this bill, which is a shifting of liability to the general contractor who is in the most, um, has the most ability to control wage theft on their project. Um, they are already liable for OSHA and other work for, workplace safety, so this is not an unheard of legal mechanism. Um, I would like to um, speak to a few things that have been said in the discussion of this bill. Um, um, first, I have it on good authority that Representative Mahoney apparently made up that statistic um, of 99.9% .9 of uh, general contractors uh, are, are good actors. But I also would like to clarify, um, the statistic I said was that nearly 25% of workers are subjected to wage theft. So I wasn't saying that 25% of general contractors are committing wage theft. Um, and I do think that is important because, as I've said, there are a number a majority of general contractors who are out there trying to do the right thing and they are competing against general contractors who are stealing wages um, and are, are doing, are outbidding them because of that wage theft and those unethical business practices. Um, I also want to emphasize that wage theft is real. Um, Representative Swazinski said it's not anyone that he knows, and, and that is true. Um, but I saw in the hearings on this bill, we had workers come 
to the Capitol and share their stories at great length. And then we had people come up to testify who said that wage theft wasn't happening after hearing those stories. So clearly the workers in the scenario are not being heard. They are not empowered to speak up. And that is the problem with the 2019 wage theft law is that not enough workers are feeling empowered um, or able to assert themselves. And that is why um, that 2019 law needs to be updated and enhanced through the creation of the civil liability. Um, we talked a bit about exceptions and I'd like to clarify that the reason we have exceptions in this bill is that there are scenarios where wage theft is less of a prevalent issue. Um, those are scenarios where there are collective bargaining agreements, also where there are prevailing wage law protections in place, um, and for small projects. And we talked a lot about small business owners and small construction um, businesses, and those are in fact exempt from this bill. Um, I believe it was Representative Mecklen asked, like, where do we come up with 10 houses? Um, that was where. We wanted small projects to be exempt um, so that, you know, if I, a homeowner, have a home improvement project that I'm not going to have this complicated bill apply to me. Um, and the same is true for small contractors. Um, uh, Representative Franson said that the American dream is under attack, and I agree. Um, most of the workers that we're talking about are immigrants. They have come to this country, they are working, um, doing the jobs that they've been hired to do, um, and they are not being paid, or they are not safe, or when they injure themselves, they are not taken care of by their employer. Oftentimes, they don't know who their employer is, um, or they're relying on that employer for housing. Um, they are truly vulnerable, and these are the people who have come here for a better life. They are contributing to our housing market, to our economy, and uh, the American dream is under attack unless we do something about wage theft. Um, and lastly, um, I just wanted to say that the idea that we would save housing costs by stealing money from vulnerable workers is, is just not, it does not sit well with me. Um, the idea that we should save money on the backs of unpaid underpaid and unsafe workers is, to quote Representative New Brindley, bonkers. So I oppose this amendment. Thank you. Further discussion on the Meckland Amendment. Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, like you, I, I actually, I, you know, I, I'm not denying wage theft exists. I think you should go actually punish those that are committing it, not everybody else who's doing everything right. Because I will have to hire people to be compliant with this, and it'll probably be two. To, to audit everybody else's book work, which I think will be challenged in, in courts, and I don't think it's ever going to hold up, but please vote green. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. <coughs> Representative Long. Madam Speaker, I move a recess to the call of the Speaker until approximately 7 p.m. Representative Long moves a recess to the call of the Chair until 7 p.m. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. No! The motion prevails. The House stands in recess until 7 o'clock p.m.
House will come to order. <coughs> There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <coughs> Niska moves to amend Senate file number 3035. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A1. The member from Anoka, Representative Niska, to your amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. The A1 amendment is an amendment to, to uh, just align this bill. Uh, this is specifically targeted at, uh, at the section uh, that we were discussing uh, before the break about, um, about construction contractors. And this uh, would, would uh, change the, the way liability is, is, is apportioned in this case to make it more consistent with some of the other states that have done this. And in particular, it would allow, um, it would it, it clarify the, the indemnification language and allow a general contractor in their contract with a subcontractor to make sure that the subcontractor has to indemnify and defend them against uh, certain uh, claims and as well as would allow the general contractor to be able to recoup from the, the, the subcontractor such, uh, attorney's fees or costs of actually going Going after them, um, I appreciate that the bill does go a little bit, a, a little ways, as as we discussed with uh, Representative Feist, towards providing for um, s some mechanism that the contractor could go after uh, for liability if the if. In the unicorn scenario, I suppose, in which a subcontractor uh, just is, is still uh, not judgment-proof or still in business but isn't uh, paying their wages, then the general contractor would still have some ability to do it, but it doesn't go as well as the A1 amendment, which would allow for a contractual provision by the general contractor to that subcontractor to require them to indemnify them, to require them to defend uh, them in the litigation. So you only have to have one set of defense lawyers in that litigation, and also to allow the general contractor to be able to include in that an attorney's fees provision, just like we often uh, create attorney's fees provisions in our litigation um, in our private rights of action in this chamber. So this would uh, do a better job of protecting, again, we're talking about good general General contractors, the general contractors who have paid fully to the to the subcontractor, and it's just a subcontractor that you know does something bad, engages in wage theft. This is to some additional protection for those good general contractors in this situation. So if we're going to do this, um, again, I think it's it's bad public policy to do this this way. But if we're going to do it, I think we need to really do a little bit more to protect those good general contractors. So that's why I'm offering the A1 amendment. Thank you. The member from Ramsey, Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the suggested language. Um, I do feel like the language that we discussed earlier does um, provide the necess necessary protection for the general contractor to be able to assert their rights and recoup any um, payments that they've made to an unpaid worker. Um, in addition, the language that you've proposed um, brings into the equation questions of fault and causation, and that creates additional burdens of proof and additional complexity that would make it more difficult for workers to actually get paid. Um, and the per the purpose of the way this bill is designed is to make it easy for workers to get paid. Um, in addition, in a lot of instances, as, as I've mentioned earlier, um, the general contractors will have holdback provisions in their contracts, and so they will have funds that they are owing um, to the subcontractor that they can then just take those funds out of, so they wouldn't even be out the cost of making sure that those unpaid workers are paid the wages that were stolen from them. Um, and for those reasons, I would oppose this amendment. Thank you. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, a, couple of, a couple of points. I want to point uh, members, uh, when Representative Feist talks about a holdback provision, I want to point members to the language that her bill adds um, in subdivision five that says that nothing in this section shall alter the contractor's obligation to pay a subcontractor as set forth in section 337. 10, except as, except as expressly permitted by this section, there's no reference in uh, Section 337.10 to allow for a holdback provision of the type of which Representative Feist is talking about. And, uh, and when Representative Feist uh, talks about creating some additional uh, burdens on the, on the defendant, indemnity among co-defendants is absolutely not at all uh, something that places a burden on a plaintiff, such as a... a, 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 a worker whose wages were stolen by a bad subcontractor. It just means that in that lawsuit, where under Representative Feist's bill, the, con the general contractor and the subcontractor are both joint and severally liable. So having an indemnity provision just requires there to be one set of lawyers, because the general contractor, under my amendment, would be able to uh, have an agreement with the subcontractor 
<clears throat> that they have to indemnify and defend them in that situation. So you would be able to have one set of lawyers for the defendants, one uh, against one set of lawyers for the plaintiffs. It actually would simplify uh, the bill, but more importantly, it provides very, very important, necessary uh, protections for, again, the law-abiding, good general contractors who have paid already. These general contractors have paid already, and the bill that we're talking about is potentially exposing them to double payment, it's exposing them to litigation costs to defend it, and it's not allowing them to then, when they do have to sue the, the subcontractor, be able to require that subcontractor to pay their attorney's fees. Over and over again, this body passes things that recognize the need to allow somebody, when they have to sue in order to um, recover, that we recognize that sometimes we need to provide for them attorney's fees. I can think of no better uh, situation in which we should do that than a, a general contractor who has already paid for the labor and then a subcontractor just chooses not to pay their wages and so then the, the general contractor is potentially on the hook for double indemnity. So I think it's very, very important that we do put this co uh, contractual indemnity provision in to really protect those good general contractors, the ones who aren't uh, engaging in wage theft, to be able to do that. And Madam Speaker, I request a roll call. Representative Niska requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. The member from Washington, Representative Anderson. Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, I just want to um, talk about the holdback provision that the um, author is discussing. There is, you can, there can be a holdback provision within a contract, but, but the, the contract has to be closed out, and it happens quick, be in a, in a construction contract. Um, and it's because you need to get lien waivers from your subs in order for the general to also give lien waivers to, uh, lien waivers to uh, the person that actually hired the general contractor. So you're talking about a very short time frame. You can't just hold back dollars, um, you know, like that. It doesn't work that way. So it, it doesn't work like that. So thank you. Any further discussion on the NISCA amendment? The member from Sherburn, Representative Mecklen. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Madam Speaker. Um, Representative Feist, actually, we don't do a lot. I mean, some parts, of some, there's some areas, especially bigger money, we do do holdbacks, but the vast majority of it is paid usually the day of. Um, in fact, roofers demand it. They get paid everything when the, the minute they walk off that job. There is no billing time, there is no holdback. And to what Representative Niska said, there is going to be all this money floating around between attorneys. And you know, it's interesting. In this bill, which we'll be discussing on this next amendment, you talk about somebody who does just 10 properties, that's a pretty small builder. And you seem like you're saying you're concerned about the guy, the little guy who doesn't have much, you can't afford to pay the attorneys of the world. Where do you think these little builders get it from? We don't operate on very big margins, despite maybe the popular belief, but uh, I, I would uh, vote green. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Macklin moves to amend Senate file number 3035. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A28. Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, yeah, so this, this is basically what I was just talking about. That in the bill, I believe it's on 182.19, I believe. I think, let me just get there. Um, correct, 182, 182, 182, 182.19. You have um, of more than 10 one or two family owner occupied dwellings. How do we derive at that number 10? I'm not sure who could answer that question, but that's my question. I'm assuming it's Representative Feist. If she will yield to a question. She will yield. Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, thank you, Representative Mecklen, for the question. Um, the number 10 was just settled upon as small enough projects where we believed that wage theft was less prevalent. Um, when you get to um, construction projects of over 10, um, the sense was that in that context, wage theft is just as much of a problem as larger construction projects. 
Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Do you have any data to show that? I mean, I, I, 20 houses a year is a pretty, pretty small, very small builder if you're in the building thing. I would just be interested to know if there's anything, if you'll yield to another question. She will yield. Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the question. Um, some reporting has shown that waste theft occurs in over 50% of multifamily construction projects. So it is a very prevalent issue when you get to larger projects, and that is why we settled on 10 as being small enough um, where, where we felt that wage theft was less of an issue. Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So then why did you include one or two family uh, owner-occupied dwellings since a one would be a single-family home if she'll yield to another question, Madam Speaker? She will yield. Representative Feist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, a two-family dwelling that is constructed in isolation would still be a small construction project. Representative Meckland. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. So the point of this amendment is to raise it to 50 um, because it's still considered a very, very small um, construction operator, builder. And I would like to ask for a roll call. Representative Mecklen requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <coughs> Macklin moves to amend Senate file number 3035, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A27. Representative Meckland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I'm guessing since you put the amendments in this order and you didn't take the 50, you're certainly not going to take the 100. But nevertheless, I will roll call this one as well, Madam Speaker. Representative Mecklen requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Mecklen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Same arguments, just a bigger number, if you would. Please vote green. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Schultz moves to amend Senate file number 3035, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A-10. Member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. This has to deal with the earlier conversation that we had regarding registered apprenticeship programs in Minnesota. There is concern in our state and in our community that there are certain registered apprenticeship programs uh, that, uh, I should say, apprenticeship programs that have been introduced um, in our state and brought to the Department of Labor and Industry. And unfortunately, there have been instances where, despite the fact that they have operated for a year in our state and met the standards, hit the safety um, uh, issues and and concerns that, that, that those particular programs have not been registered and have not been certified. So we are literally changing one word um, from the 2014 uh, state law uh, on, it's on, on the amendment, if you're tracking with us here, we're 1.10 where we're switching may to shall be approved. And that is my amendment, Madam Speaker. The member from Traverse, Representative Backer. Seeing no discussion, all those, the member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, members, I, I urge of no vote on this. According to the Department of Labor and Industry, number one, this is adding another section to the bill that's not in the bill, but according to the Department of Labor and Industry, this would put us out of compliance with federal um, regulations, federal conformity, and just so you know, other there are non-union companies out there that have apprenticeship programs. In fact, the ABC, which is the Association of Building Contractors, has an apprenticeship program. So they can be approved, and as was talked about earlier, if everything's done right, it can be done in two to three weeks. 
Discussion, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, Representative Nelson, I do appreciate that you just mentioned that there was no uh, further discussion on this earlier in session. But let me just say this, this actually is directly dealt with um, in the statute found in this bill, which is why it's relevant, which I'm sure is why you didn't ra arise to a point of order on, on this, is because it's directly uh, before us. This is the way that we make this change to make sure that those in this state union, non-union, and anyone else under the sun who seeks to bring forward a registered apprenticeship program in Minnesota, that they are able to be granted that registered and certified status based upon the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, uh, to you, Representative Nelson, I'll just, I'll just say this quickly. Um, in regards to this discussion, we're dealing with state policy right now. The federal government has their own standards over registered apprenticeship programs, and, and frankly, there are many um, uh, programs who probably exist here in Minnesota that were federally registered, and so we're working on specifically our state policy, uh, something that you voted for uh, back in 2014, um, and I'm sure you're rather proud of it. And frankly, you know, again, like I have said earlier, I support registered apprenticeship programs. So let's work with the people who want to do good work in our state and let's help bring about more registered apprenticeship programs that keep people safe, that properly train the people who are in our workforce. That's what this amendment is about. And so at this time, Madam Speaker, I would ask for a roll call. Representative Schultz requests a roll call. Same 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I uh, appreciate that. And so members, simply vote green on this. Uh, this is a great way for us to enhance those abilities for workers across this state to move through a registered apprenticeship pro program, to enhance safety guidelines across this state, to work with all of those in industry across this state to make sure we have a well-qualified and safe workforce. That's what this, this amendment is about. Let's vote green on this amendment. Thanks, Madam Speaker. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close. The clerk will close the roll. There being wow. 60 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Schultz moves to amend Senate File 3035, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A-16. Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and, and members. Uh one of the, this, this next amendment, the A-16, has to do with the renovation um, and supposed addition to the state office building. And in particular, uh, for those of you who have been uh, maybe tracking this a little bit more closely over the last few weeks, it's incredibly important, incredibly important members that we work with the community, work with the people here in St. Paul, and make sure that their voice is heard. And so this amendment requires the Planning Council uh, to provide approval before any construction can take place on the State Office Building. That, that is my amendment, Madam Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Cleborn. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And um, as my colleague well knows, this is within the jurisdiction of the CAP Board. And the task force which is being presented in this legislation does provide uh, for four members of the St. Paul community to uh, participate with the appointment of the mayor. But members, I would encourage us to go ahead and vote green on this amendment. It's important. Thank you. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate that. And thank you, Representative Cleavorn, for agreeing with me and with uh, the people who live here that it's important to take the input of uh, the people who live here in St. Paul, their community, the place that they live year-round, despite the fact that legislators are only here for a portion of the year, and the importance that it is that we see that they have a vote on whether or not the state office building should see reconstruction, renovation, and addition. And so uh, with that, uh, I urge support of this amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The motion prevails, the amendment is adopted. 
There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> NISCA moves to amend Senate file number 3035, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A-17. The member from Anoka, Representative NISCA. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. The, the, uh, this bill is, uh, again, filled with more, more and more mandates, crushing businesses, trying to drive them out uh, of Minnesota, and it's backed by lit litigation traps and increased fines. The A-17 amendment is dealing with the same issue, the same language that was in the standalone Amazon bill, and so for the same reasons as I offered the amendment on the Amazon bill, I'm offering the A-17 amendment, and I ask for your support. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of the NISCA amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Uh, NISCA moves to amend Senate file number 3035. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A21. The member from Anoka, Representative NISCA. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, again, this is de dealing with the fact that we are over and over in this bill. It's chock full of mandates, crushing businesses, filling, uh, uh, and, and imposing, litiga creating litigation traps, creating increased fines. Uh, there's no demonstrated need for any of these. Uh, it just increases the costs of hiring workers and creating new jobs. Section 4, for example, um, that this is deleting creates a new civil action that covers just simple notice violations. Uh, so if someone doesn't give exactly the right kind of notice, now we are creating an opportunity for some uh, drive-by litigation uh, situation, like the, the, the infamous Paul Hansmeier uh, disability situation, uh, in which, and then they'll be able to get attorney's fees and, uh, and costs. Um, in Section 9, which this also strikes, we're increasing statutory damages. That's just another situation that's going to uh, increase litigation increase the incentive that abusive litigation is going to happen um, and then we're increasing fines over and over again again this is not necessary if we're going to go down this road of creating these mandates we need to very carefully calibrate the remedies and carefully calibrate the uh, litigation uh, uh, the causes of action not just crush businesses with more threatened litigation with more fines and more costs of, of lawyers and the a21 amendment is doing that so I'm asking for your support Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. McDonald moves to amend Senate file number 3035. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A20. The member from Wright, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, my amendment uh, is uh, page 152 of the bill, if you're following along. Section 15, or no, I'm sorry, no, we're, section 152. Uh, anyway, so section 15. Uh, basically what it does is it takes the fines that you have tr uh, doubled in this bill and bring them, bring them down to the current fine for any mistake made by a job creator or an employer. Currently, the fine in Minnesota uh, for Dolly is, uh, for an employer is $7,000, but your bill, Representative Nelson, raises it to $15,625, uh, more than doubles the fine. And uh, although I'll give you some credit uh, where credit is due, in the bill it does say that they may fine this uh, particularly fine, but uh, it is... Uh, very expensive. In a time where our businesses and employers are recovering from uh, a very tough three years, shutdowns by Governor Walls, employees, uh, a lack of job uh, of employees to find for work, uh, and a time that they're finally recovering, and I'll recover with my speech as well, uh, this fine is onerous, it's way too high, and it doesn't give the job creators an opportunity to watch the laws. The law is here for uh, wage theft and other um, uh, employers' uh, laws in the state are changing at such a rapid pace that it will be difficult for our uh, job creators to keep up with the laws that you're passing so quickly. The wage theft law that we passed two years ago was the strongest wage theft law in the nation. And we haven't even given it an opportunity for that to take root. Laws upon laws upon laws. And we pretty much forget what we did two years ago with the last session and don't even allow that laws, those laws that we passed, to take root. Instead, we throw more money at it, more regulation, more mandates, or more tests, more pilot projects. I've seen that galore here down here. 
So have a little empathy for the job creators who are trying to keep up with the crazy pace in which we do business down here, Madam Speaker, and give them a break. My amendment does not re uh, reduce the current fines on the, uh, on the state statutes right now. It just merely will not allow you to double the fines for a, a, a clerical error or mistake by our employers. So give them a break. Let's bring it back to current law. Let's not tri double, more than double, the fine for our job creators. I hope you'll agree with me, Madam Speaker, and the rest of you would uh, support my amendment and vote green. The member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, uh, you know, this is another uh, mandate heavy bill that will actually do more harm to create economic activity and job growth in our state uh, than the bill does to promote it. Um, and I'm wondering if Representative Nelson would yield for a question. He will yield, Representative Kosnick. Uh, Representative Nelson, I'm looking at uh, section 11 on line 151.20. Am I reading that right? Uh, that you're changing the fee to be $156,259, and then in section 12, it's 15,625. Is that a mistake, $156,000? Is that the correct amount that you intend to raise in this bill? Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and, and members. This is what I spoke about when I introduced my part of the bill. This is bringing us in compliance with federal OSHA. If we do not cut it, get in compliance with federal OSHA, federal OSHA will pull the money that they give us that funds our min OSHA, and min OSHA will go away, and we will be subject to these fines, and we won't have the flexibility that min OSHA has. So that's what we're doing in this section of the bill. By redoing this, we're, we're putting us out of compliance with federal OSHA, and again, we risk losing min OSHA because of that. So that's why the, that's why the increase of the fines are there, is to put us in compliance with the federal OSHA program. Representative Kosnick. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, I just have a hard time understanding that uh, you could do a, you could incur a fine of over a hundred thousand dollars, but this one's a hundred and fifty-six thousand two hundred and fifty-nine. Probably should have just rounded up to the two sixty, but um, that's amazing. Uh, in section twelve, you can be fined up to fifteen thousand dollars. Section thirteen, fifteen thousand again. Uh, Representative McDonald, thank you for doing this because uh, bringing this amendment forward. Uh, I think, you know, Main Street businesses are trying hard to not only just survive and avoid bankruptcy, but Main Street businesses are having a hard time finding labor and providing even better benefits for their own employees. This one-size-fits-all approach is just really hurting Main Street businesses in each of our communities, and to have a, a fines that are already established in law, but to double is just absurd. So, Representative McDonald, thank you for bringing the, the amendment forward, and I would encourage members' support. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. New Brindley moves to amend Senate file number 3035. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A24. The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to request a roll call on Representative the New Brindley requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, as I think everyone knows, I am the Republic. Um, Representative New Brindley, we don't allow props on the House floor. Oh, I, I didn't put that there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you to whoever did. I have no idea who delivered this to my desk, but a honey badger don't care. Um, uh, Representative New Brindley. So, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so, I think as most members of the chamber know, I am the Republican lead on the Human Services Committee. And I, it is no surprise or secret to anyone that we are extraordinarily disappointed with the lack of funding for our nursing homes. Uh, I, I keep telling folks that we are not, we don't have a looming crisis for our nursing homes. We are in the middle of a crisis for our nursing homes. Uh, we've had 15 nursing homes close. We had one, another one close uh, about a month ago, and there's another one closing right now. 
It is an active, immediate crisis that we are facing in our nursing homes. So the A24 amendment, I mean, literally, folks, I mean, it's so sad that we are trying to nickel and dime and find any little bit of money that we can that should be directed to our nursing homes. So the A24 amendment, we managed to find about a little over $6 million that we should be able to put into our nursing home visa, nursing homes via the nursing home labor stabilization grants. These grants provide um, additional resources for recruitment and retention grants to nursing homes across the state, and I would ask for a green vote. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, this is stealing the money from the work, from the wage theft enforcement part of the bill, and so I urge a no vote. Further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take, Representative New Brindley. You want to go last? Uh, Representative Franson would also like to speak. The member from Douglas, Representative Franson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, recently, it was April 22nd, 2023, so just a couple days ago, the Star Tribune editorial board wrote a scathing piece called um, More Help Vital for, Mer uh, for Minnesota's Nursing Homes. And in it... There is a, a little paragraph in here that basically says, hey, legislature, fund the nursing homes. They need funding now. Um, these facilities, it says, are now facing an existential threat from financial headwinds, and Minnesota lawmakers need to take heed and act swiftly. Specifically, a robust short-term aid package this session should be a priority to help these facilities weather post-pandemic staffing challenges and inflation. They need help. That's what we're trying to do. I just heard, I just heard the member over there say we were stealing money. Well, guess what? Nursing homes right now are facing a crisis of closures. This is terrible, awful, what is happening. We may have grandmas and grandpas displaced and homeless because there's nowhere for them to go. So members, we should be supporting the A23 amendment by Representative Ann New Brindley and the A24. Are we on the 24? Yes, the 24. We need to make seniors a priority. So vote for the A23 amendment. And Representative Ann New Brindley, thank you for introducing this legislation. We are not stealing any money. First off, it's the taxpayer's money. So technically, I guess the legislature is stealing the taxpayer dollars. However, Placing this to benefit our long-term care in our nursing homes, that is the priority we need to be thinking about. Not this wage theft nonsense that we keep hearing about. Thank you. The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I would just, I would like to address this idea that we are stealing from wage theft. Frankly, the majority has given more money to wage theft than they have to our nursing homes. And that's a pittance at just over $4 million. They gave $4 million to wage theft, but they could only find $3.9 million for our critical access nursing homes, and only for critical access. But guess what? Those are not the only nursing homes that are closing. We have nursing homes closing their doors across the state. But we've given more money to wage theft than we have to our nursing homes. And not to mention that it was just the last budget. We already, we already gave seven new employees to deal with wage theft in the state of Minnesota. So I don't know what kind of massive incompetence is happening in the Walls administration that they can't handle wage theft. And we need to give more money to deal with that than we do 
to our nursing homes, to our senior citizens in, our, in, the, in their nursing homes. It's really gross, folks. This is easy. We managed to cobble together in this amendment $6 million. Surely we can give $6 million here to our nursing homes. Vote green. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. New Brindley moves to amend Senate file number 3035. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A23. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, sadly, this amendment, we managed to just find a million dollars. However, it's a million dollars much better spent. In the underlying language, we've got this Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board, which frankly is silliness. We can tell you what the problem is in our nursing homes, and it's that they don't have enough money. So rather than spending a million dollars for a, for a workforce standards board to tell us that nursing homes need more money, how about we take that million dollars and give it to our nursing homes? It's a much better use of those funds. Again, it's a million dollars, but at this point, with the $3.9 million pittance that our nursing homes have been given, I'll take a million dollars if I can get it. Please vote yes. Seeing no discussion, the member from St. Louis, Representative Zaleznikar. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Brindley. I think the underlying thing is you know, this session, I'm starting to think I, somebody needs to have a nonprofit to ask money for for nursing homes. And that's how we would best get it funded this, this session because we've done child care stabilization grants. Uh, we've got nonprofit nursing homes and for profit nursing homes. We have rate equalization, which I'll give you an education class, means that private owned nursing homes can't increase the rate. They have to take the same rate as the medical assistance rate. So we set that to here. We meaning myself and all of you because now I'm here. So the reality is nursing homes have no way to stabilize. We've done child care stabilization and now we're gonna have a new workforce board and we're gonna have ombudsmen, more ombudsmen. We are fixated on seeing how many people can tell us the problem. But we have two ears, each one of us, to hear what the problem is. We are giving mandates, and we are, we are not giving money. It's pretty simple. And if you don't want to hear that, that's one thing, but that's the fact. So I'm thinking that I'm going to advise the nursing homes to submit nonprofits, because they're going to have a better chance of funding their nursing homes for the next five years. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Agbaje. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I just want to quickly say that the Nursing Home Standards Board is really meant to support and protect the workers. It is a way for us to standardize across this industry that needs a lot of support, ensuring that the compensation that comes to the nursing homes, which we know they get a millions of dollars, um, is done in a way that both, that all three, the regulators, the employers, and the employees have a voice here. Um, so I would just encourage members to vote no on this amendment. Um, we are figuring it out, and we are figuring out ways to um, address our nursing home funding and their shortages as well. Thank you. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am dying to see the results of working on nursing home funding because I, again, I'm the lead on the committee, been, been screaming at the top of my lungs this entire session. I have yet to see it. So I hope, I hope that that is true. Before we go on, Madam Speaker, I'd like to request a roll call. Representative on this. New Brindley requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would just reiterate this is to protect the workers. You know what the workers want? Wages. They want more money. That's what the workers want. That's what the workers need. Republicans want to give it to them. Let's vote green. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. New Brindley moves to amend Senate File 3035. The unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A22. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm going to assume that the last two amendments were voted no because folks were waiting to actually fund nursing homes at a slightly more reasonable number. Now, it's not what our nursing homes need, but it will at least help. Um, and so this final, this final amendment will give a little bit more money to our nursing homes. And, you know, interestingly, this provision in the bill didn't show up until uh, we saw an omnibus bill. It's not something that was ever heard. It was a governor's proposal. And frankly, there's money in this for five different sectors. And so we're just gonna cut to the chase and not water down all of this money. And we're gonna put this money where it actually needs to be spent. And that's caring for our senior citizens in nursing homes. And I would ask for a green vote. Discussion. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative New Brinley, for fighting so hard for our nursing homes. I've been listening to the debate for quite a while and was reflecting on a meeting I had in my district a week ago with um, a facility that's a nursing home and an assisted living place. And I'm just um, scrolling through my notes here, but what, what they told me in that meeting, because the, the one in my facility is in a crisis, but this is how bad is it, it is out there, members, in case you haven't heard. The, the facility in my district was called by another facility where they just have a nursing home. They don't have a combo nursing home and assisted living um, facility. And a nursing home offered to just give the nursing home in my district all of their property, all of their equipment, their whole operation if they would just run it to, say, to try to keep it open because their residents are going to be displaced and they have nowhere for these people to go and they are desperate. So that is the level of crisis we're at, that one nursing home is calling another saying, we will just give you everything if you can just make this work because our patients have nowhere to go. So members, we need to invest in our nursing homes. And the other thing that I, I was really surprised to hear is they told me that 15 nursing homes have closed in Minnesota in the last year and that the number of beds that have been closed due to short staffing across all nursing homes in the state is the equivalent of 50 average size nursing homes. So not only are individual nursing homes closing 15 in the last year, but because of short staffing, the number of beds closed statewide is the equivalent of 50 average size nursing homes. Members, we are in a crisis and we need to provide the funding so that these facilities can stay open and so that our, our seniors can get the care that they deserve. So I appreciate your hard work on this issue, Representative New Bridley and I urge a green vote. The member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker uh, and members. Thank you, Representative New Brindley. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative New Brindley, for bringing this forward. Uh, it is really troubling. I know uh, for those of us that have nursing homes in our district uh, that have been hearing from those facilities, they are in a crisis situation, as Representative Robinson just, Ro Robbins just said. And, and, you know, it's kind of shocking with Democrats in complete control of state government. Uh, they have a $17.5 billion surplus, which is actually 19. Um, and they're raising taxes another nine and a half billion dollars. So they've got $27 billion to deal, to work with. And nursing homes are getting less than $4 million in their, uh, in, in their budget targets. I mean, with nursing, nursing homes closing across the state. And I actually came across something um, that was sent out to nursing homes just recently. It's a little workshop 
that nursing homes can participate in if they, if they choose to. And it's put on by MDH and DHS. And they are, uh, it was actually rescheduled. It was supposed to be on April 17th. But I've got the invitation here that was sent out to nursing homes. Do you want to know what it's on? And members, if you're not paying attention right now, this would be a really good time to pay attention. The workshop is on topics including receiverships, closureships, excuse me, receiverships, closures, and role of governing boards in that process. So MDH and DHS are leading nursing homes through workshops on how to properly close your nursing home. If that's not a crisis situation, I don't know what is. And the fact that they're holding this workshop to make sure that nursing homes that are closing are going through it properly. And we're sitting here on $27 billion and not intervening? For the most vulnerable citizens amongst us, we can't step in and give them any more than $4 million. $4 million in a lot of cases probably wouldn't keep a single nursing home open. And right now, MDH and DHS are holding workshops to help nursing homes close. I actually am going to put my name on this, make a copy of it, and pass it around so you can see it. I think we had a wake-up call last week on the House floor. This should be another one. I mean, these are state agencies holding workshops to help nursing homes close. Join MDH, DHS uh, for provider updates on topics including receiverships, closures, and the role of governing boards. What are we doing here? If you're not going to take care of senior citizens in nursing homes, what are you doing here? We have double the largest surplus in state history. On top of that, you're probably going to, I assume, $9.5 billion is the largest tax increase in state history. So you have the largest sur double the largest surplus in state history. Couple with that, the largest tax increase in state history. And you're going to allow nursing homes to close in this state. What's going to happen to those seniors? Who's going to take care of our loved ones? I hope the answers are in your computers that you're looking at right now. But Representative New, thank you for bringing this forward because this should be a wake-up call. This is an opportunity for everybody to, to actually put the priority where it should be on taking care of the people in our society who need it the most, who spent their lives taking care of us. And now the least we could do is take care of them. And it's not like we don't have enough money. We have $27 billion. I talked last week on the education bill that that's enough money to double our investment in education. Not just the measly 4% that you're doing that won't fully fund education at your own admission. That's enough money to double the money we spend on education. We're talking real money here. What do nursing homes get? 3.9 million total. That won't keep a single nursing home open. And our own state agencies see the train coming down the tracks, and they're leading workshops to help nursing homes close. This is your opportunity to fix it. So Representative New Brindley, thank you for bringing this amendment forward. I, for one, am going to vote for your amendment because I think we should help those people. I think of all the people in the state who have helped us is the people that are in nursing homes right now that need our help. More than anybody else, those are the people that need our help. And I, I haven't, for the time that I have been here, I've never been able to figure out why Democrats don't want to fund nursing homes. 
The only thing I can think of is it's not the right brand of union. And I don't, I don't get it. But it's been consistent the whole time that I've been here. Democrats have been against funding nursing homes. And I just don't understand it. And that's, you know, it's difficult sometimes when you have a one or two billion dollar surplus, maybe to find the money. But we have a 50% surplus. We have a 50% surplus. Okay, now it's Republicans who are coming through the door. Maybe we could find another door to go through. We have a 50% surplus in our budget, $27 billion. With the surplus you have and the taxes you're raising, and you can only find $3.9 million to give to nursing homes, which won't prevent a single nursing home from closing. And our agencies are conducting workshops on how to close your nursing home. I'd love to see the agenda to, to see if they're telling nursing homes, what are you going to do with those people? Where are you going to send them? If I was what you thought I was, I'd be asking you all to yield for question. I'd be asking you what those nursing homes should be doing with the people as they close. Where should they send them? Unfortunately, I'm not going to do that. Or fortunately for you, I'm not going to do that. But that's the question you should be asking yourself. Where are these nursing homes going to send people? And what are you doing to help the situation? The answer is zero. Here's your opportunity. Vote yes on Representative New Brindley's amendment. And thank you, Representative New, for bringing that forward. I'll, I'm going to pass this sheet out. It'll come out to you shortly. The member from St. Louis, Representative Zaleznikar. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And thank you, Representative Dowd and Representative New Brindley. I hope you will support this. I wonder what our residents across the Minnesota would say if they could actually drive here to be outside this chamber. But I guess they would say probably we built the state and remind all of us they built this state because they can't come down here on a bus. We're talking about the most vulnerable people in Minnesota. They're not going to be rallying outside this chamber to get your ear. They're not going to be sending a message in here like this. I'm giving you the message for Minnesota seniors because they're going to close. Vote for the amendment. Any further discussion? Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I really appreciate my colleagues uh, taking some time to talk about the issue. Um, but you know, this is something I think we've thought about a lot this year. Representative Doubt asked some serious questions. What is the end game here? What's the end game? And we've asked this on a number of bills. I think we'll have a lengthy discussion about that on Wednesday with the health bill as well. Um, but what is the end game? As our nursing homes close, you know, Representative Keel had a nursing home close probably about a month ago now. It's in Crookston, Minnesota. There's nothing. There is no other facility close to Crookston. And every one of those residents is being displaced. And if there is a place for them to go, and that's a big if, it's nowhere near home. It's no one, nowhere near their loved ones. It's nowhere near their family who visits them, spends time with them, cares for them. As someone who's been a caregiver, even when your loved one is being cared for by others, you are still caregiving, I assure you. But we're making that impossible for these families. We are making that impossible for these families as we tell them, your loved one, your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa, they're not worth it. They are not worth it to this legislature. It is not worth it to us to make sure that they can be cared for in their community that they can be cared for near their loved ones, where they can receive visits. And you know, you, you talk about these rural facilities, and we've said this before, but you, you, you look at these rural facilities particularly, 
that are very community-based. And you know, when you go and visit your loved one there in the nursing home, your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa, you're not just visiting your grandma and grandpa or your mom or your dad. You're visiting your neighbor down the road who helped raise you when you were a kid. You're visiting your best friend's mom where you spent a ton of time growing up and being loved on by that mom. You're spending time with your neighbors, your aunts, your uncles, those folks who maybe, maybe they're not the reason that brought you into that nursing home facility that day. Maybe it was for your parent. But there's a lot of people in your community who you've received love from, and now you just want to love on them. And our seniors deserve that. The people who raised us deserve that. In the sunset of their lives, they deserve to feel loved and cared for by us. This amendment, we cobbled together $137 million. And we didn't leave anything in the dust. We took some money out of several different pots to cobble this money together. But frankly, it is the least that we can do to care for and love the people who cared for and loved us. And Madam Speaker, I would like a roll call on the amendment, please. Representative New Brindley requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. And I ask for compassion. Please think about what you're doing here. Vote yes. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk, oh, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. I go move to amend Senate file number 3035, the unofficial engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A13. The member from Itasca, Representative Igo. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this amendment today is going to be doing something that we need to be doing to bolster our economic development here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, I was a member who served on the Economic Development Committee, uh, and we had a lot of good conversations in there. But one thing we never talked about or never passed or put into the bill in front of us today is anything to actually help with economic development. We handed out a lot of checks. We talked about spending a lot of money, a lot to those nonprofits that were talked about earlier, but we actually didn't do anything to make this state a state to want to do business in. Uh, Representative McDonald earlier tonight talked about uh, the article about Mr. Wonderful in North Dakota and the investments going on there. And one of the reasons why is because of our state's permitting and regulation systems. Uh, they are old, they are default, and they don't work for people that want to come here and do business. Now, not only is that fair for the businesses uh, in our state, it's not fair for the communities. Uh, one of the biggest conversations we're having in economic development, whether it be here in St. Paul, whether it be back in the communities that we represent, whether it be uh, nationally, is that we need to find ways to have streamlined and transparent systems for us to be able to permit and regulate uh, different types of industries. So the, the amendment in front of us today is going to be doing just that uh, in offering transparency to Minnesota's uh, permitting systems. Uh, this isn't changing any regulations. This is just having transparency in that system. So a community like Representative Davis and I's Cohasset, when they're talking about building a $500 million wood plant, has the transparency to know that those permits they apply for are going to be set deadlines, and they're going to be able to know where that's at. So that's for a soybean crushing facility in Crookston. Is going to know how long it's going to take to get their investment on the road and start hiring people so they don't leave and go to in North Dakota. For a place like Talon Metals, so they're not going to leave and go to North Dakota. 
for other Fortune 100 companies that exist here in the Twin Cities that are considering leaving the state over the uncertainties that are in front of them. This is a chance for every member in this chamber to vote for real economic development, to start making Minnesota a place where site selectors who are national people can start looking at Minnesota and saying they are open for business. Every member in here agrees that we have the greatest workforce in the country, if not the world. I would say the world. But we need to have a state that's ready to accept the businesses that want to provide those jobs and provide family wages to those people across our state. It was, I, I was so disappointed that the economic development bill didn't do anything to address this. That's why I'm on the House floor here today offering this amendment, and I'm hoping we can take this on as friendly. But with that, Madam Speaker, I'd like to request a roll call. Representative Igo requests a roll call, saying 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Blue Madam Earth. Speaker, I rise to a point of order under Representative House Rule Frederick. Uh, Madam Speaker, under House Rule 3.21, motions and propositions must be germane. A motion or proposition on a subject different from that under consideration must not be admitted under the guise of being an amendment. A motion, amendment, or other proposition offered to the House is out of order if it is not germane to the matter under consideration. The A13 amendment uh, introduces a new chapter and a new section uh, to the bill. And I ask that you uh, find this point of order well taken. I find the point of order well taken. Representative Igo. Madam Speaker, I'd like to appeal the ruling of the Speaker and request a roll call. Representative Igo appeals the ruling of the Speaker, requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Igo. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, I kind of said it in my, in my opening remarks there, but this is offering the chance to the whole Minnesota House to actually invest in something that's going to change economic development. This is directly tied to the Economic Development Committee. I understand that you, know, you can get into the technicalities of, of chapters of law, but this is something we should have heard in committee and should have been working on. Instead of uh, talking about how much money we are going to write to different nonprofits around the state. And when we get to third reading, I'm going to talk about the uh, discrepancies in that and talk about the, inequity, the inequities that exist in there. This is a chance to help people that live in my district in the Iron Range just as much as it would help people that live right here in St. Paul. This is 100% germane and relevant to what we're discussing today. Uh, I would urge a red vote uh, on this appeal so we can actually take this vote today and add this to the bill. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the appeal. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 61 nays, it is a judgment of the House that the, speaker, the decision of the Speaker shall stand. There are no further amendments at the desk. The Clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate file number 3035, as amended. Third reading, as amended. The member from Washington, Representative Weens. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, Chair Zhang, uh, and uh, other members of workforce. It's been my pleasure to, to work, and I was very excited about all the uh, different prospects that came in, all the opportunities for workforce training. Um, yet I thought, there's a problem here. Ku wat chi, uchi pao. What the problem and how to solve it? And I went back to, uh, to a time in a land far away of which my call sign was monster. That's a two-beer conversation for a later time. But uh, I did strategy, plans, and policy, and we always had a problem statement to figure out how we were going to achieve victory in the situation. My boss was Voodoo Six. Uh, that's a three-beer conversation for later. Um, and I would approach Voodoo Six and uh, read the problem statement, is how to attain full employment, achievable, sustainable, by which we have the environment in order to do this. Um, Voodoo 6 would give uh, some initial guidance, uh, like, hey, we've got to win this thing. How do we win this thing? Uh, what are the key waypoints in this? And then finish with the desired end state. And the desired end state is we've got to do this as a team. We've got to achieve this and stay together. Uh, I would take that guidance, work it through a couple of different planning uh, 
uh, mechanisms we would use, and I would come back. And we would have a conversation about what the challenges are, the obstacles, and what our resources were. We use the familiar term uh, in our group as Schlitz, and I'll keep this clean, Schlitz is resources, so that can be time, uh, that can be money, that can be uh, personnel um, to achieve the particular goal, which is this achievable, sustainable, thriving business community as well as full employment. And to achieve that, we need to have all team members moving forward. And in that, there is the issue of uncertainty with our business climate. How do we afford to move forward so that we're generating all this workforce, whether it's graduating uh, kids from school or students from school, or it's our new Minnesotans, or it's people transitioning in the workforce going through programs. They have to have a landing spot. It's a system uh, by we, why, where we have a place for them to go and to be uh, not only productive workers in our society, but enjoying that, and also thriving in our business community. Uh, at the end of the conversation, as, as we would come to a point where we have a decision how to employ those resources or the Schlitz uh, on this environment, um, I would get probably a word similar to this, is retain a little bit of the Schlitz that we're applying in the workforce generation and also comforting those that are uncertain in the business community through strategic communication from our leadership. Uh, our business community, we need to understand if they're leaving, why they're leaving, if they're having troubles here, how can we alleviate that? And that strategic communication needs to come from the top and it needs to be continually sent. And he would end, Voodoo Six would say something like, retain a little bit of that Schlitz. Since this is about workforce, why don't we retain a little bit of that resource and apply it to those that who, who have been in the resource uh, or been in the workforce their whole lives? And why don't we stop taxing Social Security? Why don't we honor those in the workforce? So at the end, end of the day, as we go forward, uh, I would just ask that we honor the workforce that has gone before us and that we continue to work together to find equitable solutions for the business community as well as the workforce generation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Hennepin, Representative Censor Murrah. Uh, thank you, um, Speaker. Thank you, members. I rise tonight in support of this bill, and I, I want to ask everyone to vote green. I want to start by thanking Chair Zhang for his leadership on the committee and for bringing in the voices of so many job creators from our community. Uh, we heard the voices from so many nonprofits led by communities of color who are doing the work of helping people in our community find and keep jobs. And I really want to thank you, and I want to thank the thank Chair Hassan for modeling equity in practice, uh, for being unapologetic about making sure that we are making investments in communities that are traditionally left out of the process um, and using our power to do that. Thank you both. Uh, one of my main takeaways from being on the committee um, is that we're, we need everyone for our workforce shortages, for our workforce challenges to fill those gaps. We need everyone. And we have incredible workforce shortages in all of our caring positions for our most vulnerable populations, whether it is children, whether it is elderly, whether it is in healthcare. To take care of our population, we need to bring everyone in, folks that are new to the country, folks that are leaving in incarceration. Um, and I wanna specifically highlight how we bring young people into the workforce. Um, I was really lucky to uh, sit on both the Education Finance Committee and the Workforce Committee and really see the connection between the two. We know that when young people leave our K-12 system, um, lots of times the work of supporting them is not done. And so how do we create that connection to ensure that we are bringing young people into the workforce that we are helping them transition. A proverb that is really important to me and that has always kind of guided my work with young people is if young people are not initiated into the village, they will burn it down to feel its warmth. And I think a lot of times with some of the challenges that our state is seeing right now, we are seeing the result of that. We are seeing public health challenges with young people who are struggling with addiction. 
we are seeing public safety challenges, right, with young people who don't have meaningful work. Um, and so I really want to highlight the investments that we are making by nonprofits that are trusted in our community um, that do that really critical piece of ensuring that our young people can find and keep meaningful work. Um, I also want to talk to bring people into the workforce, but we need to work to keep them there. I appreciate the conversations we had in the committee and the conversations that we've had tonight about how we keep people in the workforce, how we retain people. We do that by putting policies in place that ensure that workers can be treated as human beings, not as robots, not as a burden, not as a bottom line, but as a thing that makes our economy run. I was proud, for example, to carry a bill to ensure that individuals with mental illness can stay in their jobs. And I want to appreciate the work of Lead Baker on the committee for really thinking about how do employers better support um, individuals who struggle with mental illnesses. And finally, we need to put people into the industries of the future. I want to talk about, you know, we passed the 100% uh, campaign bill, we passed the 100% clean energy bill, and now we need to ensure that specifically people of color will have access to those green jobs. I was proud to carry a bill to create pre-apprenticeship programs with trusted community organizations in the clean energy sector, and that's one of the reasons that I would ask you to support the bill tonight. For our workforce, we need everyone. For our workforce, we need to keep everyone. And we do that by investing in workforce development, training, and policies that create workforce, workplaces where everyone is treated with dignity. Members, please vote green. Thank you. The member from Itasca, Representative Igo. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, speaking to the bill as a whole now, uh, I'll just kind of get back to what I was talking about when I wish we could have taken that amendment. Uh, in the Economic Development Committee, which all the the provisions that we had in there in this bill today. We spent a lot of time talking about uh, disparities, uh, inequalities, differences in the struggles that not only do we see here in uh, you know, metro uh, Minnesota, but also greater Minnesota. And there was, there was good conversation on both sides, I won't deny that. But the thing that was lacking that we're getting that was, was forgotten along that way is that the needs of all Minnesotans um, are different um, in that sometimes it's more than just investing $176 million into Minneapolis and saying, oh, well, we can give this part of the state $5 million, $10 million. If there was a theme for the Economic Development Committee, it would have been the big, gigantic checks that you get from Publishers Clearinghouse. That, that was the Economic Development Committee this year. Um, and, you know, uh, with a guy who has some uh, a background in economic development, I understand that you need to inspire and you need to lift up nonprofits that do well to find entrepreneurs, to lift up those people, to give them access to capital. Those are all good things. But like I said in the amendment, we didn't do anything to address any of the policy. And if you don't do any of the policy, what's the point? The money's just going to go out the door. Actually, you know, where the money's going to go is it's going to fund nonprofit managers who take too big of salaries, uh, and they're going to invest in, in companies that will probably get a, their, 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 their start, uh, and then we'll be looking to leave Minnesota because they're going to realize our regulation's are out of control. Or a policy that we should be doing, we're not doing, and instead we're doing policy like paid family leave. We're doing policy like earn sick and safe time. We're increasing taxes. Or I guess as we sometimes call them around here, revenue raisers. That's hurting Minnesota's chance to diversify our economy. And I think that's one way that unites both sides of the aisle. We all agree that we want to diversify our economy. Whether it be diversifying the economy down on Lake Street in Minneapolis, or diversifying the economy up in Minnesota's Iron Range. All that needs to happen. But we have to unlock the tools for that to happen. And when you talk to site selectors who around the country are looking for places to locate and add business, they say, stay away from Minnesota. That's not only just not fair to our communities, that's not fair to the working family in this state. That's not fair to the taxpayers of this state. If we want a state that's going to create and grow prosperity for people and give them the highest quality of life so they can build generational wealth, raise a family, live that dream in the greatest place in the world to grow up and raise a family, Minnesota, we need to start unlocking the tools to make this a place to do that. And when we've lost billions of dollars of private investment just from the start of this year, not to mention the 5,700 jobs we just lost last month, we're not doing it right. We can't just write checks off to groups and say this is a way to fix it. It's not. 
I just heard a few minutes ago we talked about the about how we're passing other things that are going to help, like the renewable clean energy standard. That's not going to help. It's just going to put another tax on business. It's going to make it harder for that entrepreneur when they're starting their little shop on Main Street when their power bills double. That's going to mean they can hire one less employee. That means their margins become that much closer. The bill that we have in front of us today is a huge missed opportunity. Because if there's one place that Republicans and Democrats can work together, it's economic development. And I say that from experience. The last five years, I've had the opportunity to work with people across Minnesota's Iron Range in economic development, whether it be at the county level, whether it be at the city level, whether it be at some of the nonprofits. I've sat in rooms with them all, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's Republicans and it's Democrats and it's everything in between. But we all agree that we need to do something. And the biggest ask isn't, can we get more money? That's never the first ask. It's how can we be more attractive? How can we bring people here to live here and thrive here? Part of the conversation we had tonight was about making sure we can stabilize our home prices. This bill is going to increase the, the, the price of, of owning a home. So now if our housing prices are going through the roof, our electric prices are going through the roof, and we have permitting and regulations that are standing in the way of business doing anything, I guess, I, you know, I guess, I guess I'm, that's right. I guess the only thing left to do is write checks at the cost of the taxpayers where they're not going to see any return on investment. One of the big proposals in the bill is to invest a lot in the city of Minneapolis and help them rebuild. I have no problem with that. We need to support those communities. They went through a lot out of no fault of their own. Minnesotans need to take care of each other. But what about my communities? What about my communities up in the Iron Range that are having onerous environmental permitting regulations and courtrooms push them out into 15, 20, and 25 years of permitting, leaving our communities holding on for dear life? When are they going to get their $176 million? Oh, wait. We tried two years ago, and the governor and the rest of the state left us out to dry, and that project left. I'm passionate about this, just like everyone on the other side of the aisle. But we got to start working together on this, or Minnesotans are going to suffer. The next generation is going to suffer. So I'm pretty sad in this bill today, because I wanted to support an economic development bill. I really did. It's one of my greatest passions. It's why I went to college for that. It's why I've been working with people for the last five, six years on it. It's why I'm proud to be a part of the IRRB because we find ways to create partnerships and grow and find ways to, to utilize our state agencies. And if you start connecting the dots, we'll see that there's other people in the state that aren't happy. It doesn't take much to put together that the deed commissioner left without wondering why he wasn't being able to see any economic development. Projects were failing because the state wasn't supporting them. So members, they leave us with a lot, of think, lot to think about on this. Let's come together in a way that makes Minnesotans proud that their legislature is working to help their businesses. That's giving them a hand up rather than a handout. So that main streets can prosper and big business can grow to attract more people and provide good paying jobs. So we can stabilize the cost of, of owning a house. So we can lift families out of poverty and we can give every Minnesotan the highest quality of life that they are deserved by in our Constitution. That's what we've been doing with this bill today. It's a huge missed opportunity. And with that, I encourage the whole chamber to vote no so we can send this back to committee and work on it and give a bill that works for Minnesotans living in St. Paul, Minneapolis, whether you're in Ely, whether you're in Crookston, whether you're in Worthington, whether you're in Mankato. Let's make a bill that works for all of us. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Nicollet, Representative Brand. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I just wanted to rise as Vice Chair of the Workforce uh, Committee to talk about a couple of things 
um, that I've, I've seen in this uh, session as we talk about workforce development in Minnesota. You know, I think when we first arrived and we started having these conversations about work, what workforce means, um, I woke up in mid-January to news headlines from the Mankato Free Press. Uh, Representative Frederick and I have the Mankato Free Press. We read it daily. And uh, it said that Mankato has the lowest unemployment, not in the state, not in the Midwest, the entire nation. But Minnesota's not too far behind. We have an unemployment problem in the state of Minnesota, and it's only grown since 2019. We had about 200,000 jobs that are open in Minnesota right now. So if a person really wants to, they can have more than one job, honestly. Um, I was looking at this table here from 2019. I kept everything from the last time I was here at that point. That was pre-pandemic. But also that in our uh, nursing and residential care facilities, we are at a 1.1% a loss of, of employees between 2019 and, I'm sorry, 2019 and 2020, and it was projected. And so that's kind of the trend that we're having right now. Um, you know, as I look at uh, what this bill does, this bill does a lot of things. First, I have to give a shout out to the chair. Um, Jay, uh, Representative Zhang has done a very good job, a tremendous job of incorporating the entire committee in the process of crafting this portion of the bill. And so I want to give a shout out to him for very, being very inclusive to really modeling leadership. And I really appreciate that opportunity as vice chair to, to learn from him. Um, also, I, I, I think that there are some things that really haven't been mentioned in this bill that really bear fruit that we have to mention. The Drive for Five uh, Workforce Fund, emphasizing careers in technology Care professions, that we talked about care professions, yes, that's included in this bill, $30 million that will address care professions, education, manufacturing, and the trades. All important and vital pieces to our uh, workforce in here in Minnesota. A lot of what we do at the legislature kind of dovetails with other things. Uh, Chair Howard, of course, housing. Can't really have a job without a house, right? That's really important. So we want to make sure they're making investments in housing so people have the stability to have an address where they can apply for a job. That's really important. Um, in the agriculture budget, we talked about broadband internet. Broadband internet is really important for people who don't want uh, brick and stick Main Street business, but want a place that they can have a, you know, like maybe in a garage out in rural Minnesota where I live. It's really important. If you go west of St. Peter, Minnesota, if you go out to Nicollet and places west of there, there's nothing. Students literally still have to drive into town and find a spot in the parking lot at the library to upload their homework and download the homework. That's 20, this is the 21st century and we've still got these issues in rural Minnesota. So I think it's really important that we're making investments in broadband internet. That's really important as well. Um, there were a couple of stories that were talked about in the, in the, in the committee hearings, but I wanted to bring to you your attention one of them. Uh, it was the uh, International Institute of Minnesota. And they talked about how they had the resources to provide the resources for a resettlement to 400 families from Ukraine. Uh, their heaven became a hellscape last year when Russia invaded Ukraine, and they found refuge here in Minnesota. And they found refuge in Minnesota working with the International Institute of Minnesota to provide housing assistance, employment assistance, food benefits, things like that, because they don't know what it's like to navigate the streets of Minnesota, let alone um, the, the situations that they're facing. Maybe they lost a loved one. Maybe they definitely lost everything that they had back home. Um, incidentally, with House File 4, we're actually allowing them the opportunity to have a driver's license while they're here as well. So that's, a, that's an important thing as well. So a lot of things that we do at the legislature kind of dovetail together with all of these things. But, you know, I think the biggest thing I can say is this. There's no silver bullets here in legislature. There's no silver bullets here in St. Paul. But what we're doing is we're ad ad adapting and addressing the situations head on that we're facing. And I think that it really is important to note that uh, child care in Minnesota is a really big thing. There's $10 million in the bill. It's matching funds specifically earmarked for Greater Minnesota that creates $20 million in usable space for child care slots across our state. In Mankato alone, we've got 1,000 open slots. Well, we really can't get those employees in those jobs if we don't have houses, and we definitely can't get them into work if they don't have a place to put their child that's safe 
and affordable every day and day in and day out. There's also $5 million for the Minnesota Initiative Foundations. Those are also in greater Minnesota. And what they will do is actually help address the situation for housing, um, I'm sorry, not housing, uh, for childcare rather, by allowing um, in-home providers to get the skills and tool up to get those in-home daycares in across our state as well. We're not supporting one, we're not picking winners and losers, we're out providing opportunities for folks across the state to do the things that they, knew they can do, roll up their sleeves and be part of the community and really support the communities across the entire state of Minnesota, not just in the Twin Cities, not just in greater Minnesota, but in across the entire state. And so I just wanted us to thank uh, again, uh, Chair Hassan, uh, Chair Nelson and Chair Zhang for this bill, and I am an emphatic yes. I can't wait to see the final product, and I'm looking forward to going back and talking to everybody back home about all the good things that's going to happen in the greater Mankato area because of it. Thank you. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members, for the conversation and debate tonight on this bill. Uh, and uh, for me, I served on the Labor and Industry Committee, and I want to make a, just a, a point here that especially the provisions that, that made their way through uh, the Labor and Industry Committee, uh, frankly, they don't represent labor and industry. There's a healthy balance that we can strike in our state, and this bill falls woefully short of that. I certainly would have loved to hear more bills this session in, in committee in, in the Labor and Industry Committee that actually helped job creators in our state, that helped create a regulatory environment for businesses to invest in Minnesota. But instead, this bill and our committee members heard far too many bills and ideas that many times were in search of a problem and brought the heavy hammer of government down upon private job creators in our state. And that is what's disappointing. Several provisions, many different provisions, pit job creators versus employees or employees versus job creators. That is not the way to build one Minnesota. That is not the way to build healthy relationships. And it shouldn't be this way. When I think about what my Republican colleagues and I stood for this session, it was centered around the principle that Minnesota should be a great place to work, that Minnesota should be a great place to build a business and to do business in this state, to enhance the opportunities available in communities in every corner of the state. But instead, what we saw was division brought between employers and employees, and that was sad. Additional mandates upon employers that are so heavy-handed that businesses will leave our state. New programs in search of a problem that will go the way of pushing, especially places like nursing homes, to closure, to not serving people. When we look at several of the provisions included in this bill tonight, it's more difficult for those who are doing meat packing or agriculture processing in our state to invest here. And instead, they will find their way to other states sooner rather than later. During this legislative session, I would hearken to guess that the major employer in this state that has made a decision to leave is because of the regulatory burden that this legislature is pushing on them. If you didn't know, we're losing 1,000 employees in southern Minnesota in one of our House Republican districts because of a heavy burden of government. And it doesn't have to be this way. I appreciated that we, for a moment, brought up the idea of regulatory reform, environmental permitting reform, and I can't quite understand why my uh, colleague, Representative Frederick, Frederick would, would shoot the, down that idea because these things should move hand in hand. But instead, we're pushing the heavy hand of government on job creators in our state. We need to be encouraging ingenuity, supporting the people who choose to do business and employ Minnesotans in our state, make Minnesota competitive for business to help us thrive 
so that we have rising wages in our state. Not through government, but through the private marketplace. We need to continue to support those in the trades in our state. And frankly, because of the provisions included in this bill, I believe those who work in the construction, building, building and construction trades in Minnesota will actually see less opportunity in our state. Fewer homes built, fewer buildings built, fewer new jobs coming, from, coming to our state, fewer actual companies, potentially fewer minority-owned businesses because of the onerous mandates or the liability created for general contractors through this bill. It's wrong and it doesn't have to be this way. We can support those in the trades. We can support those small businesses in this state. We can support minority-owned businesses. But not with this bill, not with this bill that brings the heavy hand of government and inserts it in places it doesn't have to be. Vote no, members. The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is Representative Igbaje in the chamber? I was hoping to ask a question. Uh, it does not appear that Representative Igbaje is at her desk, Representative New Brindley. Okay, I will start talking and, and hope that maybe that changes before I'm done. Um, you know, we, we don't have a lot of opportunities through our budget and through this process to uh, take care of the people we need to take care of. But this bill is one of the bills that would allow us to take care of our senior citizens in nursing homes. It's one of the sort of few opportunities we have. We'll have another opportunity tomorrow, and I sure hope we'll take it. Um, but we offered several amendments to do that through grants for, new, for nursing home labor stabilization grants. And we did that because it matters. <laughs> you know. I, I agree with most of the things that are said in this chamber when it comes to workforce, when it comes to labor. We get it. We're all on the same page. There is a workforce shortage, a workforce crisis in the state. There is across the board. But I'll tell you what, when I have constituents come into my office and talk to me about this, and they do, I mean, we're all, we are all getting this from our constituents, right? In almost every industry we are hearing about the workforce shortage. Um, but I'll be honest, when they come to my office, if they are not talking about health care, my answer to them is you're going to have to figure it out. Because we don't have other options in health care. We need people. We need real people caring for people. That is our only option in health care. So I get it. I get that over here on this side of the chamber, we can't shut up about our nursing homes. I get it. But there's a reason for that. And it's because there is no other option. There is no other option for the people we love in our nursing homes. But people. We need people to provide that care. And so frankly, the amendments that I offered to try to get some additional funding there, to bolster our workforce, to recruit and retain workforce in our nursing homes, it's not hyperbole. It's a crisis. And it's not a looming crisis. It's not maybe coming down the road. It's here. We are dealing with it right now, every day. And it's incredibly disappointing that with the hundreds of millions of dollars we're spending here, we couldn't find any money to help our nursing homes, to help and re re recruit and retain people, caregivers for our nursing homes. Representative Egbaji, if, if she would yield for a question, Mr. Speaker. 
She will yield, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, and I appreciate Representative Agbaje, you coming back to the floor. I, I assume you're having dinner or a snack or something, and I appreciate you taking the time to come back. Um, I just, you know, in the, um, in the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board language, I just want, I'm hoping I can just get a clarification. I think there's some um, question, some confusion on uh, the issue of public input in the process with the expedited rulemaking. And because it is expedited, unlike the usual rulemaking process, um, there's not necessarily an opportunity for public hearings with the expedited process. And so I just wanted to make sure that as I look in um, section, chapter 14, Point three eight nine, the expedited process in existing statute. Is it your intention that subdivision five would apply? And that's that's that subdivision that would require public a public hearing be held if fifty or more people request that hearing. Representative McBatchy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative New Brindley, um, for the question. Yeah, so in general, there are opportunities for public comment throughout this bill um, for the Nursing Home Work Workforce Standards Board. So I'll point out a couple of places so that way it's, it's, it's on the record. So first of all, the bill explicitly um, in line 121.6, page 121, line 6, um, there's public hearings to understand what the working conditions will be. There's also public hearings on the curriculum development, which you'll find on page 126, uh, line 10 and line 18. Um, and then additionally, throughout, as the uh, Workforce Standards Board creates its, its rules and creates its different policies, there are many places where, as the board is investigating, particularly when they investigate market conditions, where they take testimony from the public, from workers, from employers, and other stakeholders, which you'll find on page 122 at line 30. And so while we're not going to call out specifically uh, subdivision five in Minnesota statute 14.389, we do intend that at any point that if an employer, an employee, the regulators want to have a public comment period, particularly during the expedited process, which already allows for a 30 day notice period, they can do so. Representative New Brindley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so this, this is specifically referring to, on page 124, subdivision three of section five, no, excuse me, of section six. It's, re, it's specifically referring to subdivision three with the review of standards um, and and un, under this review of standards, at least once every two years, the board, one, needs to conduct a full review um, of the adequacy of minimum nursing home employment standards. So these are the things that have already been established by the board. And this is an additional review process of those standards that have already now been established by the board. And then subdivision two uses the expedited rulemaking process. So if Representative Igbaji would yield to another question, Mr. Speaker. She will yield, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I just want to be, I, I, I understand that throughout the process and other parts of the process that there may be uh, that there may be public input, but I'm concerned that in this additional review that's happening every two years, they're making use of the expedited rulemaking process, but it's unclear whether or not that additional review every two years would allow for 
that public input. And I, and, I, and I ask this, and I just am asking for this clarification because of course, in the, in the statute under subdivision five, it specifically says that if the law contains a specific ref reference to this subdivision as opposed to a general reference to the section, um, you don't necessarily get that that uh, public input. And so you mentioned that this does not specifically call out subdivision five. And so my question is, is that the intention that as this moves forward in every two years, there's no guarantee of public input? Representative Igbache. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative New Brindley, for the clarifying question. So, no, that is not the intention. Basically, actually, any time that these standards are reviewed, there is there can be an opportunity for public comment. Again, what uh, Section 14.389 has a 30-day comment period in it. it. That the statute doesn't specify if that's public or written or whichever, but that that is definitely something that can be a public comment period. Um, finally. There's also nothing in here that's precluding a public comment period. So should anyone request one or want to see one happen, or if um, you know an employer wants to have a public comment period, that can definitely happen. And, and additionally, also with the review of the standards, the first time it's reviewed, they do have a public comment period. And it is our intention, it is expected, that in the additional reviews, they can also have a public comment period as well. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Agbaje, I, I do appreciate your thorough response. I am concerned about this. Um, and, I, and I appreciate that in the initial process that, um, that there is that opportunity for, for public input. However, saying that if a nursing home or someone requests to be able to have public input, if the law doesn't require it, the board doesn't have to give it. The board is not required to hold those public hearings if the law doesn't require it. And so to say that a nursing home could request it, well, sure, I could request that Leader Damoth bring me an apple pie tomorrow, but that doesn't mean she's going to do it. She might. <laughs> but I can request lots of things, but if I can't compel her to do that, she doesn't have to bring me a pie tomorrow. And if we don't put in this language, if we don't reference, frankly, subdivision five, and require that if, and it's, it's still a reasonably high threshold, there has to be a written request by 50 or more people to request a hearing. But if we don't have that, there is no guarantee that that will happen. The board is, does not, is not compelled to make that happen. Um, so, I mean, clearly I've got concerns about the Nursing Home Workforce Standards Board, right? I mean, I had an amendment to take it out, I get that. I've got concerns about it, but I think we should all be concerned and I hope that this is something that can be considered in conference committee. Um, that as we move forward, I mean, this review is going to be done every two years. So 10 years from now, thinking further out, 10 years from now, if we're gonna have this board doing this review and there's no guarantee of a public hearing, I think that is really problematic. That's really problematic for transparency and frankly, it's really problematic for coming out with the best work product. Um, I am glad actually that the standards will be reviewed frequently but there has to be an opportunity for public hearings and public input on that. And again, subdivision five is very clear that if the law does not specifically reference subdivision five, then they are not compelled to hold a hearing. And I think that is really critical. And again, we're talking about we're talking about this issue of taking care of our senior citizens. We're talking about this issue of caring for our loved ones in nursing homes. And you look at how quickly that is evolving now. 
again, you know, I mean, we're talking 300-ish facilities across the state. 15 of them have closed in the last couple of years. And more are slated to close now. Again, you know, uh, Representative Dow referenced the fact that uh, the departments are holding a, a Zoom meeting on this to show our nursing homes how to close. They're expecting it. And so the landscape on this is changing, and it's changing quickly. And frankly, with the lack of nursing home funding in the budgets that are moving forward, that change is going to accelerate. In, and in bad ways that are gonna be really destructive to families and to our loved ones. And so as we move forward, we need to make sure that our families, our loved ones, the nursing homes that are being affected by this have an opportunity to ensure that there are public hearings and that public input. This bill is simply not ready for prime time. It makes me sad. Like I said, we all understand the workforce issues that we are facing in our state. And yet with all the money we're spending in this bill, and boy, as legislators, we can find all kinds of ways to spend money. We just throw it around, right? Money everywhere. And somehow, it's not landing in our nursing homes. And we had an opportunity to do that in this bill, and we didn't. And for that reason alone, that reason is enough to say, no, this bill is not good enough. This bill is not good enough for Minnesotans. If it's not going to take care of our most vulnerable, it's not worth it. I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Speaker. Members, I had the honor of serving as the vice chair of the Economic Development Committee this year, so I'm gonna speak a lot on our work there, and I'm looking forward to voting for everything in this bill. I want to first extend a thank you to Chair Hassan and to Travis and Elijah, our partisan and nonpartisan and fiscal staff, because none of us would be here without them. We heard every bill that was assigned to our committee this year. We included Republicans and Democrats' bills in the final bill that's before you. We ran an informative and inclusive and transformative committee, making significant investments in all Minnesotans. You know, people talk a lot about the difference between hand ups and handouts in this arena, but we're finally investing in people who've gotten to where they are without either of those. This is not just about throwing money at nonprofits or writing people checks. It's about investing in all of the people of Minnesota in ways we've never done before. Hardworking small business owners and emerging developers who have worked hard to navigate around the intentional barriers that this country has put in front of some more than others for hundreds of years. While some business owners have experienced a slick or privileged path to success for generations, our bill acknowledges this failure and the resulting disparities, and it intentionally invests in those that we've left out and left behind for too long. I come from a blue collar, lower class working family, and I represent a community that's socioeconomically diverse with hundreds of small businesses. My great grandfather and other family members owned small businesses in the district that I now represent. And I grew up visiting their businesses and watching my family be their own boss. And that left a mark on me. While I am not yet a small business owner myself, I heard again and again that small business owners need our investment and support. So this year, I carried House File 504 to finally codify the Small Business Partnership Program into state law and increase the investments so that Minnesota small business owners see that we are putting the money where our mouth is. Today's bill says that we value small businesses, and this is what it looks like to turn words into action. 
This and many of the other programs in this bill supports businesses from border to border, despite what you might hear in both greater and metro Minnesota, with the tools, resources, and capital that they need to continue to make Minnesota the best place to live, work, and raise a family. And again, despite what you may hear, unequivocally, this bill equitably invests in all of Minnesota, from Canadian border relief, World Expo investments, the Forward Fund, Initiative Foundation, America's Seed Fund for Research and Development Investment, and to every part of the bill before us, this is a responsible and equitable investment in all Minnesotans' businesses, including a first-of-its-kind investment in LGBTQ businesses. So thank you again to our fearless leader, Chair Hassan. I am a better leader because of how you led this committee this year. And I wanna highlight how fabulous, fabulous it was to get to do this work with you. And with all the members who took the time to represent their communities, to bring bills forward so we could hear every one of them and incorporate them into our bill. We are going to advance economic development for all Minnesotans statewide. And a green vote today means voting to more effectively support small businesses, workers, and our entire economy. It means investing in Minnesotans from border to border and investing in all of us. So please join me in voting yes today. Thank you, Speaker. I recognize the member from Wright, Representative McDonald. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. I just rise as the lead member of the GOP. I want to say a couple of thank yous. And uh, first of all, uh, Leader Damoth, I want to thank you for asking me to be on the committee as the lead. It was a tough decision because it took me off taxes that I really enjoyed for the last six years. But I appreciate the, uh, the respect and the opportunity to be the lead. I'd like to thank uh, also uh, our uh, chairman, Representative Nelson, uh, a true gentleman. Uh, very respectful of the minority, gave us ample time to ask questions and to make comments. He let us have good, robust debate with our fellow colleagues on the other side of the aisle. You know who you are. We agreed on some bills and we disagreed on other bills, but we did it respectfully. Sometimes we got a little feisty, but it was always with respect and admiration for our positions in the legislature. I'd like to thank uh, also uh, our, our uh, fine uh, Mr. Kennedy, who uh, really kept us on track and kept us informed and helped us immensely do the job that we do. As you all know, we cannot, especially freshmen, we cannot do what we do if we don't have a good staff. And those experts in the field, particularly in labor and industry, uh, are just uh, help us do and look better and do be better. So thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I'd like to make, uh, thank the members. We had uh, Mr. Schultz, Representative Schultz, Representative Mecklen, Representative Daniels, and Representative Myers, the new freshman there. You did a fine job, Representative Myers. I wish I could support this portion of the labor bill, Representative uh, Nelson, but unfortunately, it, what it does, and what I've heard from many folks in the fields of construction and labor and industry, it, it keeps us a, at a disadvantage from our neighboring states. I mentioned that earlier, the uh, provisions uh, and issues with Fargo and Moorhead, but the other states as well, Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota, Wisconsin, they are all doing things differently than Minnesota. Minnesota is passing more regulations, more mandates, more taxes, more fees, more fines, and makes it more difficult in the fields and to be prosper and to allow our businesses and our job creators to be uh, prosperous with their employees. And it puts us at a very economic disadvantage. That's just the facts. If you look at the numbers, those states, surrounding states, are doing better job economically with their numbers because they're more friendly. They're more business friendly. They're not treating our job creators like criminals, fining them, mandating them, regulating them. They have a little trust. I think that's the one thing that we lack here. We don't trust enough. As Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. And it appears that some of the bills in your bill, Representative Nelson, don't trust the job creators whatsoever. And boy, if you make a mistake, we're going to fine you. No, not 7,000. We're going to triple that fine. 
So it's really unfair for their, our job creators, and it puts us at a disadvantage with our neighboring states, and uh, it'll drive, it could potentially drive businesses to go to a state that's more economic friendly, that has, doesn't have as many fines and mandates and allows more freedom and prosperity. So for that, uh, I will probably, I will be a no on your bill, unfortunately. And uh, I just, uh, again, thank the members on the committee and the good work that we do here on the House floor and sometimes the bad work on the House floor. Mr. Speaker. I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Zhang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this bill is for all Minnesotans. We are developing businesses, our workforce, and our community all at once. When Minnesotans learn job skills, they can get a job, and when they have a job and have labor protections, they're able to put food on the table and have a roof over their heads. And most importantly, our economy grows. This bill will raise all Minnesotans up, we're making meaningful investments in people and their social capital. We are training our youth into the workforce of tomorrow. We are spearheading innovation and fostering new leaders in business and labor force. And we are doing it in the greatest workforce, economic development, and labor bill Minnesota's leaders has ever envisioned. And I can't be more prouder to support this bill. And I hope you can stand with me to ensure we have the brightest future yet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the member from Candy, Ohio, Representative Baker. Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Spacker. <laughs> yeah, I had to do that. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, thank you, with all due respect. Um, I want to also uh, kind of, we said a lot has been said tonight. I know we've got another, another uh, major bill ahead of us uh, tonight, so we've got to get to it. And a lot of things have been said. Um, I have been very clear that the body, I am disappointed in the mandates in this bill. We should not have looked at any mandates for, for um, struggling industries, for anything that's going to make it harder to hire people in Minnesota. This bill fell far short of my goals, what I wanted to do, and I'm sorry for that. Um, there are some good things in the bill. Um, Chair Zhang did a good job leading the, the, the department and leading our, our, our uh, committee this year. Uh, great CA. Thank you, Travis, for your work on that. And again, we had a great team as well. Uh, there's some things in there that I like with education, some pro start stuff with our hospitality folks. Um, and again, um, Minnesota, we have the hardest, greatest workforce in the country. I really believe that. Uh, but what we are doing, though, members, is we are at a very dangerous place right now, coming off of a two and a half, three year shutdown, slow down, rebuilding ourselves after a horrific pandemic just about wiped it all out and businesses are still recovering. It's our job now to start putting on the right kind of policies, the right kind of, of ideas that actually get people to want to go back to work, that want to make sure that they find it in their heart, in their gut, to want to stand up and get back to work. We did a lot of damage the government did a lot of damage to extend longer than we should have people that stayed at home longer. We tried to help out and I think sometimes we went too far and it made it hard for people to go back to work. So the policies that we're doing today have to really be careful that it doesn't ruin good people and the work ethic that we must have in Minnesota to make Minnesota number one. One of the biggest things that we're missing is a strong head coach. The head coach that is supposed to represent everybody in the state of Minnesota has an office over here underneath the Senate chamber. I'm worried that businesses do not feel heard by the governor's office. I'm worried they are not feeling understood. 
because everything that passes off the bodies with the trifecta is, is quickly and gleefully signed into law without having some balance. To me, one Minnesota means it's good for all and will do our very best to bring us together. That is the one thing that has not been happening this session. In my ninth year, this has not happened yet. And I'm looking for some serious leadership to come out of that side of the Capitol, and I hope it happens soon. But it's not because you're not doing your jobs. We all represent our own footprint, our own district, and they're different from each other. But the governor's district is the whole state of Minnesota. And I hope he doesn't forget that. So again, I'm just gonna say uh, good work to all the members. The staff was great. Uh, Chair Jean kind of recognized everybody, so that's terrific. I'm just worried about the future of Minnesota if we keep scaring away small business, medium-sized business, and large business. I'm worried one day we're gonna wake up, and it's not gonna be next year, might even not even be two years, but it, when these policies and this tax stuff that's coming and the lack of, of us incentivizing people to come into Minnesota versus leave Minnesota, we're gonna wake up one day and we're gonna ask what happened here. It's funny, I, I'm uh, texting my wife and my, my neighbors right now on a small lake back out in Wilmer and we had a large number of fish kill this year. A lot of ice, no light getting through and a lot of the rough fish are all of a sudden floating on the top of the water and the birds are eating well. That could be us as our, as our businesses, folks. They're gonna slowly rise to the top and they're just gonna float to the side and they're gonna go away. And we're not gonna have the number of job creators and producers in the state that will make those lakes vibrant. So I just, I caution all of us, be careful what we're doing here because it's gonna get us in trouble when, when we wake up someday, three, four, five, six, ten 10 years from now, and we're gonna wonder what happened to all the fish. So I wish I could support this bill. We worked really hard this year to try to bring a lot of good dialogue and questions and, and again, um, very good robust conversations. I just hope that we can find a way to come together and make Minnesota something that isn't gonna be pushing jobs out of the state and I'm fearful that what we're doing this session is doing just that. So members, um, I'm voting red today. I hope that you join me. Uh, we have more work to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. We've had a long discussion tonight and I wanna go back to what I said at the beginning. The labor part of this bill is about worker safety and making sure workers go home at the end of the day in the same condition they came to work. I'm proud of this bill. I'm proud of the work we've done in this bill. And with that, members, I'm asking for a, a green vote. I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, members. Here we are with another mandate-heavy bill from the Democrats that will do more to kill jobs than it does to help the economy or encourage our job creators or to strengthen our workforce. But before we go further, I wanna give my appreciation to our nonpartisan staff for their time and effort uh, in answering all our questions, uh, especially uh, Mr. Reese on the Democrat side. Uh, if you're a CA and you want to get a lot of recognition, divide up your committee into three parts. <laughs> uh, I also want to thank our uh, researcher, Lori Kuzno, um, and thank you to Chair Hassan. I did appreciate uh, working in your committee. You did a wonderful job of making sure that the voice of our side of the aisle uh, was heard, that we had adequate time to uh, debate the bill, uh, dive into some questions, and while that may not seem like a big deal, uh, that is very important in the process and uh, I appreciate the work that you did there. And, you know, while the economic development portion of the bill uh, might be a little heavy on the grants uh, to organizations, uh, we did have some concerns with organizations that had little or no track record of creating jobs or businesses or really spurring strong economic development. 
And if that portion of the bill would have been um, more agreeable, uh, the overall bill, I think, would probably get a little bit more support than it would from our side of the aisle tonight. You know, this bill does not provide jobs. There's, it's a missed opportunity. We talked about the 5,700 jobs last March that were lost in Minnesota and as the fact that we still have 53,000 person workforce shortage in the long-term care industry that we had an opportunity to help out tonight. We had a chance to provide meaningful legislation for Minnesotans and to have an impact on our unstable economic outlook. Now, we also uh, didn't offer amendments tonight on a couple items that I hope will continue to be worked on through the conference committee. Uh, Representative Grossel had a policy provision uh, to extend some support that we gave to his area, the Northeast Angle, and I think we will, um, I'm hopeful that we can work on that during the uh, conference committee. And then I also have a labor retention bill um, for our frontline personnel, police, and fire uh, that would set up a pilot program for PTSD and to help with uh, the onslaught of retirements that we're having uh, with equine mental health, a pilot program. I think we could have done a little bit more on the manufacturing gap funding and maybe we can uh, make, find some room to meet the, the ask of them. It was only a $2 million ask and I, we, on, we only came up with a million. Um, but those are uh, funding programs that really help our manufacturers across the state to improve their uh, businesses and create more jobs and more economic activity. But there is a better way to make sure that all, all parts of the bill uh, meet the needs of Minnesotans. And what we support is, uh, it, is our bill should encourage and support a diversity of economic sectors with a robust and to build a robust and re resilient modern economy that pays the bills in Minnesota. We should enable innovation and ingenuity and encourage entrepreneurship by promoting a climate that is responsive to the needs and speed of business with policy programs that work to reduce the bureaucracy and burden some regulations and Representative Igo uh, has been a champion uh, to talk about that. Our jobs bill should promote economic growth and activity statewide to make us competitive across the world and we Tried in some areas, but I think we could do better and we missed some spots. Uh, I was glad to see that we, while we didn't have a hearing in committee, it showed up in the omnibus bill, uh, but the work that we're doing to encourage our semiconductor industry and the biomanufacturing, and I hope that's something that we'll continue to invest in. And so while the, this is a mandate heavy bill that probably does more to hurt jobs and hurt the economy than to grow jobs and to uh, unleash our economy. Um, I appreciate working on the committee, uh, but unfortunately I'm going to ask my members to not support this overall bill and hope it comes back better after conference committee. I recognize the author of the bill, the member from Hennepin, Representative Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you everyone for this great debate. We've been at this for a while. I guess we, you can say that we all care about economic development, workforce, and labor, because we've been talking about this for the last maybe five hours or so. Um, someone said we didn't do our job. We did our job. We heard bills. We heard from our communities from across the state. We heard their needs, and we, we responded with a bill that is comprehensive, transformational, and intentional about equity. Please vote green. Thank you. I recognize the member from Stearns, the Minority Leader, Representative Damoth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I agree, members, with a number of the comments from my colleagues that this bill is actually a wasted opportunity. It's an economic development omnibus that won't spur economic development, and it's a workforce omnibus bill that does nothing to help our workforce shortage in the state. And Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering if Chair Zhang would yield to just a question. He will yield, Representative Damoth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, on lines 8.29 through 9.2, it creates an Energy Transition Advisory Committee. Chair Zhang, can you tell me when that was heard in your committee? 
I recognize the member from Ramsey, Representative Shang. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Leader Damoff, that was actually uh, heard in the Economic Development Committee, and that is part of the big workforce economic development bill. Representative Damoff. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I do have concerns that there were um, this provision that I mentioned and a couple of other provisions that either weren't heard in committees or were heard in different committees. Um, we won't focus on that. You know that we did try to divide the amendment um, to separate out that um, nursing home workforce standards board that was Article 8. We gave everyone in the chamber an opportunity to vote no and to remove that from the bill. Unfortunately, that did not happen. As you've heard from the beginning of session, the importance of nursing homes and the crisis that they are facing. And there has been nursing homes, as you've heard multiple times tonight, that have, are close to closing or they already have closed. We're going to be discussing nursing homes at length tomorrow, I'm sure, during the HHS bill. But again, this was an important provision that we could have pulled out of this bill tonight, and we didn't. So members, if the nursing home standards portion of the bill wasn't enough to vote no, I would still recommend a no vote on this bill. Thanks to Representative Meckland, who tried to remove Article 15. That would have made this bill a little bit better, but that was failed. Again, this bill is, not, is an economic development omnibus bill that won't spur economic development, nor will it bolster our workforce. So members, I would encourage a no vote tonight. I recognize the member from Hennepin, the Majority Leader, Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minnesota has low unemployment rates, a diverse workforce, and an unmatched commitment to education and innovation. But we can't take our success for granted, and we know many families are not sharing in the success, and that we have the nation's worst racial disparities related to unemployment. That means we need to continue investing in our workforce, job creation, and economic development. This bill invests in grants for job training in clean energy and other high need areas so that workers can learn the skills they need to succeed in the 21st century economy. This is improving jobs for Minnesotans. It increases access to capital to start and run businesses, including those run by women, people with disabilities, BIPOC communities, and low income Minnesotans. This is helping us grow jobs. We ensure that employers who violate labor laws are held accountable and we take a back seat to no one in centering worker safety. The nursing home and meatpacking facilities provisions, in addition to the refinery and warehouse worker bills passed earlier today, will help ensure that all Minnesotan workers are safe on the job. I want to thank Chairs Nelson, Zhang, and Hassan for their hard work in putting together an excellent bill. Please join me in voting green to support working families, to support organized labor, and to support equitable opportunities for more people to share in our state's success. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 61 nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 100. The clerk will report the bill. House File Number 100, Number 4 on the calendar for the day, an act relating to cannabis, the 10th engrossment. I recognize the member from Anoka, Representative Stevenson, to explain the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Well, this is the bill to legalize adult use cannabis in Minnesota. Members, it's time. Minnesotans deserve the freedom and the respect to make their own decisions about cannabis use. Our current laws have failed. We have decades, decades of data to support that conclusion. They're doing more harm than good. 
Minnesotans want a different approach to our cannabis laws, and this bill delivers. Now, the bill has been through 16 committee hearings just this year. That's right, I said 16 committee hearings uh, this year, and I think probably almost every member in the chamber has had the opportunity to look at it in committee, so I won't go into the details now, but I'm looking forward uh, to a great uh, debate on the bill tonight. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Stevenson moves to amend House Bill number 100, the 10th engrossment. The amendment is coded A95. The member for Minoka, Representative Stevenson, to your amendment. Uh, Madam Chair, or Madam Speaker, excuse me. Uh, the, I'm glad we can start tonight uh, with a little bit of levity and a little bit of uh, gratitude. Uh, the A95 amendment uh, says that if any uh, police dogs are retired due to the passage of this bill, they have to be uh, first offered to our wonderful staff. Uh, and, you know, we're not going to, I'm not going to ask the chamber to vote on this amendment. Uh, this amendment was just really an opportunity to talk about how wonderful our staff is uh, and how above and beyond doesn't even begin to capture the work uh, that they did on this bill. I heard some people chuckling when the clerk reported the bill and he said it was the 10th engrossment. And for people who don't know who are watching, that means that this is the 10th version of the bill, okay? And each time we have an engrossment, our staff have to prepare that, they have to write the amendments, they have to process them. There's so much work that goes on behind the scenes and so much work that's been done on this bill. I mentioned 16 committee hearings this year. There were 13 in 2021. This bill is the 10th engrossment. The bill in 2021 made it to the 9th engrossment. So think about the amount of work that went into that from our staff. And I want to thank every single researcher who ever touched this bill, of which there are many. I want to thank Emily Adrians, our House Fiscal uh, Analyst, Jack Dockendorf, my LA, Simon Brown, my CA, but most of all, the incredible, the fantastic, the wonderful Ben Johnson, the House Reacher, who's responsible for the overwhelming majority of the words in this bill. If I could give each and every one of you a puppy, I definitely would, uh, but we're not going to do that today, so I'll withdraw the amendment. Representative Stevenson withdraws the A95 amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Baker moves to amend House file number 100, the 10th engrossment. The amendment is coded A91. The member from Candy, Ohio, Representative Baker, to your amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, um, I offer up the A95, excuse me, A91, excuse me, um, to highlight the importance of understanding what fentanyl strips are and the need for us to get them in retail stores. As you all know, fentanyl is killing people daily in Minnesota. And we need to do a better job getting the harm reduction tools in our hands. Uh, and one of the ideas that I've been working with, again, with colleagues across the aisle, I want to thank many of you for doing that, um, is to make sure we put them in areas and locations that people might be most either at risk or possibly in an area where they might be using uh, maybe alcohol alongside of other uh, things if someone is in active use. So members, um, um, I, I hope this is going to be a friendly amendment to the author. Uh, this is important. We're offering uh, fentanyl strips available in liquor stores and other fine retailers, but we want to make sure we have them for sale. This is an important part of, of getting in front of people where we think they're most vulnerable. So um, with that, I hope that our our uh, members see this as a friendly, and I look forward to hearing from our chair, uh, Rep. St uh, Stevenson. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Senator Murrah. Try a different microphone. Yours is not working. This one? Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, Speaker. Thank you, members. Thank you, Representative Baker, for bringing this amendment. Uh, I've, talking, I've t talked to the author of the bill, Representative, who uh, died from fentanyl. Um, she was you know, using a substance that she did not know had fentanyl in it. Um, and that day, she had actually texted someone to say, does anyone know where I can get fentanyl strips? Um, so, you know, there's lots of things that we can do around harm reduction, uh, lots of things that we can do around education about really the dangers of fentanyl and it, you know, it's in lots of substances when people don't know that. Um, but I think in the meantime, making fentanyl strips more available, trying to remove some of the stigma around fentanyl strips is really important. I want to thank Representative Baker for 
making sure that this amendment is not just about dispensaries, but also, you know, about liquor stores. We know that there's not evidence that people who are partaking in marijuana are more likely, you know, to um, use a substance with fentanyl than people who are, you know, partaking in drinking alcohol. Um, but we need to get fentanyl strips in more places. It's one of the harm reduction measures we can do. So please vote yes for this amendment. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, the member from Isanti, Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, if Representative Baker would yield for a question. He will yield, Rep Representative, Representative Doubt. Representative Baker, thanks for your leadership on these issues over the years. You really are an expert on this. And as somebody who doesn't even, you, you mentioned in your opening remarks uh, that you were going to tell us what these were. I don't know. Could you tell us just a little bit about what fentanyl strips are and why they're important? Representative I, Baker. I'd, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. And, and, and thank you, members, and Representative Doubt for this. Um, Fentanyl strips are just that. They're a strip. You open up a, like a, a foil package. I have some outside of my office. If there's a little box, if you haven't seen it there, I've got a, a, narc bo a, a naloxone box, and I've got some fentanyl strips in there. If anybody wants to take one, just help yourself to that, along with Narcan. But I will tell you what this is, is it's a, it's a strip that we legalized last year so we could carry them with us, because prior to a year or two ago, they were considered paraphernalia. And we thought people that had them we're using it in for bad reasons or, or purposes of, of uh, selling and testing. A fentanyl strip is a strip, like almost like a test strip, like you would do a, a pool sampling. You scratch it on a pill, you scratch it, you put it into a, 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 a powder form or something. Again, I've never used one, uh, but I've read the, the, the uh, instructions on the back. But if you scratch it and it comes up a certain color, that means it's got fentanyl in it. You want to stay away from it. It's not perfect because pills sometimes have fentanyl deeper inside the pills, but if people want to break it apart a little bit, they'll know it's, it's, it's one piece of a very complicated uh, component to make sure people at least, if they're in using this, if they're trying to do this, if they want to stay healthy and stay alive, it's another option. So we want to get them out for more. But thank you for the question, Representative Doubt. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails, the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. West moves to amend House Law Number 100, the 10th and Grossman, as amended. The amendment is coded A93. The member from Anoka, Representative West, to your amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The A93 amendment deletes the two-driver requirement for hemp products. Currently, as we legalized in the last session, uh, hemp edible THC is delivered to gas stations, all sorts of other stores with the same as anything else. This bill, as it stands right now, treats it like it's a, a, some sort of incredibly dangerous narcotic. Deleting the two-driver requirement is completely reasonable. As we've already seen, it's operated in a full year of legalization with hemp edible THC. And there's no reason to have two drivers to maintain security because it's, it has not, hasn't been an issue here and it continues not to be an issue. And I hope that we can accept this amendment. The member from Anoka, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speakers and members. Thank you, Representative West. Uh, this is a good amendment. It's a good idea. Please vote yes. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. <clears throat> Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Robbins moves to amend House Law number 100, the 10th engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A111. The member from Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, this is a simple amendment, and I hope... Um, it will be accepted, but I forgot, before I forget, I'd like to ask for a roll call. Representative Robbins requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So basically, this, bill, this amendment just prohibits the director of the Office of Cannabis Management from registering as a lobbyist after they leave the position at the Office of Cannabis Management. Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Speaker, this is a good uh, amendment, a good government perspective. I encourage a yes vote. Any further discussion? Thank you, I look forward to a green board. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 130 ayes and zero nays, the amendment is, the motion prevails, the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk, the clerk will report the amendment. Mueller moves to amend House File Number 100, the 10th engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A-106. The member from Mauer, Representative Mueller. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And before I forget, I would like to request a roll call on the amendment, please. Representative Mueller requests a roll call. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Mueller. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do want to be able to just kind of read very briefly what this amendment does. It says, say, that um, we are not allowed to have any type of school bus or Head Start bus, that uh, a person who drives that bus cannot have any consumption of alcohol, and we are adding cannabis flour, cannabis product, artificially derived cannabinoid, and the big long word that I can't pronounce, which also has to do with cannabis. Now, members and Madam Speaker, we do know that right now there is no current test to make sure that we are not um, have any, uh, like a roadside test like we do with alcohol for cannabis um, that our uh, law enforcement officers can use. Since we have such a high standard for our school bus drivers, the ones that take care of our most vulnerable, um, our children, and since we have such a high standard with them and um, a, a, an element that we already have a roadside test, seeing that we don't even have the technology to see what's going on here, I think that it is very wise and prudent for us to hold to a very uh, high standard of making sure that we don't have any type of um, cannabis in our system. We've heard statistics that cannabis can stay into your system for up to 30 days. And so that means that we want to make sure that those who are going to be driving our school buses, who are in charge of our children, that they are held to the same standard as alcohol, which is zero tolerance whatsoever. So with that, members, I would ask for a green vote. Thank you. The member from Anoka, Representative Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Mueller, for the amendment. I'll encourage members to vote uh, yes. In particular, I'll note that school bus drivers have commercial uh, CDLs, uh, which under federal rules means they can't consume cannabis. Uh, so I think this is a good amendment. I'd ask for a uh, yes vote. Do you still like a roll call? Representative Robbins. Thank you, members. And um, I, I just want to rise in support of the Mueller amendment quickly. I know that... Um, there is um, the CDL federal requirements, but I just want to point out that these amendments were offered in committee and failed, so we want to make sure we get this on the record that we want our school bus drivers to have zero tolerance, so that's why we're asking for this amendment. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. <clears throat> there being 130 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails, the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Gilman moves to amend House File Number 100, the 10th engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A-109. The member from Meeker, Representative Gilman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Can I please request a roll call just to get things started? Representative Gilman requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Gilman. Thank you so much. So I'd like to explain my amendment here a little bit um, and why it would be, be very important and very proactive for Minnesota to do an environmental impact study. Um, there is a Clark Hill packet that's been handed out or is getting handed out right now. And um, I'll just note some of the concerns and the side effects um, associated with cannabis. So pesticide usage is um, one that we've just done a lot with in committee and in our environment committee. Um, and just, you know, taking seriously the, the repercussions of pesticides when used next to bodies of Water, um, direct, it can be a direct threat to wildlife and fish. 
uh, also to consumers and employees because it's an so it's still classified, of course, as a legal drug uh, to the federal government. So the EPA hasn't approved any pesticides. So that's a big concern. Um, there's land use and habitat impacts, waste management issues, water issues, um, and two of them being it's hard to obtain sufficient supply of water. And two, how do you process water discharges? So for an outdoor grower, um, one plant, guess how many gallons of water one plant would take per day to um, maintain a healthy, viable plant? Two, good guess, six gallons a day. And this is six gallons a day per plant. And this is for outdoor use. We live in Minnesota. And of course, we believe that we're going to have a lot of, a lot of indoor growth. Um, operations happening. So um, that could place a huge significant demand as we've talked about in sustainable infrastructure um, and as we've seen in our bonding bill that's come through the house, water, water facilities, water treatment plants, and um, the chemicals coming back as well as um, just needing more infrastructure. The biggest thing I want to just take a peek at real quick is the energy usage. That's on page four. Just a, a quick thing, I'll talk about Denver. I won't read through it all, but I do want you to really understand the heavy use and the heavy electrical load that's going to be needed, such as UV lights, up in, because we're talking indoor growth, up to 16 hours per day, irrigation systems, HVAC systems, air filtering to manage the humidity and the um, plant organic odors, which some might really enjoy. Um, in Denver, for example, the portion of electricity used um, to, grow, to their grow operations doubled in the first three years. So after legalization, approaching 5% of their total electric, electricity use in the whole city, which is 2.8 million people. Um, the reason I bring this up is because we've talked a lot about climate change. We've talked about how we can combat that, how we can be responsible and um, be good stewards of the land. And um, it's estimated that 0.5 to 15 million metric tons per year will happen, which is roughly equivalent to adding 3.3 million cars to the road. So I think this is significant. I think it's being really, again, I just want to go back to this. I think it's really responsible to be proactive in Minnesota. Um, I had a great um, high school page. Andrew asked me a quick question today on how we can, how come this body doesn't work together? Well, we've seen a few green boards. I wore a green shirt. We're talking about a green thing, and I'd really like you to vote green. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Gilman. Uh, I agree with your uh, idea that we need to focus on the environmental impacts of cannabis, which is why the bill does contain a number of provisions related to this. It includes rulemaking authority related to many of the subjects uh, that you reference. Uh, I actually think that there is a, a world in which we could make uh, an EIS make sense uh, for this bill, but your amendment so far, I think, isn't quite there. Among other reasons, it asks for an annual EIS, so not one time or after a couple years. We want to do it every single year, and I just think that that's probably not the approach we need to take at this time. So for today, I'm asking for a no vote. Discussion. Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. <clears throat> there being 60 ayes and 70 noes, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. 
There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Robbins moves to amend House File Number 100, the 10th and Grossman as amended. The amendment is coded A113. Representative Robbins. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I think there's been a mistake. That's the Nash Amendment. So I will um, uh, allow him to speak to the amendment. Representative Nash, would you like to speak to the A113? <laughs> thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the A13, I would request a roll call on. Representative Nash requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this is very simple in uh, the bill. It, it allows for, I believe, two ounces to be um, effectively transferred without, uh, without cost from one person to another. And I would like to, looking forward at some of the future bills that you have, have the people who are the transferor and the transferee retain a copy or a record of the transfer as described in paragraph A uh, and any of those attachments for future records for 20 years from the date of transfer. So I would, uh, I would, I think this is uh, by the standard that you're bringing forward to us in a in a bill. I think is coming up one day this week. Uh, I think that that's an excellent uh, model uh, to see how you feel about the transfer of uh, of cannabis. Representative Stevenson. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Nash. I too am eager to debate the universal background check uh, bill and look forward to that vote uh, tomorrow. But different problems require different solutions. I'd ask for a no vote today. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. Is this one okay? There being 57 ayes and 71 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. New Brindley moves to amend House File 100, the 10th and Grossman as amended. The amendment is coded A110. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, I think there are actually a lot of people in this chamber, uh, maybe not all, but I suspect most people in this chamber, um, would would agree with decriminalizing marijuana, certainly for personal use, um, but decriminalizing marijuana generally. And in fact, that is in many ways effectively the policy of our state. Um, it, the data that I've seen says that there are literally 34 people in prison right now for crimes related to marijuana, 34. So it is effectively decriminalized in the state of Minnesota already. Uh, However, there are still plenty of people who have uh, marijuana crimes on their record and marijuana-related convictions on their record. And so this bill, this amendment literally gets rid of the massive atrocity that is House File 1. <laughs> it, it deletes the vast majority of this bill, uh, but it keeps that expungement language. It says that we are not going to criminalize uh, substance use, and we are also going to expunge the criminal records for convictions related to uh, possession of, of cannabis. And I would ask for a green vote. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, uh, Representative New Brindley. I'm really glad to see the consensus building about the need to undo the harms of uh, 50 years of failed uh, criminal justice policy around uh, cannabis, but we need to go further than this. Uh, and so I would ask for members to vote no. Among other reasons, I would point out that while this would allow for the expungement of current uh, cannabis convictions, you delete the portions of the bill that prevent future cannabis convictions. So uh, it, it doesn't really stop the cycle that we're on. So I'd ask for a no vote. Representative New Brindley. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. As I, as I just said, I mean, it, we effectively have a decriminalized policy in the state of Minnesota right now. To say, so to say that it wouldn't uh, be in effect moving forward is just not true. I mean, again, there are 34 people in the entire state of Minnesota in prison for any marijuana-related offenses, and none of them None of the 34 are in prison exclusively for marijuana-related offensive. It's a red herring. It's just not true. It's not something that is happening now. However, it was a problem in the past, and those folks uh, deserve that expungement. But the rest of this bill goes way too far and has far too many problems to think that House File 100 is the solution. So here is your opportunity to acknowledge that, yes, there are plenty of, of uh, marijuana-related convictions that should be expunged without, without going to the ridiculous lengths that House File 100 goes to. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Seeing no further discussion on the amendment, the clerk will take the... All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. West moves to amend House File Number 100, the 10th and Gross one as amended. The amendment is coded A97. The member from Minoka, Representative West, to your amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the A97 amendment grandfathers in existing hemp businesses. And as this body did last session, we legalized hemp edible THC, which has demonstrated that we can have a safe, intoxicating THC market in this state. It's gone pretty well, I would say. These businesses have grown dramatically. They're employing hundreds of Minnesotans. And now under this bill, these hemp businesses that they assumed we passed a law and they assumed that'd be the law for more than five minutes. But now we have this bill that makes many of the products they currently sell illegal. It puts onerous regulations on them. And now they invested all this money and suddenly we're changing the rules five minutes later. So when they invested all this money, they didn't expect this to just change. And the way the bill is written right now, we've had a lot of discussions in committee about what this does to the hemp industry. You've had a lot of testifiers in your committee in the litany of committee stops tell you what it's gonna to do to their businesses. So the perfect way to deal with this, the perfect way to deal with this is to grandfather them in. They invested this under the law we passed last session, and I know everybody over there voted for it. So I highly expect if it's good enough last session, it should be good enough this session, and it, they have demonstrated that they can operate safely. Now, I don't know why that would be suddenly different and it's incredibly unfair if you imagine that you invested $150,000 to start up a business, you hired three employees, and you're working to grow. And a lot of early businesses don't necessarily generate a lot of cash. So you start this up, and then the state completely introduces a 300-plus page bill that makes you, you're already not profitable, but this makes you incredibly non-profitable. The best way to deal with this is to grandfather those who trusted this state not to jerk them around, is to grandfather them in so they can continue to operate as they have. Because they have operated safely and there's no reason we should punish them by this, the way this bill stands right now. So I would ask that members support this, a vote for this amendment protects the many hemp industry uh, stores and retailers in your districts You've seen them, they're everywhere, and it doesn't make any sense to pass a bill just last year that, that is good enough that the majority party agreed was safe. That's why they all voted for it. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to just immediately change the rules because they've operated safely and they employ hundreds of Minnesotans and they've been a boon for this particular industry and have demonstrated that we can have a safe and regulated market. 
So I'd ask members support this amendment, and I'd ask for a roll call. Representative West requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Stevenson. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative West. You know that hemp-derived, low-dose industry is, I think, a good Minnesota success uh, story. I think they're doing uh, great and exciting things, and I think we all want them to continue uh, to prosper and grow, or most people want them to continue uh, to prosper and grow, and I think that we've done some great work on that, including uh, your earlier amendment tonight. I think this amendment goes too far. I think there are some important regulations that this would exempt uh, these uh, businesses businesses from, and, and I, I, I would encourage members to vote no, but we can continue to work, hopefully, on this issue as we go forward. Representative West. Uh, would Representative Stevenson yield for a question? He will yield. Representative West. Uh, I know you voted for this last time. What has particularly changed that you thought it was appropriate to legalize this, uh, legalize hemp edible THC as it is now, but suddenly that's not good enough? What, what changed between now and then? Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative West. Yeah, I, I still think it should be legal. I just think that we have uh, some guard rules that we can put on based on our experiences that have gone along. I think it makes sense. I think this is an appropriate uh, path that we're taking. Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It, that just seems like a pretty uh, slipshod lawmaking. I guess you can uh, blame your former majority leader for that one. Uh, I ask that members vote yes on this amendment. The member from Douglas, Representative Franson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Just to go back through little memory lane there. So industrial hemp has an interesting history through this body. And the, the member that is well known for pushing this movement is former state representative Phyllis Kahn. And I have to say, when I first got elected in, in the Ag Committee, she presented her bill. and. Um, she had these nice little um, truffles that were made with hemp. And I was a little leery because I didn't know too much about industrial hemp at that time. And the more that I dug in and the more that I learned about it, and the more that I got to know Representative Phyllis Kahn, I jumped on the hemp bandwagon. And we worked pretty hard in the, so that I was elected in 10, so 11, 12, and then 13, 14 um, is when we really pushed this legislation forward. And in fact, I had to do a lot of educating for my district, my previous district at that time, because there was a whole lot of people that thought that I was gonna be bringing the drug lords to Douglas and Ottertail County, and I had to do a lot of educating on industrial hemp. There was even a endorsement challenge because of industrial hemp. Um, as you can see, I won that endorsement challenge. Um, but then, it was uh, 15, I pushed forward, a lot of people thought, are you gonna leave the industrial hemp alone? And I said, oh no. Won my election, we are going to push forward. So Representative Phyllis Kahn and I, I authored the legislation. She signed on, I think, as a second um, co-author. And when the Republicans brought forward their egg bill, there was gonna be no amendments on the industrial hemp because they didn't want to put, the Republicans didn't want to put money on it. So Representative Phyllis Kahn and I put our heads together and we came up with a nice little, well, Representative Phyllis Kahn, you're going to offer the amendment and we're going to take money from the AUR, AURI program to fund the industrial hemp program. And if Representative Kahn authored the amendment, then my side of the aisle couldn't yell at me for offering an amendment they didn't want to accept onto the bill. So that's how that happened. The amendment went on to the bill and we got industrial hemp legalized here in the state of Minnesota. And so, all that hard work, working with the, the hemp growers over the years and making hemp a reality to see that the hard work that Representative Phyllis Kahn and I did being bastardized through legalized marijuana really saddens my heart. And so, I really do hope that the body rethinks their vote on this and supports 
Representative West's amendment. The member from Pope, Representative Anderson. Madam Speaker and members, um, this is a, is a serious issue. I recall when, when this bill was heard in the Ag Committee, uh, usually we don't pack the House in the Ag Committee, but the day this bill was heard, uh, we had standing room only. And I was expecting to hear uh, support after support for the bill, but I was surprised. As I recall, there were probably, I don't know, five or six hemp farmers who testified against the bill because of their concern with what Representative West mentioned, that their business would be very much adversely impacted by some of the provisions of this marijuana bill. I recall uh, such things as depreciation. They couldn't depreciate equipment, things like that. The banking was an issue. So yes, I support the, the West Amendment because we have a growing hemp industry in the state and uh, they would like to be kept outside of, of the regulations of this marijuana bill. So I would encourage a green vote on the West Amendment. Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Anderson brings up a really good point that I would like the chair to yield for a question, please. He will yield, Representative West. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Stevenson, uh, Representative Anderson brings up a very important point about uh, when we pass this bill, there's a big concern about hemp uh, being able to continue their uh, depreciation schedule that they currently have. And I would like to know uh, how you believe this bill affects that. Representative Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative West, I don't believe it impacts the depreciation schedule, and I think it's important to understand the bill says nothing about industrial hemp or hemp uh, growing, uh, manufacturing. Uh, if you're using hemp to make a topicals or a fiber or anything else, none of that is affected by this bill at all. Representative West. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and if uh, he would yield for one more question. He will yield. Representative West. Uh, I expect this amendment might not do so well, but uh, I would like to know, uh, do you plan on working with the hemp industry to make sure we improve this bill uh, in conference committee? Representative Stevenson. Madam Speaker, Representative West, I'm always looking to improve my bills. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Members, please vote. The clerk will close the roll. There being 54 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. West moves to amend House File Number 100, the tenth engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A94. Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Now, if you're watching from home, you might be excited that, hey, we're going to legalize recreational cannabis. This is great. This is what I wanted. But this bill isn't just legalizing recreational cannabis. It contains a litany of, frankly, far left ideology. So when you apply for a license, you'd expect them to make sure you have a well-operating business with a, a good profit and loss statement and a good security plan so that you can operate well. And this bill does have that. But there's a specific mandate in the bill that requires a social equity score. So they, they score your license on whether you get a license or not on your social equity status. And you might ask yourself, what does that even mean? Well, number one in section 17, so page 43 if you're following along, says uh, if you're convicted of a cannabis related offense prior to the effective date of this chapter. Well, actually, that's pretty good. I think. Uh, it would be great if we can repair the damage that was unnecessarily done to certain families. A service disabled veteran and National Guard, as well as any military veteran National Guard who lost honorable status due to a cannabis related offense. Well, I certainly would like to see them benefited as well. And there's uh, a resident of a, in a community of the last five years that was dis 
proportionately impacted by cannabis enforcement. Well, that sounds pretty good too. Or you're in an area with a poverty rate greater than 20%. And you gotta ask, well, now we're straying from a well-operating business. We're, we're targeting putting cannabis businesses in areas in high poverty. That's not ideal. You gotta realize that these cannabis businesses in states where it's legalized, even legal cannabis business, is a cash business. Which means they literally, the reason we have the two driver amendment exception for hemp is because they don't have this problem. But the reason there is a two driver requirement for cannabis is because they drive around loads and loads and loads of cash. And that has made them a target for burglary in many states. So I understand that your uh, social equity ideology is saying, oh, let's, let's make sure we put these in those areas. But you're not helping these communities by putting a cash business in those areas. You're inviting more crime. You're making their lives worse. Now we can do something to help them, but if, if you judge their license and whether they're allowed to operate a business on where they're from, well, that doesn't make any, that's ideological. That's not real policy making, that's fantasy land. We should be ensuring that those who apply for license, licenses can operate an effective business, and that should be the priority. Especially considering we've seen major burglaries in many states that have legalized recreational cannabis because it's a cash business. This kind of woke stuff is not what people thought when they thought uh, the DFL was gonna legalize recreational cannabis. They thought, hey, I can go buy weed now. This is great. I can't wait. But now you have this weird social equity ideology shoved into this where it has no business being. If you want to legalize cannabis, let's do it in a way that actually makes sense. You're hurting these communities by doing this. They can still get a license fair and square by operating an effective business plan. By stacking the deck and choosing winners and losers, it's unfair to other people applying for the licenses, but it also makes those communities worse that you're trying to help. So this needs to come out of the bill. And this is one of the things where you would have broad support. And especially, I know you have some trouble in the Senate. These, this is one of the biggest things that's a barrier there. Rather than hurting these communities, let them apply for a license, but well, they can compete on their own merits. They don't need this kind of deck stacking that's unfair and puts a target for burglary in communities that are already having a difficult time in this present environment. So I'd encourage your support of this amendment. Representative Stevenson. Oh, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Speaker. Members, I could say so much about uh, the issues that I have with this amendment, but I'm going to mention just two things. First, on a value premise, deleting social equity from this bill after Minnesotans have overwhelmingly asked us to be sure that our legal market is equitable for the people who are most harmed by prohibition would be irresponsible. We would be going against what the vast majority of Minnesotans who contributed to this three plus year conversation have asked us to do. Lastly, just on a basic policy premise, this amendment offers no definition for the term in need of economic stimulus like there is for the definition of a social equity applicant. This is absolutely not what Minnesotans have asked us to do as we stand up the best model for full legalization in the country. There is every moral reason to keep this in our bill, so I would ask you for a no vote. Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Hansen yield for a question? She will yield. Representative West. So in the latest poll in Minnesota, 53% of uh, Minnesotans support legalization, which I agree, the majority of Minnesotans support legalization. Uh, where do you come up with overwhelmingly Minnesotans support legalization with the social, e social equity ideology. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Representative West. 
As a former leader in the cannabis community, I traveled the state for a number of years talking to Minnesotans border to border. Our previous majority leader in our caucus did the same, traveled around the state talking to Minnesotans about what they wanted to see out of a legal industry. And what I was taught is that the world's run by people who show up. And the people who showed up to make sure their voices were heard on this bill were overwhelmingly asking us to continue to pursue justice. And that's what defining social equity applicants do in a good legal market. Representative West. So the people who show up to a Democratic event support Democratic policies is all that means. That's not what Minnesotans want. Fifth, only 53% in the latest survey support it. 36% oppose it. The vast majority don't really care. So it's in incredibly disingenuous to say that they overwhelmingly support this unfair left-wing ideology licensing scheme. It, th that, is, uh, that is absolutely untrue. And the, the worst part is, is that it harms the communities that this is supposed to help. And we want to help those communities. They can get a license the same as everyone, but by targeting it in areas where this is going to be an issue, where it's a cash business, is actively harmful to what you're trying to do. And Minnesotans definitely don't overwhelmingly support that. Thank you. Member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, members. Representative West, I appreciate uh, bringing this amendment forward. We talked about this in a couple of the committees where this bill uh, came before us in uh, the state government finance and I believe the economic development. Um, what I heard from across the aisle is that, you know, this is a payback to campaign supporters is really what, what it is that only you're gonna be able to get licenses if you support us. Um, and I think that is a moral reason to oppose, to oppose this provision in the bill. And it's further evidence that this bill is not ready for Minnesota. This bill is not ready for Minnesota when it's picking winners and losers in who gets to participate in the economic opportunity of cannabis. Minnesotans that support cannabis didn't say, I support cannabis only if certain favored people, select people, can be buyers on the wholesale or retail level. In fact, I know a guy in my district, longtime marketing guy, that's his main career, or his only career right now, but he decided he was going to maybe hedge a little bit and explore further capitalistic entrepreneurial opportunities and below his marketing business, he opened up a CBD shop. And it was, he was, he's been losing money for three years already. But because of use of his own capital, his own knowledge, he's, he's educated himself on these issues and the, and the cannabis and the hemp, and he's making a bet or taking on the capitalistic risk to be able to one day expand use of his shop to also include cannabis products. But because of this bill that's not ready for Minnesota, but because of this bill that favors some and not others, he's gonna continue to lose money and be prohibited from participating in this market. That's not American, that's not Minnesotan. This bill is not ready for Minnesota because of this provision and so many other provisions similar to it and others in this bill. Some people might say that Minnesota is ready for cannabis, but this bill isn't ready for Minnesota. The member from Douglas, Representative Franson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Hansen, uh, Hansen J yield to a question. She will. Representative Franson. Thank you, Representative Hansen. So this, this is very interesting to me, this dialogue on um, uh, where people want to put uh, cannabis stores up. Could you, this body has done a lot of discussions about uh, payday loans being in low income areas, um, liquor stores um, being in low income areas. 
as well as um, there's discussions on even dollar stores popping up in low-income areas, and uh, people feel that is predatory as well. Could you explain to the body, like, what is the difference of, you know, um, having cannabis stores in in um, low-income areas and just just help us understand, like, I see that as predatory myself. Um, could you walk us through your line of thinking? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Representative Franson. As somebody who grew up in poverty, I'm happy to talk about what it's like. We're just like everybody else. We consume a healing plant. We, there's liquor stores. A lot of times there's food deserts. It's hard there. So every opportunity for economic development matters. And for anybody else who grew up in poverty, you'll know that there are probably some legacy cannabis businesses in a lot of areas of poverty. And making sure that we are prioritizing and giving people opportunities to profit from a business that has intentionally harmed black and brown people for a number of years and black and brown people who are disproportionately represented in pov communities experiencing poverty, this is important. It's important to make sure that we are doing our part to right the wrongs of the past. And deleting social equity applicants from this bill is not the way to go about it. Representative Franson, further discussion? Any further discussion? Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Hansen yield to a question? She will yield. Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it has just occurred to me that I only addressed your first statement, which was that people overwhelmingly support it, and really, uh, Democrats overwhelmingly support Democrat policies, as you mentioned. But this isn't the broad uh, swath of Minnesotans. Minnesotans support cannabis legalization, as do I, but this social equity program is not it. Uh, but my question is the second point you brought up. There's no definition of being in need of fiscal stimulus. or What is the consequence of that not having a definition? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Representative West. Um, I just want to first say that it's not just Democrats that support Democrat policies. As a leader in this movement, there were thousands of people that participated in our events, in our movement, in our rallies, and in lobbying the members of this chamber and the other to make sure that we could advance a policy that works for everybody. And I guarantee you, many, many people in the organization I worked with were certainly not Democrats. So it was not just Democrats who supported this policy, just to set that record straight. And the lack of the inclusion of a definition for something in a policy means that it is left up to whoever is interpreting that law to define that. And I think I've heard over and over in this body in my couple of years here that we want to be sure bills are ready for prime time. That's a common thing I hear a lot of people say. And I've been in a position where my bill has lacked a definition and I've been asked by my colleagues to make sure I include that. And so I think that's a fair and responsible way to make sure we're advancing public policy. Representative West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, so there is no consequence, and that's why I agree. It's just in need of fiscal stimulus. The Office of Cannabis can determine with that what they will, and we can make sure we help people. But the social equity portion of this bill is just woke nonsense that is completely unnecessary. We can legalize cannabis without doing this complete and total nonsense. So I'd urge members to support this amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, uh, in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Baker moves to amend House File Number 100. The tenth and gross one has amended. The amendment is coded A99. The member from Candy, Ohio, Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, members and Madam Speaker. Uh, this is a uh, this is an important amendment. I want you to. Uh, we'll have some conversation about here. Uh, my my uh, amendment is asking you to. Um, 
consider rising, raising the, to the age of 21 to the age of 25. And this is an important one, so I want you to understand why this is so important. We have heard through the last 10, 15, 20 years with the really diving in deep with the opioid epidemic and how it is affecting people that went in for a, a, an opioid pill with an injury uh, and it's affecting and how it has affected people that still have a developing brain. And science, if you're a science person, this is where you need to listen to what the scientists are saying. Anybody under the age of 25? Thank you. Anybody under the age of 25 is extremely susceptible to a far greater um, negative out outcome when you're using a substance that is uh, affecting the neurons in the brain. So I'm asking um, members uh, to please consider raising the, the legal age of this bill to 25 from 21. And I want to make sure that we do it in a way that let's get it right out of the gate. Because if it goes in now at 21, it ain't changing. But we know more today than we did back in the 30s when, when we decided alcohol ought to be 21. So just because we're doing it, because that's the way alcohol is teed up, and that's what we're used to, let's be that state that recognizes what we know today to be way more cognizant of, of how dangerous this is for somebody with a brain that's not developed. So I hope members look at this important amendment to um, recognize this uh, uh, for, our, for our youth going forward. Thank you. Discussion, Representative Hansen. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, my friend, Representative Baker. I appreciate this amendment. And while we receive research that tells us more and more about brain development every day, it's important to note that we allow 21-year-olds to legally consume toxins like alcohol, nicotine, and tobacco. We allow 18-year-olds to gamble, join the military, work in dangerous facilities, um, you know, and to serve those toxins to other people, and in my opinion, one of the more dangerous ones to get married, right? Um, <laughs> unless and until we are going to stop all potentially life-altering decisions from happening before 25, we really can't start with cannabis. Um, because as a reminder, cannabis has no lethal dose on its own. It's, non, it's a non-toxic substance on its own, unlike things that we already have in our society. Also, our goal is to shut down the legacy cannabis industry and to bring things above board. And this would hinder our goal in that, uh, that mission and would contribute pretty significantly to actually keeping the legacy market alive and relevant for those who are under 25 because I'm the mom of an 18 year old and I can tell you that they absolutely have unfeathered access to cannabis right now. We have no idea the amounts, we have no idea about a lot of the things in it. And so if we're really serious about making sure that we're protecting our kids through a regulated and legal safe market, then that means that we pass this bill today. Thank you. I'd ask for a no vote. Discussion. The member from Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I rise in support of the Baker Amendment. Thank you, Representative Baker, for not only this amendment, but for your hard work on um, opioid addiction, the fentanyl crisis. You have been a leader in this state for a long time on these issues, and I appreciate it. Members, um, we have passed out a number of, of things tonight. One is um, letters in opposition that is about substance use disorders and health concerns. And then another piece that I just sent around now, Minnesota Ducks, um, please limit the harm from legal pot. And I'd, I'd like you to just take a minute, members, and look through those. I know we get a ton of paper around here, but these are really important um, opinions to consider. The, the one that's a, uh, from the Minnesota docs asking us to limit the legal harm from pot, this is by William Nicholson. He is the president of the Minnesota Medical Association. So this isn't Representative Robbins, this isn't Representative Baker, this is the president of the Minnesota Medical Association saying that um, we should not legalize it for people under 25. 
uh, research has, I'm quoting, research has consistently shown that human brain development and maturation is not complete until the age of 25. Therefore, individuals under 25 should be prohibited from purchasing, possessing, or using cannabis and cannabis-infused products. The Minnesota Psychiatric Association sent a uh, significant, very dense um, opinion piece with a lot of citations talking about the the dangers for brain development, for depression, anxiety, and psychosis for people under age 25. And we heard testimony, and I'm sure you guys have also received the emails, of people who have gone into psychotic episodes because of cannabis use and committed suicide. I have a mom who regularly emails me because this was what happened to her son, and she is begging us not to do this. Um, another piece that's really important to check out is from the Minnesota Society of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. They are also recommending that we do not um, legalize cannabis products for age, under age 25, and they go through some very detailed discussion of how it affects the synapses in our brains and can result in long-term psychosis and depression and anxiety. Members, we are, our, our young people in our state and around the nation are in a mental health crisis, and this will exacerbate it. And there are reams of studies about the impact of um, cannabis use on young people's brains. And so I know alcohol is 21, I understand the arguments, but this science is here in front of us and we didn't have it back then. And so members, we need to help our young people and I support this amendment. Thank you, Representative Baker. Further discussion, Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, Thank you, Representative Robbins, for pointing out many of the things in the packet that members uh, were given. Uh, these are the smartest people on this issue about how it affects others. You need to pay attention to this stuff because we do nationally with SAMHSA, we do nationally with, with the RX summits that we've been attending and the understanding of just substance use disorder and how much pain has gone through families <clears throat> of, of young ones and kids that have, had have tried this, they've gotten addicted, and they've lost so much time, members, when you're 17, 18 through 23, 24, and they almost kind of like are sitting in the parking lot for a few years at a critical time in their life. So our professionals in the world, our Hazelton friends, Project Turnabout, members from March that are, are looking at this every day. They're saying that is a critical piece of information. You're sitting here today thinking about passing a cannabis bill, recreational marijuana, with no THC limits when it comes with the flower. There are hybrids that are really potent. This is, this is a new kind of a marijuana. And I don't know why you won't seriously consider this request to start out the state of Minnesota at 25 years old. Be that state that takes it slow. Be the state that says, you know what, we know this today, and we know it better today than we did even five years ago, 10 years ago when other states were really rolling into this. Don't do it just because alcohol is at 21. Don't do it because it'll be easier for the retailers and the dispensaries. Because you know when it comes to the argument of the black market or the, or the uh, illegal market, as Representative Hansen was mentioning, it's not going away either way. It's gonna be around. And the closer we get to 21 means the closer it's gonna get down to the 17, 18, 16 year olds. But 25, I think you, you know, I remember when I was 25, I was married then. I was certainly not ready for that 19, 20, 21. There was a big transformation at that point. We uh, learn a lot in those few years in that 20 to 25 range. Members, the two most important letters in the packet are the ones from the parents that just reached out to me at the last minute. And if there were 100 families standing in this room all lined up, and they were to ask the question about what should we do with this age thing, 
95 out of 100, first of all, 95 out of 100 would say, we don't want this bill passed, period. But 98 out of 100 would say, at least listen to the stats. Don't go below the age of 25 because we know clearly now. Our kids found something earlier in life and it affected them much greater than they ever imagined. The one responsible thing to do here, members, is to take this amendment to conference. Taking it to conference allows us to talk about it further. Of every amendment I've ever carried on a bill like this, this is one of the most important because I'm telling you it makes a huge difference that four years from 21 to 25 will make all the difference in the world. I don't know why we can't take this to conference. Because once this gets out at that age of 21, nothing will change it as bad as things will get. The black market isn't going to go away. It hasn't on any other state. It's not going to here in Minnesota. So members, look at the packet. Look at what families are saying. Look at what our providers are saying. Madam Speaker, I think I forgot. I want a roll call on this, please. Representative Baker requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. With our, with, our, with our green or red votes, we can see who's paying attention to what the families are saying. We can pay attention to what we're hearing in committee. Chair Fisher, when we were in their committee this year, we heard a lot about this. We heard a lot about the 25 as a magical number. Please support what our professionals, what the science are saying. Please vote green on making the age to 25. Let's take it to conference and keep talking about it. Thank you, members. Any further discussion on the Baker Amendment? Seeing none, the clerk will... Please support what our professionals, what the science are saying. Please vote green on making the age to 25. Let's take it to conference and keep talking about it. Thank you, members. Any further discussion on the Baker Amendment? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 57 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Robbins moves to amend House Hall number 100, the 10th engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A101. The member from Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. This amendment um, simply deletes the money for the workforce grants and reallocates the appropriation to drug recognition experts. We had extensive conversation earlier and will again about um, the lack of a threshold or a standard for impairment with um, marijuana and also there is no roadside test available to test for intoxication. So given that, one of the reasons the Sheriff's Association and MPPOA and other law enforcement agencies oppose this bill is because there are studies that show it increases fatal crashes um, and injury crashes. There's a study from the National Insurance Institute uh, that says um, crashes for injury accidents were up 6% and fatal crashes were up 4% in the states that have legalized marijuana. Our fiscal note, however, refers to a Canadian study that shows crashes in Canada, fatal crashes, not just injury crashes, fatal crashes are up 15% members. So if we are going to be able to deal with the onslaught of um, harm from impairment and driving while impaired, we need more drug recognition experts to be trained for the state patrol and local police. And um, my police chief in Maple Grove um, and other chiefs put together some, some 
language about what that would need and they expected about 250 new drug recognition experts on the low end and they expected it would cost about $10 million. And I know that the bill does appropriate $10 million in the first year for um, the State Patrol, which is great, and $5 million in the second. But I, I, I guess I just have a question for the author, if he would yield. He will yield. Representative Robbins. Thank you. So thank you, Chair Stevenson. We've had these discussions before. But what, where I'm having trouble is there is the appropriation in the bill that's not really specific to drug recognition experts, but the fiscal note uh, take six million from the trunk highway fund that would provide for five drug recognition experts in the state patrol and then it provides 40,000 for training um, 200 officers which is incredibly low so how do you square the 10 million in appropriation with how the fiscal note says we're going to actually provide for drug recognition experts. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Robbins. The fiscal note predates the adoption of the amendment in Amazing Beans where we had uh, appropriated $10 million in the first year and $5 million ongoing, which explains that discrepancy. I would just note the fiscal note does clarify how much it costs to train a drug recognition expert. Uh, it's Four hours, they approximate, uh, it would cost $50 an hour, so we're basically talking about $200 uh, uh, per uh, drug recognition uh, expert. And then, it, as it mentions, there's the in instructor uh, time as well. So if you think about $10 million, that will fund an awful lot of drug recognition experts. This, I will note, is the amount that uh, members of uh, the minority asked for in several committees, and we did adopt it in the Ways and Means Committee because I thought it was a good idea, uh, and which is why I still think that that's the correct appropriation. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for that explanation, Chair Stevenson. And I do appreciate that the money is there, but when you look at the language of the bill, it really does not say for drug recognition experts. And the fiscal note, which I do have the most recent version of it, still says five drug recognition experts. So I would like to request a roll call on this because I think it's very important that we, we specify where this money is going to go. So thank you, members. Representative Robbins requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Further discussion? Representative Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Robbins, I'm just puzzled by the comment that the amendment, the language doesn't specify that. I'm looking at subdivision 21 of Article 9, starting on uh, line 297.30, and it says $10 million in fiscal 24 is appropriated for drug evaluation and classification program for drug recognition evaluator training, additional phlebotomist drug recognition recognition training for peace officers to define Minnesota statutes and so on. So I think it is pretty explicit in that section of the bill. As I mentioned, this is the amount that uh, the minority offered in several committees and that we adopted in Ways and Means. I think it's the correct amount. Uh, the money that you're appropriating comes from the grant programs, which will help uh, drive the industry. And so I, I would ask members to vote no. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do appreciate the additional funding Chair Stevenson, and I do appreciate the clarification, but just to be clear that this, the section you were reading from says that $10 million goes for lots of things, including drug evaluation and classification program for drug recognition evaluator training, additional phlebotomists, recognition training for peace officers, um, and I believe setting up uh, more toxology things. So I just want to make sure that we put the money where it's most effective, and that's the reason I'm asking for a green vote. Thank you, members. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report <clears throat> the amendment. Robbins moves to amend House File Number 100, the tenth engrossment, as amended. The amendment is coded A104. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, the A104 uh, sets a potency cap, and I think this is very important um, that we have this discussion. So, currently, as we've um, discussed, 
there is no test for impairment and there is no standard of what impairment is. And as Representative Baker alluded to in his uh, discussion of his amendment, um, the nature of marijuana has changed substantially. In the 1960s and 70s, marijuana was generally had a potency of one to three percent THC. Today's marijuana flower plant, because of breeding and other things, has now um, been 15 to 17 percent, but up to as high as 30 percent THC. And in addition, there are now waxes and concentrates that are extremely high concentration of THC. Back in 2008, concentrates averaged 6.7% THC. Now for edibles, they average 56% THC, but are often much higher. And in the vapes and the waxes, it can be to 90% THC. So members, these high concentration um, of ways to access THC are extremely harmful back to the under 25, especially to developing brains. And we, I, I won't read all the things in the packet, but I really encourage you to look at it, members, the Minnesota Psychiatric Association, the Minnesota Child and Adolescent uh, Psychiatric Association, the other groups I mentioned earlier, they all talk about this and they all request a potency cap, as does the head of the Minnesota Medical Association. This is not just something that Republicans are asking for. This is what our medical professionals in our state are asking for. And so members, um, we did not successfully limit this to 25 and under. I mean, to, to stop it for 25 and under. So since you didn't take that amendment, I am asking you to please take a potency amendment. We really need to um, limit the access that our young people are gonna have to these high potency uh, THC levels because it really is harmful to their brain development. Thank you. The member from Anoka, Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so bear with me here for a few minutes. I, um, at age 12, started getting really sharp pains in my legs and made it hard for me to stand for more than a few minutes. Cool thing about that is, um, you know, I got excused early to, for the lunch line, so I didn't have to wait for very long. Not so cool thing about that is when you're a 13-year-old girl in a body cast for a month, that kind of makes you stand out a little bit. Um, end of my seventh grade year, I had my first of three back surgeries. Um, I had 13 years between my first one and my second one, um, but between that first one and second one, my doctors told me about this great new pain medication that could help me live a normal life. Um, I was about 22 years old when I was first given Vicodin by my doctors. Um, after a few years, Vicodin wasn't enough to um, keep my pain at bay, and so my doctor gave me these handy-dandy 25 milligram fentanyl patches. So. Um, for most of my 20s, yeah, that was, that was kind of my life. Um, so pre-ACA then, I was denied health insurance because of this wonderful pre-existing condition that I had. So not only was I denied the care I needed, but then I also couldn't afford the pain medication that um, helped me make it through the day. Um, so the fentanyl was the more expensive one, so I let that one go. Um, two more back surgeries later, things were fine as long as I had um, my Vicodin pills with me. Um, you know, I wanted to start a family, didn't think that that was a good thing to be doing while I was trying to have a baby. So um, after about a year and a half of tapering, I got off of all opioids. Um, fast forward a few years, my back starts bothering me again. I'm taking 800 milligrams of ibuprofen a day, sleeping on ice packs while I'm chasing a toddler around. Then I do something really fun and cut my fingers off. Um, so after that, um, after my accident and he, many of my follow-up appointments with my surgeon, um, I asked about the medical cannabis program, um, and she suggested I give it a try. You know, um, in the 60s, our doctors weren't telling us about the, the, the benefits of cannabis. And so through trial and error, I found the product that best worked for me, not only to manage my back pain, but to reduce swelling, to help with um, a lot of the, you know, helping my, my joints up and moving in the morning and then helping me sleep at night. And the product that helps me the most has 85% potency. And so um, this really, this amendment really kind of um, it worries me because I want to make sure that I'm able to, to get the medicine that works best for my pain while not 
giving me the horrible side effects that the fentanyl and the Vicodin did. So I urge members to um, oppose this amendment. Thank you. Discussion. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, um, Representative Kegel, for sharing that story. And I, I've always been a strong supporter of the medical cannabis program, and I think it is working well, and I'm glad to hear it's working for you. But members, this is not about the medical cannabis program. This is about what we are legalizing and the high levels of concentration, primarily that young people will get through vaping and through waxes and oils. And members, I, I don't know where in the packet it is, but there's an article from the New York Times as well about this new phenomenon that's out there that's caused by these high concentrations where kids get something called hyper, um, oh, I'm gonna forget the name of it now, hyperemesis syndrome caused by cannabis. And they go into violent periods of throwing up and they cannot stop and they get hospitalized. Members, these high levels of concentration are what are um, contributing significantly to the psychosis episodes that our young people are seeing. So for, for people who benefit from it, there is the medical cannabis program and I'm glad it's there and available. But for people who will just be getting cannabis through the retail outlets, um, I really think we need to have this guardrail around it. So please vote green. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Robbins moves to amend House file number 100, a tenth engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A105. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And before I forget, I want to request a roll call. Representative Robbins requests a roll call. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. This is the A105, uh, which prohibits public transit drivers from having marijuana in their systems. It's similar to the school bus amendment that Representative Mueller carried. Again, this amendment was rejected in the Transportation Committee, and we want to make sure that we are on record as a body of having zero tolerance for our Metro Transit bus drivers and light rail drivers and people who drive Metro Transit um, dial -a rides and Metrolink services that we do not want to have them impaired. There is no, as I've said many times, no level of impairment, no standard of impairment in the bill, and no test for impairment. So we, we cannot risk our public who are traveling in our metro transit system by having impaired drivers. Please Repres vote green. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Representative Robbins. Uh, I think if this amendment was just confined to transit, it'd be one conversation, but as I'm looking at line 1.4 of this amendment, it says it's a crime for any person to operate a motor vehicle uh, a motor vehicle or vehicle that operates on rail to provide public transit. So I think this amendment would apply to anyone who's driving uh, a motor vehicle. Uh, that does not uh, work. We've had a discussion uh, here before about how uh, cannabis is detectable in your blood long after uh, it, impairment, uh, which is why uh, we have not adopted a zero tolerance uh, basis for uh, motor vehicles. Uh, that's a position that's supported by the nonpartisan DWI task force, among many other groups. So I'd ask for a no vote uh, on uh, the A105. Further discussion, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Stevenson. I had not had that objection to this in earlier uh, uh, discussions, but clearly the this, this statement is, it is a crime for any person to operate a motor vehicle or vehicle that operates on rail to provide public transit. So the operative phrase is to provide public transit. So it's whether you're driving a motor vehicle providing public transit or operating a rail vehicle that provides public transit, but it modifies both. So that is really uh, not a uh, uh, legitimate argument and we need to make sure that everyone who's riding public transit, no matter whether it's a vehicle or a rail car, is safe. So please vote green, thank you. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and uh, Representative Stevenson. That's not even, you're an attorney. Uh, read the whole sentence. It literally says uh, to provide public transit as defined in section 174.22. Uh, this is specifically only for those people who uh, are providers of public transit and operators of public transit. 
this is a good vote and we should be taking it. And don't let that excuse uh, by the author or mis misinterpretation or misrepresentation of this amendment by the author, author uh, sway your vote. Further discussion? Representative Robbins. Thank you, and to further amplify that point, I just want members to know that um, the section is entitled Cannabis-Related Transit Operations, and um, where it's a gross misdemeanor, it's a gross misdemeanor cannabis-related transit operation and a misdemeanor ca cannabis-related transit operation. In every instance, it's referred to as transit operation, vote green. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Robbins moves to amend House File Number 100. The tenth and Grossman as amended. The amendment is coded A114. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This amendment prohibits the Commissioner of Revenue from purchasing, leasing, or taking occupancy of a building for purposes of providing a facility to collect cash payments. And um, there's nothing in the bill that talks specifically about the Department of Revenue setting up a, basically a place to process cash payments. But when we were in the tax committee, this came out and I just was fascinated. The Department of Revenue, according to the fiscal note on page 133, wants to spend $1 million in the first year and then ongoing operations to have an offsite facility to collect cash payments. And when I asked about that, they said, oh, well, we're probably going to work it out and it won't be in the next iteration of the bill. But it was in the next iteration and it was in the next iteration of the fiscal note. So maybe they're still working it out, but I want to make sure that as a body, since it hasn't been worked out, we prohibit this. I, I found the, the fiscal note quite interesting, members, about why they want to do this. Um, and so uh, they assume that state charter banks will not work with um, the cash businesses who need to process their payments. And they also assume, obviously, it's illegal for federal banks to do it. And they also don't want it to happen at the actual Department of Revenue um, because they have concerns about the need for better security and safety for revenue staff and customers, the perception of the public stemming from the association with cannabis, and there's less traffic for customers to the location because it potentially won't be located downtown. It's going to be in one of our districts. And it will reduce the internal risk involving potential disclosure of and personal association of the people who work at Department Revenue with this cash business. Because as we heard earlier, an all cash business, as Representative West was talking about, brings crime. And they particularly point out that this is what Oregon is doing. Oregon has a state cash facility. And in the state of Oregon, state banks did not want to accept the funds, which is potentially going to happen in Minnesota as well. This requires large amounts of cash to be paid for cannabis returns. In Oregon, the paying parties regularly showed up fully armed. This would cause numerous concerns at the Department of Revenue. I'm sure it would. We also don't want fully armed people showing up in our districts or in the neighborhoods where these, where, um, these uh, uh, retail shops are, are, are being paid in huge sums of cash. There will be crime increases, as the revenue note um, suggests. So members, this clearly just states that that even though the bill is silent on this, that we do not want this to be happening. And 
at least until there's a much more full and public discussion of this. So members, I urge a green vote on um, stopping the setting up of a cash facility until we have better information or at least understand what their intentions are. Thank you. Oh, and I'd like a roll call. Representative Robbins requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Robbins. Uh, as you, you are correct, the bill is silent as to this issue, and I think it should stay that way. Uh, we have, so I'll ask for a no vote uh, on the, the, the bill. Uh, we are seeing more and more financial institutions engage with the cannabis business across uh, the country, and in fact, there's federal legislation pending that would allow federally backed uh, institutions to engage in this behavior. I encourage you to talk to your local congressman about how uh, helpful that would be, but I think that there's wide expectation that state-backed financial institutions will engage with cannabis businesses and that most of the returns will be done electronically, obviating the need for this facility anyway, but I don't think that we should ban it. I'd ask for a no vote. Further discussion? Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Will members, um, I am not comfortable leaving this in. The bill is silent on it, and apparently the chair uh, wants it to stay silent on it, which I find interesting. I think taxpayers would want to know that the state is setting up a cash processing facility that will cost a million dollars in the first year and 400 and some thousand dollars ongoing every year thereafter. So I think we need more transparency, and I urge a green vote. Thank you. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. <clears throat> there is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Robbins moves to amend House File Number 100, the tenth engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A100. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Um, this is the local control amendment. I, like probably most of you, have heard from many of my cities and um, the counties that really we. Uh, they are very frustrated with the lack of local control in this bill. And I appreciate that Chair, Chair Stevenson has made some strides from the original version of the bill to where we are now to uh, give a little bit of uh, a nod to local control, but it's certainly not what the cities and the counties would like. And so basically this, um, un under the current bill, cities cannot regulate the number of licenses in their jurisdiction like they do with liquor, and cities cannot revoke a license like they can with liquor. They can suspend a license, but they cannot revoke a license. They have to just complain to the Office of Cannabis Management and hope that the Office of Cannabis Management agrees with them. Um, furthermore, there are some restrictions in the bill. It can't be within a thousand feet of a school or a park that has a playground or a couple other things, but it doesn't mention churches. It doesn't have anything to do um, with um, odors or hours, that kind of thing. So um, this is a good amendment. It empowers your cities to do um, what their citizens want. So I urge a green vote and I ask for a roll call. Representative Robbins requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call discussion. Representative Stevenson. Oh, well, thank you, Madam Speaker, Representative Robbins. There's a series of amendments we'll be taking up now that have to do with local control. Uh, so I'll just say generally that the bill tries to strike a careful balance between allowing local unit governments to do the enforcement work that's necessary, allowing uh, them to set hours, allowing them to restrict its location with regard uh, to schools, for example, uh, allowing uh, them a number of, of uh, pieces of local control, but not allowing an opt out. And for example, when we talk about revoking licenses, we are careful to not give them the power to revoke, though they can suspend, because we don't want uh, local units of governments to opt out by revoking uh, licenses uh, without uh, good reason. We don't want opt outs. Um, um, for, uh, the, by having very restrictive zoning requirements, by having very restrictive licensing fees, which is why the licensing fee is specifically articulated in 
uh, that, that local units of governments can charge. So there's a careful balance in the bill that has been uh, maintained between having some local control but not enough to allow local units of governments to opt out. Why are we focused on not having the opt-outs? Because in states that have allowed opt-outs, that's where the illicit market continues to thrive and grow. We need to have a uniform set of can uh, cannabis standards across uh, the state to make sure that we're doing the best we can uh, to curb the illicit marketplace and move to a legitimate marketplace with consumer protections uh, and controls. So I don't support uh, the A100 amendment um, and the, the other amendments that have to do with uh, uh, allowing for opt-outs. Any further discussion? Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I urge a green vote. Um, our cities want local control. They have asked for it. Um, the little bit of progress that we've made is not enough. The citizens elect their city councils and their mayors to make these decisions so that it fits local, local culture, lo local sensibilities. And we saw that one size does not fit all in the pandemic. And we certainly don't want to have something um, like cannabis forced on our individual cities if they don't want it. If they want it, they can certainly you know, embrace it, but not everyone will want it. And as for the, it's sort of a red herring about the um, illegal market. I do understand your point, um, Chair Stevenson, but the bill is in effect creating the illegal market by allowing people to give away two ounces to anyone 21 or older at any time and growing up to four uh, flowering plants, eight plants total at home and keeping 1.5 pounds of cannabis in your home anytime. So, so we are, by the way the bill is allowing for, it's not, the, the proponents of the bill like to say, oh, well, we're regulating, we're testing, we're having retail licenses, it's going to be very regulated. That part is regulated. But when you can give away two ounces to anyone at any time who's over age 21, and you can have 1.5 pounds in your home, um, that is where the illegal market is going to come from, whether we have local control or not. And just so members understand how much this is, two ounces is enough for 168 joints, members. 1.5 pounds that you can keep in your home is enough for 2,043 joints, which would be the equivalent of six a day. No one's going to keep that much in their home and no one's going to pass that around. Members, we, the bill itself is creating the illegal market, and we should be able to empower our cities to have local control. Please vote green. Representative Baker. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Representative Robbins, for this. Uh, this is a really important one, and I hope you're paying attention to the, the need to bring this home to our local leaders that really actually care about this. You know, we really did a poor job, the legislature did last session, to roll out, um, you know, the, the edible cannabis, really messed it up, didn't give them any direction, no taxing, just nothing. And all we're asking for now is give us a chance to, to sort of set up our own system here if it's one or two, but, but you're not going to force them to not deny anybody. Let me remind you, there's still going to be a black market here after this bill passes. It's going to happen. No other state has stopped it. So don't think that what you're doing here today is going to stop it either. But why not give our local folks a little bit more um, credibility, a little bit more respect to allow them to set up what's important in that community? Come on, members. This is, this is a local control thing that you should get behind. We're going to need their help to do this right. And they know their communities better than anybody. Please support the Robbins Amendment. Thank you very much for bringing this forward. Let's, uh, let's do this for our local little towns. Thank you. Discussion. Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, as we have been debating this, I have um, local people that are texting me right now from my community constituents. And thank you for this amendment, Representative Robbins. I would like to support this and I would encourage a green vote. We have got to give our local communities more input. They are the ones that know the best of how to represent their community. Um, I have people that are texting me right now that are looking forward to the full legalization, but they are asking, they are desperate for local control. And so I would encourage a green vote 
on the Robbins Amendment. Any further discussion? Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, thank you about the cities and townships. Being a, a mayor, past mayor, I would have liked, I would like to have to be able to have an opportunity to vote on this as a community. Um, I can see why maybe perhaps a county would not, I mean, the county represents all of us inside, but the local units of government, a city, a township, we should be able to decide if we want uh, to sell this or not. Uh, when alcohol came, when it first came, they had the same opportunity and the state regulated it by how many bars could be in this community and how it was set up like that. But each community voted on how many they, they wanted. And, and, and I, think, I think that's reasonable. Um, that's one of the things I'm looking for, to, for me to come and support this bill. I really, I, I want to support this, but I really think that the local community should have a say. Um, I, I, a friend of mine gave me an example. It's like, well, it's like a candy bar. You know, they, you can buy them anywhere you want. You should be able to buy marijuana everywhere you want. But a candy bar is different. You know, it's, yes, it is a, it is a product and you should be able to go. Uh, I look at our tourism community, what I represent, and I truly believe that the, uh, from what I've talked to and the people in Canada, when it first got legalized, there were thousands of stores selling marijuana. Now there's hundreds. And what happened is the market will determine where the stores are going to be and what's going to happen. I mean, each community might want it, but I, I, I think if we give the, the cities and the townships, it'll settle itself out. It'll be decided who gets what, where, how, and uh, that, that should be part of this bill. And uh, I look forward to a green vote. Thank you. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I have been listening, but I don't think I heard anyone talk about the fact that, you know, there, there is actually a really pragmatic reason for local control over this. And, that, and that's that our local cities are the ones who are going to bear the brunt of the consequences of this. When there are increased public safety needs, those costs are covered by our local municipalities. They are the ones paying for additional law enforcement time. They are the ones paying for our local jails who are gonna to need to house people who have a problem, who are, who are driving intoxicated. There is a cost to our local communities, which is exactly why our local communities should have control over whether or not they want, they choose to incur those costs for the community. Local control is a basic principle that most of us agree with on both sides of the aisle. Most of us believe that our local communities should be able to make these decisions for themselves. You know, we also, we talked about how in committee, you know, we had a lot of really small towns around this state. And a lot of those small towns have unique identities. They have a community that does care, that is unique to their local city or township. And I get it, the big cities don't have that quite as much, although certainly they make attempts to do so, but that sense of community can get a little bit lost. But in these small towns where there is a real sense of identity and community, it could be that they just don't want it. And guess what? They shouldn't have to. If their local, if their local elected representatives and if the local constituents and people who live there don't want it, they shouldn't have to have it. It's just silly for us to force a community to take this on when one, they don't want it, and two, they certainly don't want the costs associated with it. This is a great amendment. Vote yes. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and if Representative uh, Stevenson would yield for a question. He will yield. Representative Doubt. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Representative Stevenson, I, I offered this same amendment in Commerce Committee. I know this bill made probably 12 stops, maybe more, after Commerce, so I've lost track of 
the different iterations of the bill, and I think you're on the, the 10th uh, engrossment, so um, I know the bill changed. At the time, as I recall, there was not even a provision that would allow a city to issue a license for this, which meant they could put no restrictions. Um, we do offer the ability for cities in our state statute to offer licenses for tobacco and for liquor. What is the current status of what's in the bill? Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Speaker, Representative Dowd, the bill actually requires uh, these uh, retail-facing businesses to get uh, local uh, licenses. Uh, they have to grant a local license if the license is granted by the state, but it's an enforcement mechanism. As I mentioned, there's a careful balance here between wanting some elements of local control and an ability to enforce and make sure the rules are being followed, but not allowing opt-outs. So the bill does require a local uh, license now. Representative Dowd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, if he would continue to yield, I would, I would like to know... Um, are they able to, to make some revenue off of that? Can they charge a license fee? Can they set specific hours? Can they deny a license? Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Speaker, Representative Dow, taking the last question first, no, they cannot deny a license if the license has been granted by the state. They can suspend the license if there's uh, evidence that they find the person is selling an illegal product or selling to minors, et cetera, but they can't deny it straight up. You asked about hours. They're, they can set hours limitations in the bills, and I believe Representative Nash maybe offered an amendment uh, to constrain that further to allow more hours uh, uh, impact. Sorry about that. Um, they, uh, and your first question was about uh, fees. And yes, they can charge a licensing fee. We spell it out in the statute. It's 50% of the amount that the state uh, can uh, charge. Representative Doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative. I appreciate the clarification. And it was, it was somebody was talking over here in the alcove, so I, that's why I was having trouble hearing you. It wasn't your fault. Um, if if uh, m members should really pay attention to this, um, if we're going to let local municipalities offer licenses, um, it's not that we're letting them offer it, it's we're requiring them to, to issue a license. Um, they have no choice. I mean, they have to issue the licenses. And, and as so many other members said uh, so eloquently, um, we shouldn't force a municipality to do this if they don't want to do it in their, in their city. Um, and we should let them uh, set the restrictions that, that they feel uh, are necessary uh, for this. So I would ask members to vote in favor of this, uh, of this amendment. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 59 ayes and 69 noes, the uh, motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <coughs> Robbins moves to amend House File Number 100. The tenth and gross one as amended. The amendment is coded A102. Representative Robbins. Thank you, members. I won't belabor it, but it's another local control amendment. Um, this one instead takes a population approach. So it says, based on the size of the population, um, cities over 10,000, cities over 5,000, cities over 2,500, or up to 2,500, they um, have certain amounts of licenses that they could issue. So I, again, for all the reasons already discussed, urge a green vote, and I ask for a roll call. Representative Robbins requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. There is an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. <coughs> Robbins moves to amend her amendment to House File Number 100. The 10th and gross one as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A116. Representative Robbins. Thank you, members. The amendment to the amendment just puts a little bit of a finer point on this. Um, and it, in addition to the, uh, the different tiers of cities and their populations, it also has a, a, a sentence saying that the definition of reasonable restrictions that local governments can impose that's in the current bill um, reasonable restrictions include, but are not limited to, standards regarding noise, smell, odor, 
hours of operation and location. This, again, was something suggested to me by the cities and counties. They have grave concerns about how this bill is going to impact the quality of life in their community, and they want to be able to regulate things like this, and they are asking for this. They, the, they do not support what's going on here today, but they want to at least be able to protect the quality of life in their cities as they see fit, and they're asking for this. So please vote green. Oh, and I'd like a roll call on the amendment to the amendment. Representative Robbins requests an, a roll call on the amendment to the amendment. Uh, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Stevenson. Um, Madam Speaker, I oppose the underlying amendment and the amendment to the amendment I don't think gets me to support, but we often extend courtesy to authors to get the amendments or bills in the shape they'd like to consider it, so I'm fine with a yes vote. I'd ask members to vote yes on the amendment to the amendment, but as a preview, I will be asking for a no vote on the underlying amendment. Further discussion on the amendment to the amendment? Uh, Representative Robbins, did you want to withdraw your roll call? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, I withdraw the roll call on the amendment to the amendment, but not the underlying amendment. All those in favor of the amendment to the amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The amendment to the amendment is adopted. On the underlying Robbins Amendment, Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Robbins, as I indicated, I'd ask for a no vote on this. Again, it's another local control issue, and again, we have a, a, a careful balance in this bill that this amendment would disrupt, so I'd ask for a no vote. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As members, we have gone over this. This is what our communities are asking for. Please support your local community and support the amendment. Thank you. Representative Scraba. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, would the author yield to a question, please? The author of the bill or the author of the amendment? R uh, Mr. Stevenson. Representative uh, he will Stevenson. yield. Representative Thank Scraba. Um, I missed it before. I wanted to ask, uh, being a small town and the license, you, you brought up the license, uh, you know, the, the, the city issues a license. Um, do we as a city have to uh, print the license, do all the license, uh, make the license up? Do we have a committee that reviews licenses? Do we do all of that? Or is it a state license that runs through the community? I'm, I'm curious. Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Speaker, Representative Scraba, the bill contemplates that the bulk of the licensing work is done at the state level, so they'll be the ones reviewing whether the person has met all the things they need to do to obtain a license, but they also need to achieve a local license and apply for that. As I mentioned uh, uh, when I was talking with Representative Dow, the city does not have discretion to offer that license if the state has approved a license, but they can then suspend the license if the uh, business is not in compliance with any of various state or local regulations. Representative Scraba. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm still confused because small communities cannot or do not have the ability to have licenses. I like a business license. There's a lot of communities that you just show up in town and you start a business. There's no city business license. There's nothing. It's just there. So <clears throat> what, I'm, what I'm curious about, Ma Madam Speaker, if I could ask him, continue the question. He will yield. Representative Scraba. How, how does a community that doesn't have licenses issue a license? Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Speaker, Representative Scraba, the bill says that the lo applicable local unit of government has to issue the license. So in some communities, maybe that's a higher level of government like a county. Uh, but in most pl places where you have a city unit of government that would license a liquor store or a tobacco shop, they would be the ones issuing that local license. Representative Scraba. Once again, um, I'm, maybe I'm not clear on the way I'm asking the question. Would he yield? Please? He will yield. Representative Scraba. So if a city does not have a license and the county is the next up, does the city have to go to the county to get the license for the business? Representative I'm, Stevenson. Madam Speaker, Representative Scraba, no. Uh, the, it's the applicable unit, local unit of government, so if it's the county doing the licensing, the county would license. All right. uh, uh, you know, I, I, Madam Chair, it's, uh, again, I, I'm sorry, Madam Speaker, it's, it is getting late for me too, but one of the things I'm really concerned about is 
I, I want local control. I would like to see the license. I would like to see that. Uh, Representative New Brindley brought up the fact that uh, the law enforcement and everybody that has to deal with the businesses in the community, um, it is a unique business. I'm not saying it's a bad business. It's a unique business. It's an opportunity um, perhaps to move forward in something that should have been done a long time ago. Um, but I'm curious. I'll, I'll save it for the for the other one. But thank you, Madam Chair. I urge everyone to vote for uh, Representative Robbins' bill. Thank you. Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, Representative Scraba, so whoever is doing the licenses for a business like a, a liquor store, a tobacco shop, whether that's the city or the county, they would be the ones issuing the license. I was told maybe that might clarify the point. Representative Scraba. Thank you. That clarifies it a lot because we do issue uh, tobacco licenses and, and those sort of things. So we're just a pass through. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Swidzinski and then Representative Robbins. Representative Swidzinski. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Would Representative uh, Stevenson yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Stevenson, just kind of, uh, you know, perusing as this debate's happening here on the House floor and uh, kind of surrounding Representative Robbins' amendment and amendment to the amendment as it was uh, applied to the bill. Um, what if we have a local unit of government, whether that's a county or a city, that, you know, locally elected officials, they ran on a, a really firm foundation of saying, you know what, um, fly a kite, legislature. We're not interested in issuing this license that we shall issue. What if we don't? What are the, uh, what are the penalties on those local elected officials and, and uh, uh, folks from the city councils? Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Speaker, Representative Swazinski, there are a number of cases uh, where we do limit the ability of a local unit of government. I would make an analogy to if you blatantly violate zoning law and just say, I'm sorry, your business, we know you, you uh, have a right to build this under the applicable zoning law, but we just don't like your business and we don't want it uh, here. Uh, you generally, the business is able to go to court and get the decision reversed. And I would expect a similar thing to happen here. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, thank you, Madam Speaker. So you're, you're expecting, if, if a city is uh, refusing to do what the legislature wants here today and be forcibly, uh, you know, put a, a license to these businesses, that you uh, feel that, you know, that'll encourage uh, that business, particular business entity will, will sue that local unit of government and, and then through the courts potentially uh, force them uh, to, uh, to, to do that. Representative Stevenson. Madam Speaker, Representative Swazinski, if they're not following the law, I would expect the courts would instruct them to follow the law. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. So, you know, you think about that. Here we are. We have an opportunity to accept Representative uh, Robbins' amendment that, quite frankly, um, is at least a little bit of something in between. It's not an outright saying you got to do this, you got to do that, but it's at least looking at a population equation that would allow cities like say, you know what? We don't even have a police department. This isn't a good fit for our community. You know what we're gonna do? Open them up for litigation. You're gonna take a small town, the state legislature is gonna take a small town and say, you know what, we know what's best for you. And even though each person on that city council says, you know what, I don't want anything to do with this. There is no way on my grandma's grave that I'm going to allow this business to be in the hometown that I grew up in, that I was born in, that I want to support because I understand the damage that these types of businesses are going to be coming into my community. And you're going to open them up to litigation. They're going to probably lose a court case. There's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars or $10,000 of court case fees and probably some civil court that they're going to say, well, you just don't like us. You don't want us to be around here, blah, blah, blah. Folks, Here we go again. State government knows best. State government knows best. Your cities like the Robbins Amendment. There are 800 some cities in this great state. Each of them probably have five or more city council folks. And we're going to tell those elected officials, those fire chiefs, 
those folks that woke up on a Monday morning or a Wednesday morning after the election, weren't running for election, and found themselves their mayor or they're a city councilman or woman. And we're going to say, you know what? Stick this bill in your pipe and smoke it and take it. Because we know best. We giggle on this house floor, but that's what you're telling these small towns to do with this bill. We're going to stick it down your throat, and you're going to like it. And if you don't like it, and you say, fly a kite, state legislature, we're going to open you up to litigation. That's leadership. Loud and clear. Vote for the Robbins Amendment. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the discussion, members. Local control really is important, and our cities want it. Um, but I also wanted to point out a little bit of the hypocrisy in this bill, because the state wants to make sure that cities can't refuse these licenses and that cities can't revoke these licenses. But they also don't want to have them limited by churches or limited um, by odor or other things, but it says right in the statute that it can't be within a thousand feet of the Capitol or the Capitol grounds. So apparently we don't want it around here. And then if you turn over to the next page, it says notwithstanding anything in the bill, um, the state shall not issue a li any license to any cannabis business to operate in Indian country. So we cannot impose this on the tribes and I understand that they're sovereign nations. But we are not giving our cities the same respect. And members, our cities are asking to be partners. They are on the hook for the enforcement, for the compliance. And yes, they are able now to have this retail registration and they are able to suspend it and they are able to charge some fees. But the cities I've talked to say it won't be nearly enough to make up for their law enforcement costs of compliance. So members, please vote to support your local community and vote green on the amendment. Thank you. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. Kind of odd. There being 60 ayes and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk <clears throat> will report the amendment. <clears throat> Nash moves to amend House file number 100. The tenth and Grossman as amended. The amendment is coded A107. The member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I would request a roll call on the A107. Nash requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, Representative Stevenson, I, I always love quoting people back to themselves in debate. At the beginning of your debate, you said, Minnesotans deserve to make their own decisions. That's what you said in the intro of your speech. And the A107 is actually modeled after existing statute, and we've talked about this briefly, but we're gonna, I actually wanna delve into this a little bit deeper tonight. So uh, 340A-416 actually says that uh, the body of the 107 would be that if you have 30% of the persons voting in the last city election or 200 registered voters residing in the city, whichever is less, the city can place uh, a referendum on the next ballot, and that if the majority of the people voting in that referendum decide that they do not wish to have a dispensary located in their city, that that becomes the law. Now, 340A.416 was actually utilized, if my memory serves me correct, from a State Government Finance Committee, that it was in the city of Cocado, and they actually decided for a period of time that they wished to be a dry city. So that's how they arrived at the decision to become a dry city. And what they did is they did the referenda. 
What I'm offering to you, Chair Stevenson, is this, because the, the local control pieces, I think, could best be summed up in uh, that you are uh, open to restricting time, place, and manner, but you're not giving the cities any opportunity to say, you know, we don't really want one of these here. And you and I have talked about this, and your, your principal argument is that it's going to expand the illicit market, and I, I don't... I don't know that we've ever actually had any conversation back and forth about the, the veracity of that argument or specific examples of that because, um, as I think Representative Swidzinski said earlier, that many of the cities that um, have done this under the auspices of, of not or eliminating the, the black market, they still have the black market there. And I, I can corroborate that because a friend of mine from high school is the police chief of a city in the Denver metro area. And what he has told me on repeated occasions is, Jim, this was the worst thing that we could have done. Because even though we have a regulated market, the cartels and those people who are in the illicit market are still undercutting the price of the dispensaries, and it's making it effectively a cheaper black market. But back to this amendment, I, I think that what we're seeing is that a referendum is probably the, the most obvious vote that you could take as to whether or not you wanted to have something allowed in your city. Because the preponderance of people voting in the election have to say, nope, we, don't, we, we really don't want one of these here. So I've been very thoughtful on how to craft this amendment. And I, I will tell you that uh, everybody got at their, their desk, mine got water spilled on it, but um, there's, a, there's a letter at your desk from a, uh, what is this, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different municipal organizations, and I will read them. Uh, League of Minnesota Cities, uh, Minis President of Municipal Legislative Commission, the Association of Small Cities, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, uh, the Association of Minnesota Counties, the President of Metro Cities, Metro Intercounty Association, and the Minnesota Rural Counties Association. Now, the people who are the signatories of this are council members from Bemidji, the mayor of Edina, the city administrator of Spicer, the mayor of Thief, Thief River Falls, uh, a Ramsey County commissioner, a city manager in Coon Rapids, the commissioner or a commissioner in Washington County, and a commissioner in Pipestone County. These are the people who have been elected by various members of the communities that we all serve with these folks to say, we support local control. So along those lines, we have heard that many other, other states and cities have, have gone down this road, and Representative Stevenson doesn't uh, prefer them, but I think that uh, Michigan is a great example because Michigan is a state with one of the lowest tax rates on cannabis, which is what you have, and they have no opt-out, but they are battling what they call a seemingly insurmountable battle with the long-entrenched black market. Let me read that again. They are fighting a seemingly insurmountable battle with a long entrenched black market. Well, members, research is showing in, in Michigan that that's a problem. So I, I, think, I, I think that the idea of local control is similarly very interesting. You know, last week I had, uh, I think it was the A37 on the housing bill, and it, it went down in flames. And I would, I would say to many of you, in fact, a couple of you uh, here in the chamber, that I'm gonna give you an opportunity to put up a vote for local control. So to that end, Madam Speaker, would Representative Wolgamott yield to a question? He will yield, Representative Nash. Nash. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Sorry, Representative, Wolgam Representative Nash. <laughs> thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Wolgamott, last week you voted no on my A37, ostensibly in the, the vein of uh, wanting local control to reign preeminent. And uh, this amendment, the 107, is providing an opportunity for local control to preserve and the, the, the many organizations that have sent the letter, and I think you have a copy at your desk, they are saying, please vote on this amendment. We would like local control. Uh, Representative Wolgamott, you have St. Cloud as your principal city. Do you believe that the city of St. Cloud's city council uh, should be allowed to make the decisions on whether they have a dispensary located or multiple dispensaries located in the city of St. Cloud? Representative Wolgamott. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the question, Representative Nash. I think that the approach that is in the bill before us is the best approach. Representative Nash. 
Well, Madam Speaker, if Representative Walgamot would continue to yield. He will yield, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, that wasn't the question, Representative Walgamot. The question was, do you believe that the city council and voters in the city of St. Cloud should be allowed to have a vote, like on the A107, do you believe that they should have a vote as to whether or not a dispensary is located in the city of St. Cloud? Representative yes Wolgamot, no um, I would remind you, Representative Nash, you can't ask him how he'll vote on the amendment. Representative Wolgamot. I did Again, not ask Madam him Speaker, how to vote. Speaker, I would reiterate that I believe that the approach um, that is in the bill without this amendment is the best approach. Representative Nash. Well, okay. We'll move on. Uh, would Representative Reem uh, yield to a question? She will yield, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Reem, uh, before you came here, you were the member or a member of the Chanhassen City Council. And I know, and, and the League of Minnesota Cities representing the city of Chanhassen has said that they would like for an opportunity to have the local voice heard in uh, this, this bill. And here's the thing. Please note, I have worked very hard to just constrain my comments to the, the lack of local control. So, Representative Reem, do you believe that the voters of the city of Chanhassen should have a voice as to whether or not something is located in their city, or do you, uh, do you do not believe that? Representative Reem. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Nash. Um, I did look over that letter from the League of Minnesota Cities, and I didn't see the Chaska mayor or the Chanhassen mayor's name on it. So, um, and I have talked to the author about this bill. Um, and I do think the way it's written makes sense. Um, a couple things, you know, the fact that cities can zone where they want to have this. Um, and we had, I don't know if you remember, but in our city we had an issue where a large liquor store wanted to have um, its business close to a school. And it was allowed because it was a private school. And I talked to the author about this and he said that with this legislation, that would not be allowed. They're going to make this much stricter when we're looking at um, dispensaries. So I actually think the way this law is written um, has improved upon things. So um, I guess that's answering the question, hopefully. Thank you. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If Representative Reem would yield for one more question. She will. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Reem, is the League of Minnesota Cities, or is the city of Chanhassen and Chaska represented by the League of Minnesota Cities uh, down here at the Capitol uh, in lobbying efforts? Representative Reem. I would assume so. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I will tell you, and this is not a gotcha, they are. Uh, so the League of Minnesota Cities has said that they would like local control. They do represent the cities of Chanhassen and Chaska. And I think that uh, you, you can surmise from that that they would be sending you a message that they would like to have local control. Uh, Madam Speaker, would Representative Brand yield for a question? He will yield. Representative Nash. Madam Speaker, uh, Representative Brand, uh, Mankato and St. Peter, I believe, are your principal cities. Um, I, I think we can agree that we know that the League of Minnesota Cities does represent them here at the Capitol. The letter that you've received at your desk is urging for some notion of local control that is beyond what's in the bill. And I would ask, do you believe that this, the city and the people in Mankato and the, and the people in the city of St. Peter should have a voice in this process as to whether or not a dispensary is located in their cities respectively? Representative Brand. Thank you for the, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker and um, uh, Representative Nash. What I would say is that there are plenty of vacant locations in, in across the state uh, where these locations could go, um, but there are zoning laws. And so I wouldn't say that a dispensary in any shape or form would end up in a residential zone. Um, as a former city council member, I wouldn't say that it would end up in an industrial zone. And so that would only limit the commercial zone. And I do believe, uh, you know, as a former city council member, we did have control over where those commercial zones were located within those cities. Um, and so I would assume that your question, um, although uh, it's a big, kind of a confusing question when you think about it, because they already do have control over 
zoning across those cities. Um, again, going back to my seven years of city council experience, we kind of had control over where those things could be located. In fact, when I was city council member in St. Peter, we actually added some additional commercial zones in St. Peter, uh, but um, I, I can't imagine where we would want to put um, you know, some of these things in different locations. Now, it is kind of weird because we do have a hospital in the industrial zone, and in our industrial zone, we do have a couple of uh, different mixed-use things, but um, I, I, I think that we're trying to use the land to the best ability that we have in those cities, like in St. Peter, where I represented again for seven years. And so I think to the, get to the bottom of your question, I, I think that, um, uh, yeah, they do have local control. I was there, and we were a part of that back in those days when I was there. Thank you. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I will tell you, I rarely presume the intent of my questions myself, but, um, you know, Chair Stevenson has, has said on a number of occasions that there are reasonable limitations that we have in this bill. But I will point out to members that we are a Dillon state rule, and that means that it, unless it is expressly stated, local governments can't do anything that is not provided by the statute that we have in the bills that get passed in a law. So to that point, uh, it is not expressly stated in the bill, and subsequently they would not have a voice. But if you do it by referenda, I think that this provides a very good voice for the local people to say, by, by passage of a referenda, we just don't want to have this here. I don't think that's asking a tremendous amount. What we're saying is, what is exactly set up there over our, our rostrum is that the voice of the people is the voice of God. Let's listen to the voice of the people. So. Uh, I'm sure the chair is going to tell you to not vote for this, but I will, I will await for that because maybe he's changed his mind. Um, apparently he hasn't, but I'd like to hear from him. I appreciate it. Thank you. Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Speaker, Representative Nash, I appreciate the amendment, but as I have said before, the bill strikes a careful balance uh, between the state's interest and local uh, control, and so uh, this would disrupt that balance and ask for a no vote. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just want to clear up a couple things um, from that discussion. It was stated that um, the bill provides for uh, local cities to have zoning um, ability, and it does not. It says that a local unit of government may adopt reasonable restrictions on time, place, and manner of operation. And I tried, and then it says they can restrict within 1,000 feet of a school, daycare, the Capitol or the Capitol grounds, or a public park that includes a playground or athletic field. The amendment that we voted down that included the amendment to the amendment members allowed for a local land use compatibility study to ensure that these businesses would not be located in a residential area. It also would have expressly stated um, that cities could have provided reasonable restrictions um, for noise, smell, odor, hours of operation, and location. So members, you already voted down in one vote the local control that our cities and counties are asking for. So the Nash Amendment is an opportunity to give them their local voice through the referendum process so that they can decide what works for their communities. Please support the Nash Amendment. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Joy yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Joy. Or Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Joy. If memory serves me, you came here from being a mayor in your city. Uh, I'm presuming that you have spoken to many of your constituents. And as a mayor, former mayor, as myself and many others in this chamber, um, what, is it, what is it that you see as the principal defect of this bill as it relates to local control? Representative Joy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I find it interesting, you know, we've had discussion when I was mayor about, you know, we've seen other cities ban menthol in their cities. You know, they think that's a good idea for their city, not forced from the state to say ban menthol. It was a decision at the local level, you know, but yet we come to this and we can't let the cities decide that this is a good idea or take it to a vote. You know, to me, I think we should, this amendment you're offering is a good amendment. I think we should vote green on this amendment. You know, when you look at how, how local control, knowing their cities, knowing their, we're not even taking it to the county level, we're keeping it on the local level, so it's the citizens in that town, you know, and when you bring up if they have law enforcement in place or not, who's going to manage this, who's going to do, you know, schools, what it is, you know, there's so much to this bill, you just wonder that when it says within a thousand feet of a child care, 
So now I got, if I do have an opportunity in my small town to get another childcare, but it's within that thousand feet of that new facility we have, I have to deny that license for that childcare facility because it's too close. We're gonna have a lot of issues with this. Thank you. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Joy. You know, in, in committee debate, the chair, Chair Stevenson said that uh, one of his concerns with, with my amendment was that it would strip away the enforcement requirement. And I, I pointed out in committee, and I'll point it out here again, that this doesn't absolve the cities of enforcement, because it doesn't. What it simply says is that this is a mechanism, an on-ramp, if you will, for cities to have a referendum to simply say, we'll enforce the laws, but we don't want a dispensary here. Because I think that it's, it's not really an unrealistic expectation that many cities around our state, because you, you can drive for many, many, many hours. Representative Burkle, he's here, well, maybe he, there he is, has a very long drive. I think it's six hours. Well, you can drive for six hours, and you might hit a couple cities along the way that would like to say, we don't want one of these. So I'd like to read, Madam Speaker, a, the, a, a passage from the, the letter that was submitted that I referenced just a minute ago, and all of you have at your desk. And, and I will, I'll start it off here. It says, collectively, our organizations have provided feedback, testimony, and letters throughout this session regarding House File 100. We are appreciative for Chair Stevenson's addition of local registration requirement, but, and in bold letters, still have concerns regarding the lack of local government positions within the bill. Specifically, local governments center our requests on the following items. One, and first, meaningful, meaningful local control. That's, that's uh, a really big item. The second one, and the last item they say, is recognition of costs throughout revenue sharing. I'm focusing on meaningful local control. I appreciate the amendment that we added in in State Government Finance, Chair Stevenson, around some of the things that were added, um, but there really isn't the voice of the cities that are here. There is no meaningful local control. The people that live in, in pick a city don't have a voice in whether or not they get to have a dispensary. Now, mind you, I, I think that many people, if it were put to a vote, they'd say, yeah, we'd, we'd like this. But I think that as much as I recognize that, you have to recognize that there would be cities that say we would prefer not to. I don't think that that is a far-flung notion. So, members, if you voted no on my amendment last week, and, uh, yep, you, you, voted my, you voted my amendment down, here now is your opportunity to do the same thing again, to be the voice of local control, and that's what this is all about. So if you voted no last week, I, I really hope to see that you vote green on this because the cities and counties are asking for meaningful local control. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 ayes and 67 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. <clears throat> There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Novotny moves to amend House File Number 100, the 10th and Gross one as amended. The amendment is coded A103. The member from Sherburne, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Speaker Hortman. My amendment is a simple bill. I was contacted by a, a member of a uh, one of the Metro Sheriff's Office who wish to remain anonymous and express concerns they have about this bill and the continued work that they're gonna to have to do with the ongoing record expungement once the cannabis uh, expungement boards kick in. And I know there is some funding in there, but with their examination of the bills, they believe that they will still have cost built in. I asked them to provide me with the estimate of how much they will have to have for labor involved going forward. And we came up with a simple uh, extrapolation of that divided by the population in the state. And that's where we came up with the uh, 
request for the funding. We took that money out of the uh, cannabis workforce grants, and uh, this money will be put forward into an account in the Department of Revenue when the Cannabis Expungement Board does their uh, record reporting in uh, January on how many records that they have had to seal at a local level. The local governments will get that information and then the money will be distributed to help cover the cost of this bill. That is my uh, amendment, Madam Speaker, and uh, I request a roll call. Representative um, Novotny requests a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative uh, Novotny. As you mentioned, there is, there is money in the bill for local governments. Uh, for, there's a variety of different sources of, of money in the bill uh, for local uh, governments. I'm going to ask for a no vote. Uh, already, I mean to say, I'm going to ask for a no vote on this amendment. It, uh, the way that you have funded this amendment is by deleting the economic development grants uh, in the bill, which I think are an important part of the bill. And for that reason, I'm going to ask for a no vote. Further discussion? Representative Novotny. Thank you, and members, this is something we can do. Vote green. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 61 ayes and 69 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. <clears throat> are we doing that? No. We are not. No, okay. Third reading, House File number 100, as amended. Third reading, as amended. Discussion to the bill. The member from Ramsey, Representative Hollins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, as, as some of you know from our talks and committee, my parents are libertarian hippies, and they have been anticipating and waiting for cannabis legalization since the 70s. Now, my interest in legalization is maybe a little less self-serving because cannabis is not my drug of choice. I personally like a good single malt scotch. Uh, but my interest in House File 100, is primarily related to the failure of the war on drugs and how that's impacted our black and brown communities. Black Americans are four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana charges than their white peers. Black Americans are nearly six times more likely to be incarcerated for drug-related offenses than their white counterparts. Almost 80% of people serving time for a federal drug offense are black or Latino. And in state prisons, people of color make up 60% of those serving time for drug charges. And for those of you who doubt the purposeful connection between the war on drugs and the community of color, let me quote President Nixon's policy advisor, John Ehrlichman. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing them both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know that we were lying about drugs? Of course we did. All of those arrests, charges, and convictions have a real and direct impact on individuals, holding people back from being full participants in our economy, keeping them out of lucrative employment, disrupting child custody, breaking apart families, evicting residents, seizing property on pretext, and needlessly escalating the risk of violence in police encounters. Philando Castile is dead because of the presence of the smell of marijuana was enough to convince an officer that he was worthy of deadly force. His death left a hole in our community. The students at J.J. Hill, his girlfriend, his family, he didn't deserve that. He died right on the edge of my district. Today, we take a step towards making certain that that never happens again. 
Many of the harms the war on drugs have wrought on our communities have no simple remedy, but the expungement provisions laid out in this bill will go a long way to correcting many of the harms and consequences that we've needlessly inflicted upon our own citizens. This law will remove a significant barrier to gainful employment, child custody, home ownership, and rentals. As a lawyer, I know that the ability of the state to criminalize activities is its greatest power and responsibility. Criminal justice is a blunt and terrible instrument that strips away years of a person's life in a single instance. It must be used sparingly, but for decades we've chosen to wield this power with far too much enthusiasm and far too little regard for the consequences it wreaks on our communities. As Minnesotans, we should lead the way in criminal justice reform, reserving the state's greatest and most terrible power for only great and terrible things. Today, we take an important step in reforming our laws and creating a more just and equitable Minnesota. Please vote green. The member from Ramsey, Representative Finke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I rise to uh, support the bill. I want to just follow up on the comments that Representative Hollins made about the historical uh, injustices of the war on drugs. And I want to make sure that we understand that this is not our history, this is our present. We heard tonight that Cannabis was effectively legal in the state of Minnesota, and I just want to make sure we know that in, according to the BCA, in 2021, 6,000 people were arrested for marijuana-related crimes in the state of Minnesota. 90% of those were for simple possession. The same data reports that of that group, five times more likely to be arrested for simple possession if you are black than if you are white. Marijuana is not effectively decriminalized in the state of Minnesota. It is effectively decriminalized in the state of Minnesota for white people. We absolutely need this bill. Tens of thousands of people will have their expungement, their records expunged, but tens of thousands more will not need it in the future. Thank you, Representative Stevenson, for your attention to this need. This is an absolute necessity in the state of Minnesota. The member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would the author of the bill yield to a question? He will yield, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Or Madam Speaker. And to the author, I know that you made some allowances for uh, Minnesota permit to carry holders, um, but I have one principal question, and it is from that law. It is subdivision two of the permit to carry law. It is. Um, at least 21 years of old or a citizen of permanent residence in the United States completes a various list of things. And number nine says that if they are precluded from any federal law, and Madam Speaker, my question to the author is, is marijuana still a Schedule I drug federally and would, would consuming it be an abrogation of federal law? Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Speaker, Representative Nash, the answer to the first question is yes, it's still Schedule One. The answer to your second question is I, I do not believe this has been a barrier to licenses in other states in the 20, now two states that have legalized cannabis. Well, Madam Speaker. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, one of our cherished members by, on both sides of the aisle here, um, Representative Rod Hamilton, uh, when he entered the medical marijuana program was precluded from having his permit to carry. And that's because it's a federal Schedule One drug, and he was not allowed to do that because that's a federal law. And it says here in the statute that Minnesota does not allow, or it could not allow, as one of the criterion for evaluation, uh, for that to, to kick him out of the, out of the system. So um, I just want folks who, who value the ability for a permit to carry, and I think there are some on your side of the aisle that, that feel very strongly about that, to recognize that this bill does not fix that. This bill does not even come close to addressing the federal requirement of that. And that should be a cautionary tale for you as you, as you think about voting on this bill. 
Uh, Madam Speaker, I will bring the body's attention to line 175.4 in the bill, subdivision 4, grants to individuals. The commissioner shall award grants of the amount of dot, 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 dot. That is not a defined amount of money in the bill. It is a blank appropriation in the bill. And for that reason, Madam Speaker, I move that House File 100 be re-referred re back to the Committee on Ways and Means uh, for that specific reason. We cannot pass a bill off this floor with a blank appropriation. I would request a roll call. Representative Nash moves to send the bill back to committee and request a roll call. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Speaker, I ask uh, that the House be mo move the House be allowed to move meet past midnight. Representative Stevenson moves that the House be allowed to meet past midnight. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. Discussion on the motion to return the bill to committee. Representative Stevenson. Madam Speaker, I ask that the uh, members reject uh, this um, uh, motion. Representative Nash called this a blank appropriation. I'm sure he misspoke. It's not an appropriation. That language doesn't appropriate any money. There is an appropriation to this section later in the bill that is not blank. Uh, this uh, is a, a, a limit that's not in the bill, so it doesn't say that the, it says that the uh, agency can award grants of up to, and then there's a there's a blank in the bill, functionally saying that there's, there's not a limit to how much money the agency can grant, but they are appropriated money in Article 9 of the bill. There's no blank appropriation in the bill. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, members, read the line. Grants the individual. The commissioner shall grant award grants of undefined number. It's an undefined number in the bill, and we, we have dealt with this many, many times. Uh, I, I brought snacks to committees that pointed out to people that uh, there were more dots in some of your bills than there were in the box of candy that I brought to committee. That's sloppy work. And I, I'm sure that the, the, the author missed this one. I did not miss this one. This is not something that we should allow to have happen. This is not proper procedure for how we pass things off of this floor. You don't do blank appropriations. You don't do blank grants. That is not how we do this. Members, I would urge a green vote. I would love to hear from some of my other colleagues about how this is not how we do things here in the Minnesota House of Representatives. I would urge a green vote. Seeing no further discussion on the motion, the clerk will take the roll on the motion. The clerk will close the roll.
There being 60 ayes and 71 nays, the motion does not prevail. The bill is before us. The member from Hennepin, Representative Long. Uh, Madam Speaker, I move to table House File 100 and will note for uh, members in the gallery that we will be taking up the bill first thing tomorrow for those who would like to return uh, and that we will complete the bill and vote on it tomorrow. Uh, we uh, have a House rule that we don't meet past midnight to allow for the safety of members. Uh, motion to table is not debatable. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. House File 100 is laid on the table. Motions and resolutions. There are copies of the non-controversial motions at the House desk and online. If there is no objection, we will take action on these motions first. Hearing no objection, the motions prevail. Announcements. Representative Long. Madam Speaker, I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 11 a.m. Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. Representative Long moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 11 a.m. Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. Representative Long. I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Long moves that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The House stands adjourned until 11 a.m. Tuesday, April 25th, 2023.